Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to the annual Cambridge Liver Symposium. Thank you all for turning up this morning and also welcome our delegates who joined us online through the YouTube link. Um, we hope you'll find this to be an interesting, exciting day. Um, had a great dinner last night. Thank you again for everyone who came for that and the network meeting. So, um, just for housekeeping, there's no fire alarm planned for today, so if the alarm goes off, it's real. There are exits down on the ground floor, either side or up the top. We've got more seating than normal because of a meeting they had yesterday where they needed to have all these seats laid out, so that's why we've got all that. Um, please put your phones on silent. Um, we're going to kick off with the first session. 
Um, Will Jelson's kindly stepped into chair this one, but unfortunately didn't stay and couldn't get up here this morning because there's some being ill overnight. We're going to have the cases, and Will's going to, Will's going to present all that and just tell us a little bit about how the YouTube function works. So I'll hand over to Will. So we have a YouTube link that delegates at home or at work will be logging into. Those who are on the YouTube channel and can hear me now, if you log in with a Google account to your YouTube channel, you can then post chat questions on the forum and then we'll be able to see them here. It worked pretty well last year, so hopefully it's going to work again. I posted a um, message on the forum so you can hear me and see that. Hopefully I'll get the feedback on if this is not going up on other channels. Anyway, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for the last minute invite to share this session from Dublin. Um, I was going to do some great stuff and then just say that once again, unfortunately, it's all started from London. Um, we've got three really interesting cases, I think, um, obviously on site. Um, we're starting with Georgie Jarwin, um, who is Playing speed and uh, uh, sorry, playing the the rising star and um, no pressure. I've also got a power thing here, so I can switch red, green, and amber. So you have 12 minutes. I'm going to start green. When you get to 10, I'll go amber. And over 12, or if I'm feeling nasty at four stars, I don't know if you're going to go. All right. So welcome. Thanks very much. And we've got Anna Patterson, who is one of our anthropologists. Thank you, Georgie. Over to you. I don't know where my slides are coming from. Because I'm not on here. Have you got your little box oh, there? there we are. Have you got the box to go forward and backwards? Yes. I'm going to reset something. Thank nice. you. Here we go. Reset. <laughs> Hello, my name is Georgie. I'm one of the IT trainees. And with Anna Patterson today, I'm going to present a case of cholangiopathy that we recently transplanted at Adam so this was a 46-year-old gentleman who had had a um, seemingly uh, infectious diarrhoea with some um, projectile vomiting, um, which was short-lived and shortly developed a rash after that. And following that, had some symptoms of obstructive jaundice, so developed pale stools, dark urine, and progressive jaundice. Um, associated with this was quite significant weight loss. He lost two stone in three weeks. And so presented to his GP, we found he had quite an elevated bilirubin and advised an hospital admission. He had no significant past medical history and didn't take any regular medications, previously very fit and well. In terms of liver risk factors, he had travelled quite extensively. He previously worked in the military, um, including with some travel to the Middle East, but no travel to Asia. Um, in terms of his uh, social history, he had a modest alcohol intake of nine units a week as a maximum and no recreational drug use. And no significant family history. His paternal grandfather had passed away from complications of alcohol-related cirrhosis, um, but none other, and no history of IBD in the family. So in terms of local investigation at his DGH, he had a non-invasive liver screen, which was negative. He had an ultrasound, which showed some gallbladder sludge, a normal calibre uh, common bile duct, and a mildly dilated intrahepatic duct. He had an MRCP, which uh, these are some of the images which is currently um, provided by Samir Khwaja, one of our radiologists. So this just shows some diffuse intrahepatic stricturing bilaterally. Um, on the left here, we've got a segment. This was reported initially as normal extrahepatic segment, but actually at the bottom there, the yellow arrow is pointing uh, to the, the inferior part of his common bile duct. And then above that, it's, it's sort of missing completely because of how tight the stricturing is there. Um, and on the right here is just some, uh, some thickening of his common hepatic and common bile duct. And he had a liver biopsy, which really showed some, some prominent cholestasis and some chronic cholangiopathy, um, which could be consistent with PSC, but could also be consistent with secondary causes. So in terms of his progress, he was diagnosed with PSC at the local hospital following the biopsy and the MRCP findings, both which would fit with um, a diagnosis of PSC. And as you can see here, so the green line is his bilirubin. It may be a bit small to see. Um, the yellow line is the ALT, and the uh, orange line is the ALT. So his bilirubin really quite exponentially increased over a couple of weeks. And when it got over 400, he was then transferred to Edinburgh. It's really for an inpatient transplant assessment. So in terms of his progress with us, um, he had a, a non-invasive liver screen. It's a little bit more extensive than just seems to have made the, 
got a positive P anchor, which again would be a fitty BSC, and he had a borderline positive strongyloides. He had a colonoscopy to look for any evidence of associated IBD, which was macroscopically and microscopically normal, and he had an inpatient transplant assessment, which revealed no contraindications to transplantation. He had further imaging, mostly to try and exclude any evidence of malignancy in light of his quite rapid presentation and deterioration and very significant weight loss. Um, his CT triple phase showed no evidence of cholangial carcinoma. He had an MR liver and an EUS, both of which were in keeping with the diagnosis of PSC and nothing to have died with any sort of malignancy from this. This is just an image. The, the image on his left is an MR from his local hospital, and the image on the right is, is a month later, and he's got some quite um, significant uh, progression of the intrahepatic duct dilatation. But he was progressing very rapidly and was very poorly at this point with a bilirubin and stuck at around 500. I thought I'd just highlight this. This is his gallbladder um, on the MR imaging, and it just shows some very non-specific neural thickening. Um, but, but nothing focal, no lesions or anything like that. So he had no definitive evidence of malignancy. So in terms of his outcomes, he was discussed in our transplant MDT uh, a week after the presentation. There were no contraindications to transplant, and actually on the basis that he had a rapid deterioration, he was previously fit and well, and he had no endoscopic options for treating his disease. The decision was taken to list this gentleman for transplantation. And six weeks later, he received a transplant. He got a split liver. Um, surgeons commented that his native CBD appeared quite sclerotic um, when they uh, took out his explants. He had, because of the suspected diagnosis of PSC, a raw and wide hepatico jejunostomy. And he had a very uncomplicated post operative course. He was discharged within two weeks. Um, the only thing I thought that was slightly out of keeping with perhaps routine presentations was because of the strongyloides, our ID team advised treating with a, a, um, a single dose of ivermectin. Um, just to cover him in the context of his new immunosuppression. I'll hand over to Anna as to reveal what we found the next part of the story. Thank you. I did have to flat George and sent me a straight forward, but she declined. So, this is the eggplant, and you can see that it's got a diffuse green appearance, consistent with the profound cholestasis and, and the high pyrosis. Um, and just a low power overview. So, there's um, quite profound expansion of the portal tract. These areas um, and they're linking because of the portal tract. Um, and you can see within the parenchyma that it's very yellow and consistent with the cholestasis, and hence why it's so green um, on the excrement. So, on slightly uh, looking at the connective tissue stain, so again, the red is collagen, so you can see this fibrous expansion of the portal tract here. This linking between the portal tract uh, and then we're getting rounding up of the hepatocytes. Um, again here, so this is at least severe fibrosis, but in um, Bilirubin disease it can be highly variable across the excrement, so some areas may have been worse than this and some areas may have been better. So looking at the portal tracts themselves, they look very busy, um, and all of this cellularity here are um, bile ducts, um, but the actual normal bile duct is different here, and that looks absolutely fine. So this is what we call a secondary biliary picture. So this is a reaction to um, stricture or obstruction on the um, septal or the, the main nerve. So the cause of the chondropathy is not obvious here, but we can just say the is not obvious. And then in the parenchyma, again, you can just see this profound cholestasis. So thinking about what's happening on those major ducts, so they're shown here. So um, we've got a septal duct, the hepatic duct. We're starting at the septal duct. And this aspect is relatively okay. Um, but in contrast, if you see this segment here, there's fibrosis underneath the epithelium. The epithelium is becoming jammer and stripping off. And then if we look at a larger duct, the um, peribillary glands here show you where the duct would have originally been. And what you've got is this extensive fibrosis, which is leading to um, loss of the duct. And we've got a very small visible duct in here. And again, degenerate duct epithelium. So this is a sclerosing cholangitis. We don't have all the typical features that we necessarily see in PSC. It could be PSC, but secondary causes of sort of scrotum case like cholangitis can't be excluded for surgery. Just to draw your attention to the normal epithelium in the bile duct, so it's a single layer and it's relatively flat. Um, and so, an instance of finding uh, what we found in the hepatic duct is this one you can see looks very different. So, it looks very papillary, it's much more fluid than the previous duct I showed you. And on higher power, you can see these papillary changes. It's too blue, or it's either too wrinkled, too blue. Is it too blue? Uh, and that's dysplasia with crowded with the epithelium. 
um, but it's not too bad. So this is low grade exposure. We sampled all the duct system, and this was the worst that we had in the um, plastic ducts. The gallbladder again showed similar changes with these capillary uh, infolding, and then on higher power, similar changes to the hepatic duct with low grade exposure. But here you can see there's more severe changes with the clipper forming, so a sieve like pattern. It looks a lot more blue over here than it does in this one because it's very overcrowded because it's high grade exposure. So um, we've got an intraductal capillary neoplasm arising on a background of sclerosing pharyngitis, maybe primary or secondary. Um, this is a discontinuous lesion. We weren't able to comment on the actual resection margin, um, but given that these changes can be discontinuous, uh, we can't exclude there being secondary sources. Thanks, Anna. So, so in summary, this gentleman has got, we think, a large duct PSC, but um, incidentally found an exploit in surgery. We found this IPM bullet lesion on his gallbladder. So, so what is IPM B? It's quite rare, and that's the area we've got to cover in this talk. So it's a rare collection of viral duct tumors, and this was agreed by the WHO to include it in their classification of digestive tumors from 2010. And it brings together some different tumors that you may be familiar with. So um, tumors in the bile ducts and the gallbladder that resemble IPM and the pancreas. Um, a third of IPMBs microscopically produce mucins and mucin producing tumors, papillomas and cyst adenomas. It, we should recognize that it's a spectrum of disease. So you may see low grade dysplasia, you may see high grade dysplasia progressing towards invasive phalangiocarcinoma. And it's considered a precursor um, to phalangiocarcinoma. And in terms of how we classify it, so histologically and analogy, so you may be able to pick out whether it's intrahepatic or extrahepatic. There's nothing in the literature, there's no consensus on whether or not it's more common in one or the other. One paper will say one thing, another paper will say another. Um, the WHO classifies based on uh, neoplastic grades, so whether there's low or high grade dysplasia. Um, there are four distinct epithelial subtypes, of which pancreatic obinary is the most common. Um, and uh, our radiologist highlighted that there was a paper a couple of years ago um, where there are now seven distinct morphological subtypes on imaging of IPMB. So how does it present? So we don't see it very often here. It's much more common in East Asia. The risk factors for it, so PSC is a risk factor. There's a risk factor in middle age. Um, but the most common risk factors and the reason it's more common in Asia is because it's associated with liver flukes and liver stones. Um, presenting features, our gentleman had quite a few of them. Um, he didn't have any abdominal pain, but certain features of cholangitis, jaundice, and this rapid weight loss. Radiologically, there's a lot of variation, and the challenging thing with IPMB in reviewing the literature is that everything is based on very small case series. So there is a paper looking at 23 IPMB, which has been proven in pathology and looking back at their imaging. And with the benefit of hindsight, they could see that 90% of them had uh, recognizable intraluminal mass. I have to say that we have gone back with our expert radiologists and looked at our gentleman's imaging, and we cannot find anything suggesting of an IPMB. Um, obviously, there can be intra extrahepatic, um, and ERCV can be useful in the context of this macroscopic mucin produ uh, production and identifying focal lesions. Um, this is just from a, a review article in the International Journal of Hepatology, which is um, showing a much more obvious papillary mass with some intrahepatic duct dilatation, and just from a geodinoscopy, just showing for other trainees like me what macroscopic mucin production might look like. So how do we manage these patients? Obviously, it's all based on quite small uh, volume of data, but uh, generally it's a slightly more indolent disease than other ductal phalangiocarcinomas. Um, it can take, from high-grade dysplasia, the literature suggests one to two years from the development of high-grade dysplasia to developing an invasive phalangio. Um, and surgical resection is, is the recommended treatment. Um, if you have an isolated um, uh, lesion in one of your intrahepatic ducts, you may be able to complete, for example, a partial hepatectomy. Um, but if it's a more extensive disease or there's no invasion or metastatic to hit disease, clearly that's not going to be an option. There are reports in the literature of relatively high recurrence rates, up to 60% of people who have malignant transformation of their IPMBs. But again, this is based on tiny numbers. And actually, maybe there's something to say that we find is very hard to pick up preoperatively. So maybe we don't accurately stage them before we then operate on them and then find later they've got slightly more advanced disease. I think being transplant is quite an unknown entity, so there are a number of case reports, it's in small numbers, generally less than three patients. Um, there is a suggestion from a paper in Japan where they would see a lot more IPMB from three patients where they did a staging, where they did a partial resection beforehand to accurately try and stage the disease. 
um, and then offer transplantation to people where it was appropriate to do so, and the ones who were transplanted did well um, without the currents. Um, we had a previous case of IPMD um, at Adelbus in 2006, so he was a, a similar gentleman, he had a PSC uh, and an autoimmune hepatitis overlap syndrome. He had a transplant um, when he deteriorated and he was found to incidentally have a gallbladder IPMD on uh, expert histology. And actually he did very well, he had eight years of close monitoring with imaging and he sadly passed away from an unrelated malignancy, but he had no recurrence of IPMD um, during his life. Um, and I won't touch on this too much because I expect Laura Wolf will talk about the status, but um, there is a new intrahepatic cholangio pilot um, in the UK which patients who have cirrhosis and have very small disease, so less than two centimetre cholangiocarcinomas are now being considered for transplantation. Um, so we may see more of these patients um, on expert histology. So in terms of how our gentleman did, so he had a rude hepatobejejunostomies, he has some native duct remaining, so we found that we had this IPMD he had in his gallbladder, but we needed to have a look at his native duct. So his MR imaging of his native duct post-transplant was very reassuring. We had two attempts at trying to have a look at a sort of tissue diagnosis from that native duct, but both of those were unfortunately non-diagnostic, and he got quite a nasty um, post-ESFP pancreatitis. Um, following that, he had a further MR imaging, mainly because on the first MRCT we found a slightly large lymph node. Um, on the repeat MR imaging, that was very reassuring, and actually our local HPV cancer entity has discharged him back to hepatologist care to make a decision on how to survey him going forward. So in summary, um, IPMV is quite a rare disease um, of, of bowel duct tumours, and it's something which we may not see very often in our practice. Um, it's quite hard to diagnose uh, preoperatively, um, given it's challenging to find on radiology, as seen in our case. Literature suggests that resection rather than uh, transplantation is the optimal management, and certainly given the rarity of it, there's no consensus on how we should monitor patients such as this gentleman who we found an IPMB incidentally, and then have to think about how to look after him post-transplant. Thank you very much. I'm interested in the cases where you transplant patients with incidental neoplasia, whether it's IPMB or whether it's a phalangio, and your approach post raw Y to either surveillance or resection of the intrapancreatic portion of the remnant bowel that we had a case that was shared 10 years ago with a young woman who had an incidental phalangio who had a Whipple's six or 12 months later. So, because yeah. if surveillance can cause pancreatitis or problems and maybe 
inadequate. What's your approach post transplant to incidental cancers for the remnant bar? Come on, Georgie. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have discussed this as a team, and obviously we've had quite a severe complication as a result of the ASCP, as you say. So I think the plan is initially to see an agenda time with, it, with MRI. So I don't think there was a plan to repeat the RCP, but obviously there was a challenge and they're quite expensive disease and, and will we miss something that way? I don't think we've discussed about doing anything like a repeat and trying to assess the remaining, but um, but I'm sure it's, 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 it's a bit of a crop out um, answer from me, but um, I guess it, the, the cases are very, very rare, so we have to judge them on an individual basis, really. And actually, his, his, so far, it's been very reassuring what we've seen of his native drug. Again, I guess Mike was saying, should we use the US? And I, I think that would be one of you know just one of the modalities we might we might use. Um, anyway, we've we've gone over time a little bit here, um, as you may have seen from this. I don't. What does that mean? Oh, yeah, we've gone over time. So now, if we could um, have Floyd um, up to the lectern, please. So Floyd is over um, doing um, his hepatology NGN with us, and he's on the Oxford rotation. So we're very lucky to have him. For three months, I think, and Rebecca is helping us with some of the histopathology. So over to you, Floyd. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to present these very interesting cases. I've definitely not actually dealt with these cases myself before this university. Um, so I'll be talking through two cases. So I've used a slightly different presentation format just to kind of whiz through them a bit quicker. Um, so MC is a 37 year old gentleman. Not only quite fit and well, but only asthma is a comorbidity. Uh, unfortunately, got diagnosed with uh, melanoma in his left neck back in 2016 and uh, went through um, neck dissection, radiotherapy, started on some breath and neck inhibitors by the oncologist, had some uh, initial toxic issues with his thyroid, and unfortunately, then progressed whilst on these, being on these inhibitors. Um, so he was switched to uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab which are the checkpoint inhibitors that I've alluded to in my title slide, um, and had four cycles uh, between August to October 2021. Um, so just as a, as a reminder to myself and to everyone in the room, I mean, the PD-1 class of uh, melanoma drugs is nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and chemiclimab, if I'm saying that right, and then CTLA-4, is ipilimumab. And the reason I put this slide up is it's, it's, a, it's an oversimplification, of course, but uh, effectively, it's a, just a quick reminder that you're actually using your inherent T cells to mount an innate response to try and kill off as many cancer cells. So as you'd expect, there was um, potential for him to have immune-related adverse, uh, immune adverse events. And so unfortunately, within a month, he presented with cough and diarrhea and on the scene by the oncologist in the clinic and was found to have a grade three hepatitis um, with that ALT. I'll bring up his other liver function test shortly, but um, he had an ultrasound which showed some neocytes, which wasn't about any of his previous staging CTs, but for fusion confirmed by his subsequent CT tests had the pelvis. Uh, it also commented on a little bit of colitis, but was deemed to be not um, uh, very significant based on biopsies, endoscopic findings, uh, and certainly uh, clinical symptoms. Um, and so, in the up, uh, it was admitted uh, on, on the daycare, sorry, under the oncology day unit, it was given IV methyl PEN for five days, and then switched to oral PEN. Now, uh, his uh, LFTs, I've had to split them up because if I put them all together, they wouldn't really project very well. Uh, so, the top left is a, a an expected hepatitic ALT of 500. We've got uh, an element of cholestasis. It's not projecting very well, but this bit here is the normal range, so ALT sitting between 200 at the baseline. His platelets are normal, and uh, his bilirubin was also normal when he first got seen. So that's where the drugs kind of went in, and you see a good response with his ALT, and not much happening with the rest. Um, so then he then continues to have a month later ongoing worsening ascites and is requiring about five grains in the span of uh, three months. Uh, oncology did uh, basic diagnostic work of the ascites I've detailed here and transudated, no infection, no malignant cells, predominantly lymphocytic, as you'd expect, normal cardiac function, 
non-renal function and um, essentially was uh, convinced on diuretics. And the hepatology was a uh, consult that, because they couldn't quite explain, well, I guess they thought it was more serous or reaction, um, but it wasn't. Um, so, um, I'm fast forwarding a bit here because this is where we get kind of referred to end of December, start of January, uh, and he's mounting a bit of a hepatitic response again. Um, so at this point, as per the ESMO uh, guidance for checkpoint inhibitor hepatitis, you add in a second immunosuppressant, and uh, effectively that's what they did. They opted for mycophenolate, and when his numbers started to trickle up, they doubled the mycophenolate dose. Um, and again, with no faith, I guess things were starting to improve. There's not much else happening with the other uh, um, markers of, uh, and I deliberately not put the IR at that because it was clearly fine throughout. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> the treatment strategy so far from an oncology perspective was steroid refractory, checkpoint inhibitor, hepatitis, not responding to MMF. And he then becomes progressively unwell, starts to decondition poor quality of life. He's getting very malnourished. He's required frequent septic drains for the day unit. So they've opted to go down the um, some, uh, Clorox route. And he's uh, averaging about four liters of alcohol every week. <coughs> so at this point, whilst he's an inpatient, the, hep uh, the hepatology uh, team have reviewed him uh, and have gone down the route of getting an MRI liver. Um, after the previous two imaging modalities. So, um, as a details here, we, I guess it wasn't really expected, but he had a conscious suggestive chronic liver disease. This um, patchy pancreatic enhancement, which I've tried, I'm not projecting well, but it's uh, just seen on this slice here. Um, and then, uh, that's definitely not projecting, but it's meant to show you um, uh, an issue with the hepatic queen and, and the thrombus flow. Um, so, to summarize, He's got um, some portal vein thrombus, and he's been started on a, a health gun out the way through the MDT. Um, on the same day, he luckily had partial studies and a TJ biopsy done, and uh, I'll hand over to my colleague Rebecca to talk through the biopsy, but just wanted to comment on the fact that his uh, gradient was 14 suggestive of blood retention. Uh, so, this is my photography. This is pre-digitization of pathology, so this is my photography skills that clearly aren't very good. So this is an out-of-focus reticulum stain. And this just shows us really a low-power view of the architecture. So what, what it's showing here is we've got these regenerative nodules. So normally in hepatocyte cell plates are one cell plate. These are regenerative two cell plate cell plates within a nodular appearance. And this, this is a portal tract here, so we see this in zone one and two, so periportal, mid-zone. And this is zone three around the terminal hepatic end with relative atrophy of the cell plate. So typical features of nodular regenerative hepatopathia. So um, here we have then an H and E stain. Um, so this shows a portal tract here. So normally the structures, if you remember, within a portal tract should be a bile duct with an artery of a similar size and then a, a much larger branch of the portal vein. What we can see here is that the portal vein is virtually completely occluded. So the outline should be around here somewhere. So we've got a tiny bit of recanalization there and there, but a very occluded portal vein. Um, and then we've also got, this is our periportal zone one, regenerative cell plates here. This shows zone three. So your terminal hepatic venule should be here. That should be a larger white structure. So we can see that that's also virtually occluded. And what you can see in zone three is loss of the cell plates. So some of this is comp compressive atrophy. Some of it's probably ischemic atrophy of the cell plates here um, with a bit of hemorrhage. We use our special stains to really tell us what exactly is going on, what the tissue is. So this is to show you a portal tract down here. That's the um, artery, that's the bile duct, shows the portal veins gone. These are sometimes quite difficult to pick up because you're trying to note what isn't there instead of what is there. So you have to really ask yourself the question, where is the portal vein? So it's gone. Um, regenerative cell plates again here, and this is zone three. So the hepatic vein should be here in zone three. It's occluded. We also see sinusoidal fibrosis. So this gentleman's got a combination of findings. We see portal tract fibrosis, 
zone three fibrosis with occlusion both of portal veins and terminal hepatic venules. So this sits under the umbrella term of the porto sinusoidal vascular disorder. Um, interestingly, not much underlying fibrosis, right? So he hasn't got cirrhotic transformation. We don't see bridging septi. We don't see regenerative nodules. We see the fibrosis restricted to the portal veins and the, and the zone three. <coughs> so we've got um, um, some more answers, I guess, after the biopsy, um, and just having a look at his uh, little function. So he's reaching a point, um, so the biopsy happened around mid-February, so around there, and um, okay, um, so I must, I probably should this slide, yeah. So at this point, when we've got that hepatitis injury, the, there was some debate about what we should do at this stage. Um, so I'm thinking, could this be a vascular injury, as, as suggested by the biopsy, could it be most, almost be an immune-mediated injury? Should we add in a third agent like tacrolimus, which was effectively done? There's only one patient group so far that, um, that they could glean from at this, at this point in time. Um, and uh, we did have enough histological evidence of the uh, SOS slash VOD. Um, and so the treatment options at this point were defibrotide, ex uh, extrapolating from how the uh, oncologists deal with it. But uh, it was unfortunately not commissioned for post immunotherapy VOD. Um, and the second option that was being considered was if the, if the, if the main issue here is the ascites, um, then we should probably consider TIPS, which were deemed to be technically feasible. Um, it went through an extensive funding process and, and essentially got cleared and he did eventually get the fibrotron given over the span of three weeks. And so <coughs> I projected that here in the tacrolimus has just been introduced there and uh, about five days later, this overlapping green section is where the defibrotide was given. Um, and you're not really seeing much of an improvement in the ART. This is kind of doing its own thing with the ART bobbing between 200 to 300. Um, this is the platelet come out of interest. <coughs> it's sort of dropping a bit. And um, the bilirubin had never really gone past 35 uh, at all. Um, uh, it's, it's in fact normal at this stage. Um, so no, no changes there. And So fast forward to three weeks after the defibrotide had been given, um, it was too soon to say, but there was some marginal improvement in his uh, effusion, and he was essentially discharged that, that very week um, after having been fed and was feeling a little better. He developed a chest infection in the community, then methods stopped, and the decision was made to continue the tacrolimus. And I think at this point, they, there was this sort of concept of we're using these checkpoint inhibitors to basically promote this process, but then at the same time, we're also using the cytosporin and our other agents to inhibit the process. So I guess there was anxieties of whether there would be a recurrence given all of the above. But this story does actually end quite nicely in the sense that, well, at least in, in that time, that he had no further cytes but on some muscle bulk and he improved his performance status. Um, unfortunately, a year later, there was some recurrence of his neck disease, but the oncologist uh, decided not to re-challenge um, with the same drugs. So in the back end of that, this case will go much smoother because this is a 57-year-old gentleman who was known for liver unit. He's had FG fibrosis and terminal liver biopsy in 2019. He's gone through a non-invasive liver screen previously. He's got the, the metabolic phenotype for this. Um, and he presented in late 2022 with leg swelling, requiring uh, lots of hematoma evacuations, being seen by the surgeons through ED, um, extensive lymph nodes, um, which were biopsied, and uh, there was just necrotic tissue. And uh, if you fast forward that by a month, he, he then had CT, um, staining CT, well, CT cap, which showed a new 
lung and liver lesion. And then some further tissue samples of chain would prove, uh, prove that he did MS stomach melanoma. So he got straight put on to the same two medications discussed earlier. Um, the timeline is important. It's April. So he then presented within two cycles of having, uh, might be a bit, yeah, probably within a month. I don't even know if he had a second cycle. But he presented with this, with similar field fatigue, ascites, which was uh, seen in association with high CFP low platelets, all being managed by our oncologists, treated as a cytokine release syndrome. So he has um, imaging done, which shows some small volume ascites. They there was some ambiguity about whether there was some alpha issues in the hepatic vein, but this was followed up with an ultrasound liver, which didn't show any venous alpha issues or alpha issues. Um, a mild ascites, he had normal ducts and varices. Uh, and two weeks later, he had an LCT abdomen done to see whether things had improved um, and had pretty much progression of the ascites with similar workup to the previous case, uh, where it was just deemed to be uh, transudative uh, ascites. Um, so I will fast forward this bit in the interest of time, but um, he, he went through kind of a similar pathway. So in comparison, a mild, a milder form of hepatitis, um, not much cholestasis, given some steroids, and he did some form of improvement. Um, unfortunately, at this point is where he became, uh, this is where he came in with the uh, just being unwell, basically, he got admitted under the oncologist and was put on IV methyl prem. Um, what was different in this case, though, to Mark was his platelets were low from the from the ulcer, and um, uh, and they were not that low actually. I just have them down here, but they, they were not low prior to him being started on the um, check one inhibitors, um, and his bilirubin was. Um, at about 40 here. Um, so I think we were a bit more quicker this time, or rather we got the referral much quicker. Normal nasal liver screen again, didn't show any other obvious etiologies uh, via autoimmune. He didn't have much, uh, he didn't really drink, non-smoker, and a pressure study uh, showing a grade of 22 uh, on local record of sugar policy. We process this, this um, about to be urgently, so I just had the HME to look at initially. So, um, the, the strikes, so to me, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't recall the steatosis, the hepatitis in the background, and, and there isn't any um, on this biopsy, so that, that's gone. Also, not impressed with the steatohepatitic type fibrosis, um, so whether that's resolved. But what this does show is more acute changes than we saw, to my mind, in the previous biopsy. So, um, what I saw was hemorrhage in zone three, so um, acute hemorrhage, all the pink slushy stuff in zone three is hemorrhage. So this to me histologically looks like blood curare. It can look like some more like ventricular failure, pericardial, like just any any form of an um, acute venous output obstruction. I did wonder about this pink sludgy stuff here and some more pink sludgy stuff there where the hepatic veins are meant to be. Um, I haven't photographed the portal tracts here. They were completely normal. So um, all vessels were present in the portal tract. So his pathology seemed to be confined to zone three. The next day, I get my um, connective tissue stain three, which shows me what pink sludgy stuff is. So you can see this is the vein here, and that's occluded by very loose collagen. So the, the red stains collagen. Uh, the black is elastic fibers, so that, that black showing you the outline of the terminal hepatic venule. And this is very recent loose fibrosis with a little bit of sinusoidal fibrosis as well. No inflammatory alcohol, and that's what it said about it. So, so at, at that time, so it still sits under the umbrella term of portosinusoidal vascular disorder, although there aren't portal tract changes as an umbrella term. All the changes you see in this biopsy are in the term of hepatovenal and zone um, three. So, as the biopsy suggested, it was a blood curry, it was confirmed on ultrasound not to be one. Um, similar uh, sort of strategy to the previous case where we initiated um, multiple agents, so tacrolimus and MMF was added in. Um, and because we've got an LVOD finding, so Diprobutide was also quite funny and used again um, with reasonable amounts of success. As reflected in the LFT 
he is always he's he's not fully normalized yet, but he's doing much better clinically. Um, again, just pointing out that the platelets were quite low throughout, and then after over time you see this uh, sort of platelet response and um, the bilirubin uh, sort of is gradually increasing. So I don't have much to really add in terms of the uh, just in the interest of time, uh, the to summarize the concept of chili, check fine liver, check fine inhibitor liver injuries, a form of the billy. Um, I just want to point out that when you use more than two agents, your, your chance of getting it in fact it's quite high. It can occur anytime during treatment. Um, you get this, the standard patterns, predominantly hepatitic, could be cholestatic mixed, but you rarely see liver failure. Um, the workup is very methodical as we would normally do. As with any other case of liver disease, we rule out any other bystanders, focusing on the cohort here and the um, uh, cancer patients, they have more vascular insults or could keep them broad uh, for disease progression. I'm sure people are familiar with this uh, pathway. Of, uh, the reason I put it up there is just to say that oncologists would generally use ALT as the prognostic marker, and it's, I guess, when we're taking referrals. Uh, it's useful to ask whether they've considered some benefits, which they have. They, they have started now, I suppose, because it's in the guidelines whether you use bumper marker IV steroids. The other thing to note is there's been a recent change last year that previously, if you had uh, AST of more than a thousand, you would never use that agent again. But now you can rechallenge. Um, this slide was mainly just to comment on the fact that infliximab really should not be used in uh, checkpoint-induced liver uh, injury. Um, so, just to summarize, uh, there was, um, in our particular case, there was no real difference. Um, the biopsy and the pressure studies were really crucial and essential. Um, and you can uh, use three agent immunosuppression as you would normally. And uh, there is some evidence for using osteoxycholic acid as the hematologists use it for prophylaxis. But QRE can resemble as, uh, SOS, so just don't be caught out by it. Uh, I won't go into this, but basically it's a criteria that tells you whether it's severe or not. Um, but if they're well, you manage it as you normally would manage ascites with uh, diuretics and paracentesis. And my last slide just highlights that this is, this is perhaps a very expensive um, drug uh, with just three weeks worth costing approximately that much to have this mechanism not very really well understood, but it does arguably improved, so I guess there's a case to be made for looking at the qualities and whether it's, it's more useful if these cases continue to show up with more usage of check on inhibitors. Um, thank you very much. presentation, uh, Sridhar from LinkedIn. Are, are there any oncologists here? No, oh, you're okay. 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 I was going to say this is the bane of my life over the last six months, accumulated about uh, half a dozen patients. Uh, I found about 30% of them are predominantly cholestatic, and they are the ones who probably are not doing so well with a conventional uh, treatment algorithm. Uh, the literature is sparse, but it, it probably suggests that uh, immune-related cholangiopathy is a bit more resistant to treatment. Um, and two of my patients who had the cholestatic kind of thing kind of rapidly deteriorated with ascites, and I can see now that they probably have venous and you know, vascular issues. Do you actually have a low threshold to biopsy them if they don't respond to the first and second line treatment before you actually think of APG or tachyonus or something? And also, the other question is, in the cholestatic ones, because the algorithm is predominantly driven with the ALT, but it's the other group which is not doing so well, do you have a low threshold to probably add in treatment in those cholestatic ones? So, uh, I'll try to answer that question. But um, I think uh, if you look at the timeline, um, we were also supposed caught up with maybe a delayed uh, sort of biopsy because we were expecting uh, as for the algorithm. So to answer your first question, I think, yes, we're, we're, we're trying to get the biopsies and pressure studies early on, look for any potential targets. With regards to your second question, 
I think I'm, I don't know if any of, any of the consultants have a particular answer. I didn't really hear the second question, but the first question I would agree in George um, has sort of broke up our protocol and used very in favour of privacy in that setting that you described. The second question? Yes, good question. So it's, um, I don't think we would, but Will, you probably know more about this than, well, not probably, but you know more about this than me. Great, thank you very much. Um, were th I just one, one very quick question. Were they actually very kind to you? Uh, yes, the first one was. Uh, you think the first one could have had bugs the in there? Mm, no. Didn't you demonstrate a clock in there? I did. Anyway, yeah. let's move on. Next. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm only, I'm only keeping you. Right, so Jess. Um, Jess um, Wong has come up from. Um, thanks, Roy. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, yes, one will come down the um, A11 to join us from Norwich. Um, I've met her a couple of times in the Norwich Clinic where she's been very helpful um, and helped us with blood gases and so on. So welcome. Thank you very much. And if you could try to keep the time, that would be much appreciated. Thank you, Jess. Hi, I'm Jess. I'm one of the senior clinical fellows from Norwich. Um, my case is called The Postman Always Gets Diagnosed Twice, and this is a case of a gentleman who's managed both in Norwich and um, um, in Cambridge, so some of us might be familiar with this. So our story starts back in um, 2016. At the time, Mr. J.W. is a fit and well 51-year-old gentleman. He's married, he works as a postman in Norwich. He occasionally drinks and he's an ex-smoker. He presents back in um, October 2016 with shortness of breath. So his chest x-ray, um, at the time, shows a hyaluronic lymphadenopathy, so he's referred to our respiratory colleagues. The um, organizer CT shows some calcified lymph nodes and an incidental benign looking liver lesion. So he goes on to have a transbronchial biopsy, which confirms the diagnosis of pulmonary sarcoid. Um, so he's just followed up in the respiratory clinic until June 2019, when he um, was finally referred to the liver clinic as his LPs have become deranged. His ALP and GGT have gone up. Um, he's first seen in the liver clinic in September 2019. Um, his initial liver screen is negative, and the working diagnosis here is one of possible uh, hepatic sarcoid. So uh, repeat imaging is requested. Um, so these are his two scans, so, so from 2017 and 2019. So his 2017 scan shows this um, sclerose looking um, uh, potential hemangioma, and his 2019 scan shows the progression of the um, disease with some structuring and bleeding, which is atypical for sarcoid, and therefore a liver biopsy is advised. His liver biopsy is done. It's both of his background liver and one of the lesions. His background biopsy is difficult to interpret, possibly some early cholangiography with reactive changes. His lesional biopsy shows some degenerate fibrous and calcified material and some macrophages. And he goes on to be discussed at the histology and DT. Um, they feel that the focal area of scarring may or may not be sarcoid related, but that is background biopsy could be consistent with very mild sarcoid. Um, so in 2019 to 2021, he remains clinically stable, but things start to change in November 21. He gets recurrent admissions from then on with recurrent um, cholangitis. He starts to become jaundiced, and he has a significant rise in his liver function tests and uh, worsening cholangiography. On one of these occasions, um, he's very jaundiced, his bilirubin is 140, so he started on prednisolone um, for treatment of his hepatic sarcoid, and um, this seems to work. Um, so he's discharged on that, and uh, 
In the next few months, we try to wean down these steroids, so we um, initiate him on isoflurofen, and later on, and then on mycophenolate, as he doesn't tolerate the ASA. But unfortunately, every time we try to wean down his steroid, his LFTs worsen. So over the next few months, he's, he continues to become unwell. So he's discussed with a local sulfur expert and with the Cambridge hepatology team. And an NDT decision is made to trial three cycles and inflict him out for his hepatic sulfur, which he goes on to have. Unfortunately, um, this does not work. He has multiple further admissions, feeling unwell, with GI symptoms and abnormal liver tests. So he's going to the toilet about 20 times a day at that point. He has no improvement on infliximab, so this is stopped. His GI symptoms are fully investigated with endoscopy and colonoscopies, and we cannot find any pathology. So this is an MR from uh, 2023, and this shows this ongoing uh, process around the right lobe with some now new development of cystic abnormalities in the, this area there with worsening portal hypertension. And the radiologist raises this question that this could be something other than sulfoid, so a repeat biopsy could be considered. So this is um, rediscussed again with Adam Brooks. Um, his imaging are all reviewed, and they feel that there's definitely progression of uh, his biliary disease, especially in the right lobe. Um, his initial biopsy, if you recall, did not show any background cirrhosis, but now we need to clarify this because he is heading towards a possible transplant. Um, so he has a repeat liver biopsy, which shows features not in keeping with sarcoidosis, um, a lot of acute inflammation and necrophagic activity. Um, after his liver biopsy, he continues to become progressively more unwell, with signs of portal hypertension, ascites and encephalopathy. His U plasma now 56, so in March 23, he's listed for transplant. He has multiple further admissions after this, and one of which leads to an inpatient transfer to Adam Brooks in June 23. So he's listed for a transplant for an unexplained angiography process, and he has a transplant on the 4th of July. He has to go back to theatre on the 5th for a raw white hepatogenostomy. Um, he has a fairly rocky post-op um, journey with sepsis and delirium. And then on the 20th, he has to go back for an urgent review, unfortunately, because of hepatic glasses thrombosis and bardic necrosis. So, um, after reviewing his native liver, um, we found something which we're not quite um, expecting. And uh, for those who don't know the case, um, we kind of welcome any suggestions of what you think this might have been. <laughs> What's that? IgG4. You can stay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good, good thought to be shot. Any infectious disease? Negative. Who said that? Sort of. Go on. <laughs> Who said that? I can't see. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm, the thunder. Well I'm going to leave the histology to uh, go talk about. Oh, that's got my other book as well. So, um, <laughs> um, so some of the areas, so in terms of what the liver looked microscopically, um, it was very cholestatic as we'd expect, and there are multiple um, cystic areas at different sites. So this would be close to one of the cystic areas, probably adjacent to it. We've got very dense fibrosis with um, calcification. So the process has been going on for a very long time for calcium. And you can imagine that if the lesion liver biopsy originally had gone through here, it's very difficult to kind of defend on the pathology team. It would be very difficult to give a diagnosis of this and what that actually is. Um, but you can see here the edge of the cystic lesion. Um, and if we look at those in a bit more detail, we have um, fibrosis around the outside. We have a laminated layer that goes into the interior. Um, again, at this point, we start suspecting hepatitis, um, but what we're looking for is more classical features. So um, this is the dorsal cyst uh, in here, front of the dorsal cyst in here. This is the germinal layer there. Um, and then this is a really nice picture of the endoscopy um, of the uh, hepatogenic office. Um, and then just some more examples there, because this really is very difficult. 
um, and again, but I thought that this in my journal then. So, yeah, so what we found was um, Echinopithecus multilocularis, uh, also known as Hadassi disease, so whoever got it right, well done. So Echinopithecus, commonly known as Hadassi disease, caused by tapeworms. There's two main types, the cystic and alveolar types, or gentlemen had alveolar echinopathesis, which is caused by multilocularis. Spread through ingestion of eggs or by close contact with um, infected animals. Um, cysts can survive in years, uh, for years in the organ. So there's an incubation period of approximately 10 to 15 years initially they can live in prison asymptomatically. Um, when, they do, when patients do present, they come with upper abdominal pain, um, sometimes jaundice and cholangitis. If the cyst rupture, the patients can present with anaphylaxis, and they can cause a previous thrombus leading to patients presenting with signs of portal hypertension. Um, there's a preference of a, for the right lobe over the left lobe, um, and it's known as the malignant hydatid, as it can spread to other organs, so it can spread to brain and lungs, and can cause tissue, dis tissue disruption and lead to liver failure. If left untreated, it's got like a 90% mortality rate at 10 years. And treatment options are surgical resection, PIR, which is a percutaneous aspiration, injection, and de-aspiration of the cyst, or medical treatment with antihelminthic drugs. So in our case, he had a liver transplant. So there's been some literature on uh, liver transplants in advanced alveolar echinopathesis. So this is a case series of 27 such um, transplants in Turkey. Um, two such cases in Brazil, and uh, 45 uh, cases of it, quite a few years um, in some European centers, so most of the clients in Germany. Um, so after his liver transplant, the gentleman well, was started on albendazole long term, so for at least a minimum of two years. Um, he had ongoing albendazole level monitoring in the community. Um, so he was rediscussed at the respiratory MDT because there was a question about whether his initial pulmonary sulfur could have been echinococcus. But they felt that these lymph node changes were most likely to be historical sulfur. And I'd like to go quickly and review some of these imaging. So we sat down with one of the GR radiologists to go through his previous CT. So this is first CTs back in 2017, and that was the first um, uh, lesion that we saw in his right, again, the right lobe. Um, and then the progression of these changes, which showed some very signal T2s, um, which would have fit at the time with, with what we thought was sulfurogenesis. Um, this is a, an interesting image because there's, there's this black hole appearance here, which um, we can fit in a, in a lot of different diseases, of course, but um, in Echinococcus, because the entire lesion is made up of parasite, parasite tissue, there's no blood flow, and therefore you would also expect this kind of black hole appearance with no septa. Um, so again, progression of disease on the 2019 scan, so um, the, the disease progresses along the um, portal tracts and along the vasculature, which is something that is recognized in hydatid disease. It can also happen in other, in other conditions, but um, also happens in hydatid disease. Um, these are some uh, periobiliary cystic changes that we thought initially in kinetic were all related to sulcoid cholangiopathy, but um, you know, in hindsight, after reviewing the case, they were most likely to just be hydatid cystic disease. Um, and this slide shows this very nice portal vein thrombus, which the gentleman unfortunately had, and we now know that um, hydatid disease can cause um, portal vein thrombus. So in conclusion, this was an extremely challenging and unusual case for us. This is the first time we ever came across hydatid disease as a cause um, of, of liver failures in, in this gentleman. Um, the incidence of parasites, normally they do happen, um, so some countries in, in Europe, such as France and Germany, tend to have more cases of hydatid disease, but we may very well see more of them in the future as, um, you know, climate change and globalization um, increases. So it's something that we need, we should probably become a bit more familiar with. Um, but we have reflected on this case um, as a team, and we can't think of anything else we would have done differently with the information available to us. But obviously, if there's any thoughts or suggestions from the audience, that would be very welcome.
Um, and thank you very much to everyone who has helped me with this presentation. These are my references. And I can still see straight into my presentation. Hello. Can I ask, um, to the even next question, maybe worse. Um, do you think there's enough of a basis to give you an expression given that it's dubious effects were cycled anyway, even if they had been cycled? Yes, I'm afraid. Not necessarily specific to you, just to But you can start. I may need this question because all my colleagues actually in the room. So I think Aaron, you, Aaron was dealing, Aaron, were you dealing with the case, I think? <laughs> Aaron's up there. Mm. So if you could just throw the... Oh, look at that. Um, yeah, probably in retrospect, given all that in retrospect, it's not a good idea. I mean, the, 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 I suppose the, the issue was that he, uh, uh, when he was in, and he was basically on the cusp of liver failure, we were on the cusp of sending him to you, uh, we did give him a high dose steroids numbers got better, and he got better. I think that's probably pushed us down the way of immune suppression, and actually, you know, in retrospect, it was um, probably the wrong thing to do, obviously the wrong thing to do, but, um, yeah. Uh, do you believe that the lung changes are cycle? Yes. We've kind of gone back and looked at it a couple of times, and some of them, you know, even with the, with the retrospect scope, but they, they think it's cycle, which obviously that's the slightly end of in, in retrospect, we red herring, but, um, but that obviously another thing that pushed us down the wrong, the wrong route. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Can I ask, do you have any comments on the imaging? I just want to make it clear. Um, I think you've broken it. <laughs> How about that? Um, looks a bit odd to me. So I've always had this thing. So in the lung, in the liver, in the liver, yeah. More often you get in the liver, very small, very dark lesions, rather than a sort of more conglomerate solitary lesion with cystic areas like that. So, I mean, I, I can't say the panicophis would pick up there, but yeah. differential, it's just, I don't know what that is. But uh, the sarcoid, I would have probably not commented on the sarcoid. But I think we probably didn't know what it was, but because of the lung sarcoid, it was pushed down that route. Yeah, that, that I felt understand. Say, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think maybe biopsy is probably the yeah. only yeah. thing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, interesting case. I was just thinking uh, in uh, hydratic disease, we expect multi populated, multiple cysts, and it becomes easier to diagnose. When it's a solitary lesion, I'm thinking of patients who would have probably missed some kind of uh, this condition. Uh, in the future, if we uh, think about this, uh, in the uh, British population, sorry, HIV is uh, more common in countries where it is more common. This disease is more common. I assume this is the uh, English one. But if we suspect, uh, uh, sorry, if we have patients with solitary condition, learning from this case, how would you change your practice? Should the hydrated serology be something you Use and is it helpful? So we did, uh, yeah, we did think about, you know, in the future whether hydatid serology should become sort of more routine for us to think, to descend, especially in cases where we're not 100% sure of the cause for these, for, for, for an unknown lesion. Um, so I, I think that might, that might change our practice, yes. Okay, one last question, please. Yeah, this case is not uncommon in other countries. So, was there any travel history or contact with animals? So, he, he did have some travel history. Um, so, he had uh, gone to France about 15 years ago, but again, who among us hasn't? Uh, he's been to Tunisia and Bulgaria. Yeah, but, yeah, the main, so because it's not uncommon, and usually the flu in diagnosis is just the travel history or contact with sheep. That's yeah. why I. And, and Will's mother was a general practitioner and saw quite a lot of hydrated in Wales. 
Yeah. And then the ERB team got very interested in this case. They, they, uh, I think they, they put him on a kind of stool in an interrogation suite and managed to get a slightly wider travel history than he probably actually had. It's okay. definitely a case of both things you know it will never forget. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> all right, thanks so much. Thank yes. you very much. And thank you very much to uh, Rebecca and Anna. Thank you. So, um, Matt Small is, has been one of my colleagues for a long time now. He co leads our HEC service and does some uh, clever research as well. And um, beyond six monthly ultrasound scans, he's going to tell us what we need to do regarding HEC surveillance. Yeah, thanks, Will, and uh, thanks everyone for coming along. And um, that's all for those people who don't know me. Yeah, I co lead the HEC MDT. And we're going to talk today about uh, surveillance for HEC, what's been going on. Uh, and what we hope that we can make things better in the future. So, um, clearly things are not going in the right direction. And there's some quite nice statistics from Annie Burton and involving many of you, looking at the rate at which people are developing HCC in this country. And what you can see is over a relatively short time period between 2010 and 2016, what you're seeing is that most of the country is going more green, and more green means more HCC. I think that's borne out from what you will see in your regional clinics, is what we are seeing in, uh, in, in Edinburgh from the MDT. What we're not seeing is any great improvement in the rate at which we are getting patients through to potentially curative treatment. Now, and I think this, this scale here is rather embarrassing, that we are, you know, we are sort of looking at the good centres, I think clearly Ian Rowe must be having an impact in Leeds, that, you know, the good centres, we're getting to sort of 30% patients are receiving potentially curative treatment. I mean, why are we doing so badly? Well, we've got a clear at-risk population, we've got a surveillance programme, why are we not able to take patients and convert them into people who have early stage cancer receiving curative treatments? And so one of the things I'd like to do today is just unpick a lot of what we've been doing in the past, the assumptions that that's based on, and how we can change things around. So we do surveillance. We do surveillance with ultrasound. We do it every six months. Why? Now, it's often mentioned that there's this one con randomized controlled trial for ultrasound-based surveillance. I think it's worth actually digging into the details of what that trial was, what it showed, and think about how in the, the relevance of this to your practice. So what it was, was that this um, recruited between 93 and 95, and they recruited just shy of 19,000 patients in Shanghai. They were between 35 and 59, they had a mean age of 41, and that they only recruited patients with chronic hepatitis B. And they defined chronic hepatitis B by the presence of surface antigen. There was no requirement for DNA, there was no requirement for fibrosis. And they straight randomized patients that they identified in GP practice, family medicine, or whatever you want to call it, to ultrasound and AFP every six months, or nothing. And what they found was that firstly, they didn't get any better uptake of surveillance than we get in this country. So this is what happens when you start inviting people. So the people who come for the first round, but over the, the subsequent 10 screening rounds, you're starting to get down to 40% uptake of screening. So whatever they're doing, they're not persuading people to come back for repeat screening over time. What they are able to do, though, is in the context of 19,000 people, is to identify a small number of HCCs. So 86 in the screen group, 67 in the unscreened. And uh, what you can see is that there's generally more patients who have earlier stage tumors in the screen group, and they have a better survival. Okay, so not cirrhotic, East Asian, hepatitis B. How relevant is this to our practice? The second um, line of evidence which has really supported our implementation has been the observational data which has come out of Japan. Again, East Asian ancestry, predominantly hepatitis C. They implement a surveillance program in 1980. And what they see is that over time, they go from a situation where they've had a median survival of about a year 
um, in, in, the, uh, in the, the patients with um, HCC through to um, uh, a median survival of about two years after implementation. And now they're getting a median survival of over five in patients who are presenting with HCC. Now, this isn't because of the fact that they're inherently healthier, it's because they have inherently less disease, because when you start looking at a uh, contemporaneous cohort, this is the screened Japanese cohort here. This is the unscreened Japanese cohort, and this is a contemporaneous unscreened cohort from Hong Kong. So there's nothing inherently better, earlier, less disease about Japan. It just happens to be that they're implementing surveillance in an effective way. So because of these data, because of this evidence, um, that um, a, a number of people have gone on to conduct meta-analyses to look at what the sort of real-world impact is of surveillance. And this is one by Amit Singhal from, um, from Dallas. And he's uh, looked at um, a number of studies with just shy of 150,000 patients. And what you can see is that if you have HCC and that um, you have undergone surveillance to diagnose that, your chances of being um, detected at any stage roughly double, your chances of receiving curative treatment roughly double, and you have around a sort of 35% improvement in your overall survival. So it is undoubtedly true that based on the trials, based on real-world data, that surveillance is effective. So on the basis of this, depending on which learned body you um, particularly subscribe to, that all of them now recommend that in patients who have cirrhosis, all have FSB, all have nephron with M FC with at least F3 fibrosis, that they should undergo surveillance. All of them recommend that they should undergo six months of ultrasound, and three of them recommend that they should, this should be combined with serum alpha feed protein. Ours do not recommend um, feed to protein, and they, they lay out their, um, their, their, their reasoning in, in the guidelines. In Cambridge, we would perform six months of the ultrasound with AFP. Um, I think it's also worth remembering what AFP does, what AFP tells you. So this is our data going back about seven years. So this is um, all patients who've been diagnosed with HCC from you through our MAT. So we've got about 768 for which we have data, and the median um, uh, AFP at diagnosis is eight. So if you're looking for um, an AFP to be raised, in most of the cases, you are not going to see it. What you are going to see is you are going to see elevation in those patients who have developed an aggressive, transcriptionally poor outcome tumor. I think the big change, though, that everything we have discussed so far is that the data is based on patients from a decade, two decades, three decades ago, where hepatology was different. We tended to deal with patients who had viral hepatitis, a small number of patients who had a very high attributable risk of HCC. And I think it's undoubtedly true that all of us will see that the big coming king is NAFLD, or if you want to subscribe to the, to the new nomenclature, it's MARSLD. And what on earth are we going to do with this disease? Now, um, we've got fairly good um, uh, um, uh, data suggesting what is going to happen over the next few years. So we know that in 2016, that around 14 million adults in the UK had NAFLD, but most of them don't have significant fibrosis. That this is the sort of um, the, the data about the, the, the different fibrosis stages. But the, what we're predicting is that, um, uh, is that in about six or seven years now, that the total number of patients with NAFLD will have risen to around 17 million. Again, most of them will not have liver disease. But that if you look here within the, the different um, cohorts of fibrosis, that we're still talking about 400,000 patients who are going to have NAFLD cirrhosis in the UK. Now, a quick back of the envelope calculation tells us that in this room, we're managing a catchment area, area of around 6.5 million people. The Anglian region has about that number of people, about 10% of the UK population. So if at the moment we have 200,000 nationally, where are these 20,000 NAFLD cirrhotics? Where are they? Who's looking after them? And over the next four or five 
years, how on earth are we going to cope with 40,000 medical slaughters in our region? We need to think about this and design our services based around these kind of numbers. And that's feeding through into outcomes. So, again, the best data is here in, uh, in the States. So this is the, uh, the SRTR database of transplant candidates. Now, it's not transplant recipients, it's just candidates. And that between 2002-2017, um, uh, you had 30,000 patients-ish who were listed with HCC. And what you can see is that the prevalence within candidates has gone up from 6% to 22%. But I think the really interesting thing is what's happening within, uh, within the data. So you can see when DAAs were released, because the, the, pre the prevalence of different etiologies in HCC suddenly for hepatitis C starts to fall off a cliff here. Whereas you can see that over time, the number of patients here who got NASH, NAFL, muzzles is progressively rising, nearly continuously. And if we were to see the data now, you would probably find that these two curves kind of crossed. So the rise in NAFLs is feeding through into long-term outcomes and is going to come to dominate our practice. And the important thing is that now the HCC in NAFLs muscles is different. So that for HCC of a decade, two decades ago, the proportion of patients with HCC who were not cirrhotic, so in Hep C, 6%, alcohol, 9%, and this is, again, a meta-analysis for around 75,000 patients. When you start to get to NAFL, suddenly patients are presenting who are not cirrhotic. And so when you then start to look at those HCCs and ask the question, well, how many of them have been on a surveillance program? Well, in the non nafl okay, we're still only managing less than 6 in 10, whereas in, in NAFL, less than 1 in 3 because they wouldn't be surveyed, because they're not cirrhotic. Now, what on earth can we do with our surveillance programs? So, does it make any sense to survey patients who have NAFLD? Well, and what we know is that American insurers will pay for surveillance if you can make it cost-effective, which is basically $100,000 per kind of quality. And you can achieve that level of cost-effectiveness when your annual incidence of HCC is about 44%. So if you remember that hepatitis C, alcohol, and hemochromatosis, you're starting to think in the realms of 2%, 2.5%, 3%. We need to achieve a sort of benchmark of 0.4. All right, so this is, this is a range of different studies in natural with cirrhosis. And what you see is that in relatively decent numbers, and this study is probably the biggest. Okay, are we achieving that? Yes, we are. So sort of 0.9% per annum in, in NAFLD, but probably three, four times lower than we would anticipate in those other etiologies. So we're going to have to scale up our surveillance programs by three to four fold to cope with the number of patients to diagnose the same number of HCC. So cost effective in, in, um, in cirrhotics, but raises significant resource implications. But what on earth about non-cirrhotics? And this is a, a group of studies which have looked at the incidence of HCC in patients who have natural mastery without cirrhosis. And what you can see is that we're talking massive numbers here, 136,000, nearly 300,000, 18,000. And you're talking about 0.3 per thousand patient years. There is no way that a simple ultrasound surveillance program in NAFLD without cirrhosis is in any way cost effective or in any way a good use of radiologist or sonographer time. And part of the reason is that when you start to look at this population is that they are multimorbid. This is an incredibly interesting study published relatively recently um, from, from Denmark. And what they have done is it's a population based study of 110,000 patients and uh, people, people in Copenhagen. And um, they pragmatically defined NASH, the hepatitis, as greater than ALT, uh, ALT greater than 70 in men, 45 in, in women. And they asked the question, well, what happens? What do, how often do they die? And how often do they die of liver disease? And what you can see is that patients who probably have NAFLD start to die on, um, earlier, 
and uh, more frequently in their 60s than in patients who have normal liver function tests. But they're not dying of liver disease. They, they die of liver disease later with much, much lower frequency. So if we're thinking of surveying this population, we need to be thinking about a sort of holistic care for these people. And that's not necessarily our role. You know, is this diabetologist? Is this general practitioner? Is this cardiologist? Is this stroke physician? Who should be surveying these people? Because most of what they're going to get along the line is not HCC. It's cardiovascular disease. So, quick interim summary. HCC surveillance, as we practice it, is evidence-based, albeit that the evidence is not ideal. It's based on patients who have non natural related liver diseases, which are decreasing in frequency. The surveillance in natural um, is indicated in cirrhosis, but we literally have no idea what on earth to do with patients who have non cirrhotic natural. So how can we do better now? What can we do better now in our practice? So I think there's three areas. Identifying patients, getting patients into surveillance, and then performing adequate surveillance when we have them. So the first thing to do is, is how do we identify patients? Well, you know, we all have similar-ish pathways into surveillance. And most patients, you know, when we're thinking about sort of um, patients with NAFL, it's in general that they've got to range liver function tests, they have a FIB4 or an ALF test, they end up having a fibre scan, and if they have a fibre scan, they're going to put a particular cut on. Well, you know, is this the best route for these patients? Now, this is an interesting study in family medicine clinics in Florida. 560 type 2 diabetics, similar kind of people we would see, age 60, BMI 35, all right? 10% of them, 12% of them have got to range liver function tests. But if you do transient elastography and, and a CAT scan on all of them, 70% of them have osteotosis, 21% of them have fibrosis, 9% are cirrhotic. So using LFTs and the FIB4, is that a good gateway into identifying these people? Or are we just missing a massive number of people who have normal LFTs but significant underlying liver disease? That's not for us to determine. This is general practice, this is diabetologists. How on earth are we going to streamline this process? Second thing, what we can do is the surveillance program that we offer. I've worked in many of the hospitals around the region. The surveillance program is patchily implemented, it's difficult, we book it from clinic, the, the, the results come to our in-tray, we get round to, to booking them, the letters don't reach the patients. We know this, you know this. And, you know, Tim Cross and Phil Johnson from the have demonstrated this is true. So this is their data, 804 surveyed patients in Liverpool, that if you had performed surveillance absolutely perfectly with six monthly ultrasounds on the dot, you would have performed just shy of 3,500 ultrasounds. How many scans were actually performed? 2,500 less. And when you start to drill down into why they didn't have it, it's the usual hodgepodge of process, admin, bureaucracy, and I don't know. How on earth can we run a surveillance program like this? We need to make our processes metronomic. We have to come up with IT systems which have automated recall, which are able to read um, standardized reporting templates and just book the next scan. Why are we involved in this? You know, we need to design databases and IT systems which can implement this for us. Who's going to pay for that? I don't know. And then thirdly, once we've got patients in, we need to survey them adequately. What we know is that if you take a cohort of patients, so this is Dallas and Ann Arbor, they take 2,000 2, patients who are undergoing surveillance, and then you ask the question, if we perform an ultrasound surveillance on these people, how many of these are actually adequate? So many of you will have heard of the LIRAD system, which we use now to define um, lesions which we find in cross-sectional imaging. Well, there's now an ultrasound LIRAD um, system which allows us to define what the adequacy of ultrasound surveillance is. And obviously, if you are a thin, young, East Asian with hepatitis B, who has you know, very little fat between the operator and your liver, you're going to have a very good visualization of your, of your um, entire liver. Whereas if, like many of our sort of East Anglian natives, you're going to have a visualization score of C, where 
you know, the liver is heterogeneous, it's fatty, there's an awful lot of the patient between you and their liver, and they're going to have this score of C. Well, in, in the Anna Harbour cohort, 20% have either B or C visualization, and it was a direct line correlating with obesity and nerve pain. So we've now implemented this within our ultrasound and uh, uh, surveillance program, and we're now replacing ultrasound for patients who have a visualization score C because it's pointless. And so we've now switched over to uh, abbreviated um, uh, MRI scanning. There's enormous interest around, uh, in this around the world. There's a whole range of different formats. Most of you will be aware of you know, differences between multiphasic scans and gadavis versus primavis. But most of what we're talking about is either non-contrast abbreviated MRI or hepatobiliary phase abbreviated MRI. And there's a nice um, sort of pooled analysis looking at whether this makes any difference. So just to get your eye in for this, if you take a pooled analysis of the sensitivity of ultrasound, it's about 63%, all right? So ultrasound will identify 63 out of 100 HCCs that are coming past and miss 37 of them. All right, so if you perform non-contrast abbreviated MRI, you can get reasonable sensitivity, but it can be as low as 61%, so no better than ultrasound. Whereas in all of these studies with decent numbers, where they perform a hepatobiliary phase of the MRI, you're getting sensitivities in the sort of 80s to, to, to low 90s. And so this is the basis on which we have changed our practice here in, in England. And so for patients who have ultrasound visualization score C, uh, we now perform a hepatobiliary phase um, uh, uh, of MRI. Um, it is not a replacement for a full protocol contrast and harvest. Okay, that's the first thing to say, not a replacement. Uh, and what happens is the patient gets a, a shot of Primavis out in the waiting room, and then uh, 20 minutes later they, they, they come in and they have a limited scan, which they spend 15 to 20 minutes on the macro. So probably less time than they can spend in the ultrasound room. All right, so this is doable. And that you then get a standardized retort reporting template after the scan. And they're either negative and they just go onwards to uh, uh, fill the scan in six months, subthreshold, in which case they come back slightly earlier or they're positive and they go, go on to get a full contrast and harvest evaluation. So this is one way. We're not saying it's the right way, but this is how we are doing it at the moment. And I would encourage you to think about it in your own practice. But how can we do better in the future? And really, there's a huge number of groups around the world that are starting to think about this. And it's really broken down into, into, into two areas. One is risk stratification. You know, can we triage these people? You know, we've got these vast cohorts of patients who are NAPLs. How can we break them down into those people who are low and high risk so we can target our screening into those people who are at higher risk? And then tumor biomarkers. Can we actually detect the tumor as it's coming along? All right, so current technology, what we can use now uh, in risk stratification, well, there are ways we can do it if we start to, uh, to sort of think about this a little bit more intelligently. So I'm, I'm an inherent skeptic about the idea of machine learning, okay, most of which is, a, is essentially we don't know what the computer is doing. But this is a very nice study, which um, a, a French study, multi-centric, taking 836 patients with hepatitis C, a first diagnosis, they're all iron positive, and then asking the question, well, you know, can we perform a Bayesian decision tree analysis to ask, well, who's going on to get HCC? And all they're using is very, very simple analytes here. You know, what's the albumin, what's the platelet count, what's the gamma GT? What you can see is the cumulative instance of HCC. You can break this cohort fairly rapidly down on the basis of very simple testing, all right, if you understand which of these markers is actually prognostic. The important thing is, obviously, before SVR, it's a different bunch of stuff than, than after SVR. But again, you know, looking at AST, PT, you can rapidly triage who your at-risk patients are. So there are means of risk stratifying with relatively simple technology. Current technology, and um, uh, we're thinking about tumor biomarkers. Many of you will have heard about GARAT. Um, Bill Johnson in Liverpool is, a, is an evangelist uh, for this. Okay, there's um, obviously GARAT, there's the reduced version, which is GARAT, or there's ASAP. This is based on the GARAT. This is the gender, age, L3, AFP, um, uh, the AFP, and the DCP. It's otherwise known as ASAP, which is the age, sex, AFP, and PIDP2. So DCP and PIDP2 are the same thing. And if you start to look at um, uh, surveyed populations of Birmingham and Newcastle, you achieve near miraculous diagnostic performance for, 
for, uh, for uh, HCC. So an, an error on the curve of 0.97 for the, for the gamma model. Now, um, other groups around the world have found similar, similar findings. So again, this is, this is Mayo, nearly 300 patients. You're getting a, a, a rock score of you know, 0.95. So um, PIVCA2 has, has been acquired by Roche. This is now being rolled out. Obviously, there is a cost. It's now, uh, Giles tells me this is now available in um, New Zealand. It's been used in Japan for donkey's years. So it may be the case that we're able to roll out the guard here in, in this region as a, as a surveillance tool. But thinking about future technology, I mean, it's, you know, it's going to be vitally important that we have the literacy to understand the technology that's coming along, which is going to potentially impact on our practice. Now, and most of um, the, the sort of future technologies which are sort of coming along the pipeline are based around this sort of transcriptional machinery. So, um, so yeah, either single nucleotide polymorphisms, so you know, highly polymorphic areas within human DNA, which can point to the most common areas of variation. DNA methylation, particularly at promoter elements, which are sort of very stable and highly conserved between different cellular populations and distinct between malignant and non-malignant hepatocytes. Um, coding variants, so the, the analysis of CT DNA, so can you detect the driver variants within peripheral blood, and then RNA expression, well, that's, that's probably for another day. Um, and using some of these technologies, you can start to put together polygenic risk scores, and these are based on SNPs, particularly SNPs associated with natural removal and its association with, with HCC. And so what you can, you can see is that if you use a combination of 17 NAFLD associated SNPs in a fairly decent number of, um, of, of cases, that you can sort of put the, this, this group into deciles and identify 90% of the cohort who have a very low risk of development of cirrhosis and a very low risk of development of HCC, and you've got around 10% of the cohort which can be based on relatively cheap technology, which could be implemented without too much of us um, uh, within our group. So polygenic risk scores coming along. There are a number of issues with these. Obviously, you have to pick your SNPs based on your ancestry. So obviously, these 17 SNPs are based on white Northern Europeans. Um, there are analyses showing that if you are East Asian, South Asian, you need to use different SNPs. So obviously, we would have to think about how that um, in a fairly diverse population. And then thinking about rather than risk stratification over to tumor biomarkers, I'm not going to discuss any of these things which a, a number of groups that, um, are working on, sort of circulating tumor cells, exosomes, fragmentomics, lipidomics, proteomics, and microRNAs, all of which are being explored. But the one I will flag up is um, DNA methylation, because this is something which is not that far off and shows a lot of promise. So thinking about using CT DNA, so a blood test, pulling out um, uh, naked DNA, which derives from tumors, and then um, uh, performing target sequencing of um, methylated or demethylated regions at a specific tumor-related um, loci, what you can see is that you can achieve sensitivities for the detection of HCC somewhere in the sort of 80s to 90s with rock scores of sort of 0 0.9, 0 0.95. So DNA methylation tests, which are here now, are highly likely to come along. And just to give you a flavor of what that looks like, many of you will have been, have been involved using the Grail test, um, um, which is being rolled out in the, um, in the NHS now. So this is one of a number of um, uh, multi-cancer early detection testing strategies. Um, so th this is a, a patient, this is one of your patients who um, ended up under us. So he, he was a 66 year old male, asymptomatic, he's not under liver follow up, he goes to his GP about something else, get offered um, a, a, a Braille test. He's found to have type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, but he's not known to have any of these. Um, and on, this, the, on the trial, he's got a positive liver signal. So he then has his index scan, and here's his HCC right here. And he comes in and he has a non isomer section and he's tumor free 18 months down the line. So, this stuff is possible, it is deliverable, it's not expensive, and it just requires us all to have literacy 
of the stuff which is coming down the line, which is potentially which perhaps is changing. All right, so HEC increasing, increasing rapidly, the background liver disease changing, it's changing to natural, which is going to have massive implications for what we do. So then it is effective, but it does require robust processes. I don't know how we can make that happen, and I certainly don't, I'm not going to dictate how you should do that in your own um, practice. Um, we can make changes now to improve surveillance. There are new surveillance technologies are coming along, but they will require extensive assessment in the real world. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Question, please. Perfect. How's your catching? You going? <laughs> well, you could probably take it. No, you got to They can't hear a line. <laughs> I'll blame the thrower. Uh, for the hepatic biliary phase uh, MRI, are you still scheduling it every six months for the patient? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So for hemochromatosis patients, without, without cirrhosis, what time they might develop HCC, are you still scheduling them every six months, even if it's been, it's been a six year? Yeah, there's no evidence to do it more frequently than that. No. Obviously, you know, if you tell them... for less frequent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, huh? Well, then you need to speak in that, otherwise people online can't read. Hey! It's a good one. Yes, yeah, so having raised the uh, issue about uh, surveilling individuals who are non-cirrhotic, uh, what are you actually doing at Cambridge for that patient group? Because it wasn't so clear in your final slide the discussion. They, they, and, they, 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 they don't get HCC surveillance. Yeah, but it'd be good to clarify that point because, of course, it could be replicated across the region. The other issue is about the use of biomarkers tree that is coming. Um, but are you also looking at the cost effectiveness for individuals who are non cirrhotic as well? Because that will clearly need to be factored in. One more. Come on, check it. Go on, don't be shy. Go on, there we go. Yes. Yeah. For the F3s, um, we, do, we do plenty of biopsies. Um, granted, more we do more uh, non phase assessment, but we've done plenty of biopsies. We've got um, at least a couple of hundred of F F3s around. We're, we're, we're taking a compromised position, given all the data on um, HCC um, in the F3s. Uh, we are doing annual ultrasound lens, but I know it's a compromise, not evidence-based, but I'm uncomfortable leaving them with, with no monitoring whatsoever. I won't tell you, but I won't tell you how many HCCs we've picked up or missed in that population. Um, zero. Um, but yeah, as I say, I'm touching wood because one will crop up. So is this F3? This is F3. So we're doing we're doing manual. Um, okay, thank you. It's back to Gavin. In the meantime, whilst we're waiting for the, the, the throwing of the microphone, do you think we should be using Galad then? I think Galad shows enormous promise, and you know it's now been validated. You know we've got a UK study, we've got a US study. I think Galad is probably more deliverable because the, the, the L3 AFP doesn't really have an awful lot, so we could. Deploy guard, which is just needs the DCP, the PIC of two. And, and would that replace ultrasound? That would be controversial, and I don't think yeah. I would advocate that. So okay. Because, you know, the, the, all of the international guidelines say we should be doing ultrasound. So yeah. we should be doing it in parallel until such time as people advocate. Okay, that's interesting. Thanks. So, Gavin? Oh, no, sorry. Oh, we've got you. Do you think the fiber scan can delay our own fiber? especially in high risk patients like obesity metabolic syndrome, obesity and diabetes. Because from a rheumatology point of view, for example, they ask for a baseline fiber scan. There is some recommendations from New Zealand before they start them on biology because the evidence shows that if you have fatty liver, you will not be uh, the response will be less likely. So like what we are doing with the alcohol patient, I think those categories are suitable. You, you want to take that one, Mike? Um, 
last response, like Alison. Here we go. Um, I, th I think my view, I mean, I know there's publications on Fiberscan and HCC risk. My view is that Fiberscan is, is risk stratification for staging fibrosis, and then you go from there, and then you can escalate the intensity with which you then survey. And I think that's where the polygenic risk score, for example, comes in. It's not at the initial level. You can use it when you are in type 2 diabetics, particularly if they've got a degree of fibrosis. But I wouldn't use Fiberscan alone as a strategy at the moment. And I, I, I actually I don't think Fiberscan is as accurate as everyone thinks it is. That's my cynicism. Um, let's, should we just have Gavin then we'll go? Oh, uh, have we? Sorry, but Gavin, uh, we have to call it a day. Sorry, Gavin, I'm sure it was a very um, erudite comment uh, question. Uh, we need to be back at 10 past 11, otherwise Bill will slap you on the wrist if you persist to me.
How's the technology right now? Electronic. Can you do that? You do that, don't you? How does the mic work? Mate? Okay. Oh, it just does that. Should we do that? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, that's good. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. You just want to take your seats, ladies and gentlemen, we'll get going with the next session. So we're going to get started shortly. Can just remind everybody that without the help of our sponsors, we wouldn't be running the meeting today. So I'd be grateful if you could try and say hello to them during the breaks. Okay, we'll get going with the next session. Please attend that sign and rest up and is going to introduce this session. Thank you. So today's session next is obviously on portable hypertension. We've got two great speakers. So the first talk is on ascites. Uh, we've got Nalanathan Padmanathan from, uh, uh, from <coughs> Nottingham. Obviously, he is an associate professor there. He was involved in developing the MRI protocol for non-invasive assessment of portable hypertension. And he's just given us a state of the art lecture on the site. So very well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, Thanks, Bill, for the invitation. And um, so the aim of the session is to kind of take you through management of societies. Um, pointer doesn't seem to be working. There we go. So what I'm aiming to cover in the session is kind of a brief overview of um, societies and what that means for patients. Um, a bit of beta blockers, there's always been a controversy about beta blockers. Um, we were talking about when to stop them with patients with ascites. I think now we're talking about when do we start. Um, I'll present some evidence and see if you're convinced. Um, some uncertainties about antibiotics and primary prophylaxis, where we are with tips in ascites. Again, long term argument with the, the, um, with the answer study. And I'll finish up with a couple of slides on palliative care in ascites. What I'm not going to cover is that, because if I'm, you know, that will take probably the whole day to cover the entire management of societies. Um, so the talk's going to be loosely based on the guidance that um, we wrote for BSG a couple of years ago. If you're interested, more than the main guidance, I would point you to the supplement document that was published with this um, in GUT, because as part of the guidance development, we did systematic review on each section. Um, kind of collating all the data and presenting how we came up with the guidance, I mean, or lack of guidance, I should say, um, lack of evidence with the guidance. So I think it's, it's even more interesting looking at the raw data to see where the guidance comes from. Um, and, you know, that's quite interesting. So even from simple things like um, dietary salt restriction, there are very limited data out there. And then guidance is formed and that just gets propagated down. And if you go back and dig down to the data, you can see what those guidance are based on. Right. Um, many of us would have seen this graph, compensated cirrhosis versus decompensated. Once you decompensate, your disease trajectory changes, your median survival drops significantly. This is old data um, from 2006. Um, UK data, this is based on primary care data from um, GP records. Um, similar numbers from, if you move from compensated to decompensated um, 
your mortality is starkly different to when you're in the compensator stage. Um, this data was presented in the Rubino meeting a couple of years ago. Um, this is mainly European cohort. I think there was one center in Argentina included, included in this. There's about 1,700 patients. And once you have societies, so once you have societies, your one year probability of survival is just about 80%, but with development of each complication of society. So if you go on to have paracentesis, your mortality goes down, then when you develop bacterial patchumatis, it goes down further, and then the worst is when you have API and SPT. So in general, once you have society, the number to number is your one year mortality is 20%. And this data was presented in Basel last week. Um, derived from um, hospital episode records. Um, so in the current day, so they, they presented data kind of split of 15, last 15 years split over three era, but this hasn't really changed in that period of time. Um, patients presenting with index admission um, of decompensation, 41% is still due to ascites. Um, in contrast, only 26% is due to varicose bleeding. In the index admission, 17% of patients still die. And within 30 days, another 17% um, 17 died within 30 days of their admission. And if you look out to one year, 37 of those patients will die, basically. Um, so that just shows that how dire the outcome is once patients get admitted with decompensation. Um, if you look at readmission, which um, a lot of our hospital managers are interested in, 24% of the patients who um, are admitted as their first presentation 24% of them get readmitted within 30 days. So it, it's a significant problem. Um, the outcome for these patients are not good, and it really hasn't changed based on this data over the last kind of 10 to 15 years. So can we actually prevent decompensation? So this, um, you might be aware of this paper that was published in Lancet, um, created a lot of um, discussion, controversy, um, can we actually prevent decompensation in patients with cirrhosis? Um, so this group said, potentially. So what they did, they, they had a cohort of patients with compensated cirrhosis. Um, they all had clinically significant portal hypertension. And in this study, it was defined by HVPG. So all of them had invasive portal pressure measurement. And they had to have a minimum pressure of 10 millimeters mercury, which defined clinically significant portal hypertension. Interestingly, they, they excluded patients with medium and large varices because their argument was medium and large varices will go on to have a beta blocker treatment anyway, so they excluded them. So these were patients with cirrhosis, um, no medium to large varices, and had clinically significant portal hypertension. So it's an interesting, slightly odd design. So what they did, um, they ran, randomized patients to either propanolol or placebo. If you, if you get randomized to propanolol, you, you measure their acute response. So they had their catheter in, they got IV propanolol, and they, they defined response as 10% drop in their pressure. So if you drop your pressure by 10%, you're deemed a responder. And if you're a responder, you go on to have propanolol gene. If you're a non-responder, then you got randomized to carvidolol versus placebo. Um, Carvidolol, interestingly, has got an additional alpha-1 blockade compared, um, in addition to the non-selective beta blockade. So it has a greater portal pressure lowering um, effect due to the intrahepatic vasodilatation. So if you're a non-responder to propanolol, then you get randomized to carvidolol um, versus placebo, basically. Um, the doses of those two drugs there, I don't think we ever achieve 160 milligrams twice a day of propanolol when we were using it. Um, Carbidolol is reasonable, still, I mean, I, 25 milligrams is quite poorly tolerated. Um, in our real, in a real world practice, a lot of the times we are having to split the dose of carbidolol so that you tolerate. Um, so the composite primary endpoint in this study was um, decompensation or that. So it's a composite primary endpoint. Um, I've just put up a probably quite small for those at the back. Um, a few interesting points. Just look at etiology. I think Matt spoke about different demographics and how hepatology has changed. Um, so see the proportion of hepatitis C uh, as a cause of um, cirrhosis in this population. Alcohol, only 14%, and NASH, 8%. So I think it's true to say this wouldn't be 
the, the type of patients that we would see if we, we started recruiting for this study at the moment. So that's very different to what we are seeing um, currently. Um, in terms of response, traditionally we thought only two-thirds of patients would be propanol responder, and that's about true. Only 67% had acute response to propanol, so that they went then on to have carbidol. So two-thirds had propanol, one-third had carbidol. Right, so this was the headline result. So this is a couple of curve. There was a separation just between, just kind of after two years, and there was a difference in the primary endpoint. So this was a composite primary endpoint of decompensation and of, uh, sorry, all of that. Um, and it reached statistical significance. Um, kind of looking at different way of dividing the, the cohort, um, interestingly, patients who had small varices seemed to have uh, more pronounced benefit. Those who had, didn't have varices didn't seem to have any benefit. But this is the most interesting table. Um, so, as I said, the primary endpoint was a composite one, decompensation or that. But actually, what was the main dif what was driving the main difference was the development of varices as decompensation. So there was no difference in that. Of course, mortality was the same. Um, other decompensation were all the same. It was the development of societies which was driving the difference in decompensation. So, can we give patients beta blockers to prevent societies formation? Um, at the back of that, um, the same group with some additional authors went back to do uh, individual um, patient level meta analysis. So, these are beta blocker studies um, from from 2019. These were beta blocker studies that studied the use of beta blockers as primary prophylaxis in varices. So they looked at that, they picked out patients who had varices but were not decompensated, and then they looked at that to see whether beta blockers prevented decompensation in those patients. It's a mixed bag because a couple of these studies, um, Diraj study and the study from Pakistan were beta blockers for medium to large varices. Uh, the Shah study is actually beta blockers for small varices, and Villanova study is the Predaski study that we studied. So it's actually not homogeneous. So although it's a meta analysis comparing all of them, the patients in that was not as homogeneous as the Predaski study. Um, and what they showed that there was an effect favoring beta blockers in um, preventing decompensation. Um, again, looking at that in more detail, there was an effect in preventing. Um, ascites, interestingly, didn't prevent bleeding because we thought beta blockers prevented bleeding in varices, but didn't make a difference in bleeding. Um, and it had a mortality effect in this meta analysis, which it didn't. So, in the back of this, uh, the Venus 7 came out quite strongly in recommending um, treating patients with beta blockers uh, to prevent decompensation. So, they said uh, patients with clinically significant portal hypertension, we should consider. Uh, treatment with beta blockers to prevent decompensation. And interestingly, they said we should treat with beta blockers independent of the possibility of measuring HVPG. So that really raised the question on how do we identify clinically significant portal hypertension. We don't routinely measure portal pressure. I don't think any of the centers in the UK does um, portal pressure routinely. Um, so how how do we define this patient, or how do we identify which patients are going to benefit from um, beta blocker treatment? Um, sorry, they, they they largely base um, their recommendation on fiber scan. So they have this rule of five, um, and basically, if you have a fiber scan of more than twenty-five, um, they say assume clinically significant portal hypertension. This applies to all patients except if they've got obese NASH, um, and I don't know how many of us, you know, what proportion of NASH are non-obese, so you can't do that in obese NASH. Um, and so, basically, we are relying on a non-invasive test um, to start beta blockers. So, that's, that was the recommendation from Bovina. Um, I don't think it has been I think it's fair to say it's not been widely accepted in the UK. It's created more questions than answers. Um, I think it would be interesting to get your thoughts during, during the question and answer session. Um, we have published some data on the variability on fibroscan. We had a cohort of patients with stable cirrhosis, 
and they have annual fibro scan as part of a study protocol when they have MRI and fibro scan. And fibro scan actually had a variation of up to 200% in these patients. So these are patients with stable cirrhosis, no decompensation, and when they have repeated fibro scan, the variation in the fibro scan is up to 200%. So personally, I don't think we can rely on a single non-invasive marker if you're going to start a beta blocker treatment in these patients. So, to answer that question, can we prevent ascites with beta blockers possibly? And I think that's probably a paradigm shift in our thinking where previously we thought we were giving patients beta blockers to prevent bleeding after scoping them. Um, it could be that what we have to think about is patients with cirrhosis. We need to identify whether they have got chronically significant portal hypertension and beta blocker treatment might be beneficial in preventing decompensation, not just bleeding. But I think the, the gray box is, is a big question that still remains unanswered. Um, Martin, in the top next, you might say that we need to do EUS guided direct portal pressure measurement. That might be the magic answer, I don't know, but we'll hear from Martin. Um, so this, again, so that's a con a question about when do we start them? Do we have to start beta blockers in these patients when they have refractory ascites? So the controversy started in 2010 when Lebrac, the original group who did a lot of the beta blocker work, published a paper saying actually if patients develop refractory ascites, they might have um, poorer outcome on beta blockers and this kind of window hypothesis was suggested. Um, so once patients reach a point where their cardiac output drops and their renal perfusion drops, keeping them on a beta blocker, we might actually be, be doing more harm than good in these patients. Um, there's been a lot of um, large um, case series and retrospective data now to show that actually patients with refractory societies, it's not a contraindication per se. So just because they have refractory societies and they have large volume paracentesis, beta blockers is not contraindicated in those patients. But there is a point when we might actually need to think about either reducing the dose of beta blockers or stopping them. Um, and this paper is interesting. It actually says blood pressure might be the best predictor. So if they are hypotensive, naturally, I think that's what we do in clinic without you know, thinking um, you know, beta blockers is not going to be good if they are hypotensive. If they come in with API, if they come in with HRS, which is suggestive of poor renal perfusion, then keeping them on propanolol or carbidolol might not be the best idea. So, moving on to antibiotics. So, there's been a long kind of debate, I would say, about what we do with patients with ascites about primary prophylaxis. So, these are patients who have ascites, who've never had their ascites infected before. So, this is primary prophylaxis. Do we start them on prophylactic antibiotics to prevent them developing any infection in the future, and does that have an impact on their mortality? So this is a French study. Um, they use mofloxacin. Mofloxacin is actually not available for us to use in the UK. So we have ciprofloxacin, but we, we can't get hold of mofloxacin. Um, so they gave patients um, with cirrhosis mofloxacin, and it didn't have any effect on their survival compared to placebo. In their subgroup analysis, when they divided the ascites down to low protein versus high protein, there was a, there was a signal towards effect in the low protein, um, in the patient ascites with low protein, where um, no fluxacin re, um, reduced the incidence of that, but no effect in patients with high protein. However, there were two kind of large scale um, postdoc analysis. Both, one was actually a PPI study, and they, had, they looked at the level of protein, and another one was a German study. But in both those studies, there were no association between the level of acidic protein with SBP. So that kind of whether measuring your acidic protein and deciding your primary prophylactic treatment based on that, it's still not clear. Um, so this is the latest noise cirrhosis guideline, which was recently updated. Um, so they, this, they've come out and said, based on those evidence, if they've said, do not routinely offer antibiotics to prevent SBP in these patients, but we can consider treatment if we think they are high risk, i.e. they've got severe liver disease, however you want to define it, either by child Q or male, 
uh, with acidic protein. It would be interesting to hear um, your thoughts in the audience about what your local practices are. I can say, you know, our local practice, we don't routinely offer primary prophylaxis unless in kind of special circumstances. We might get an answer um, because um, Alistair O'Brien, who's leading the study, and we've just finished recruiting actually, so we've recruited over 400 patients, um, randomizing them to um, cotrimoxazole actually as a primary prophylaxis antibiotics in patients with cirrhosis. We didn't measure the acidic protein in this study, so this was just any patients with cirrhosis and SIP. Um, so we finished recruiting during the follow-up period, so hopefully in the next two to three years, we might get an answer whether primary prophylaxis um, with antibiotics in these patients um, is the thing to do. Moving on to tips. So there are seven randomized controlled trials comparing tips to large volume paracentesis in patients with SIPs. I would argue six of them are largely irrelevant because they use bare metal stent, and we don't use bare metal stent anymore. Bare metal stent is associated with higher shunt dysfunction, uh, and there were higher complication uh, rates with it. Only the last randomized controlled trial um, from France used a PTFE covered stent, which is what we use at the moment. So the only relevant um, randomized controlled trial at the moment is the, large, uh, the last one that was done, and this was this was the result of it. So it had 62 patients in it. Um, that was the characteristic, that was exclusion criteria. Um, and it definitely controlled the side is better, and it had an effect on one year mortality. So 93% one year mortality if you had tips, versus 52% if you were having large volume paracentesis. Um, encephalopathy after tips was very similar to incidence of encephalopathy when you're having large volume paracentesis. Only one patient developed stent thrombosis, so very low kind of stent um, complication rate. Um, and interestingly to note, 34% of the patients had quite advanced liver disease. So I think we can definitely say TIPS controls the size is better. The fact of survival in this study is clear, but then if we included all the previous studies and case series, it becomes less clear in terms of the evidence towards survival. The suggestion that tips improves your quality of life, which matters to patients at this stage, but when you dig down, the improvement in your quality of life is largely dependent on your ascites resolving. So if you have tips and your ascites didn't go away, that didn't really have an effect on, on your quality of life. Um, there's been some debate about the size of tips. Um, the, the point being, the larger your tips, the higher chance of you developing encephalopathy after tips. And an 8 millimeter stent was shown to be as effective in terms of symptom control, both for ascites, but also for variceal bleeding. So those are the two indications we use tips at the moment, variceal bleeding and ascites. In these studies, the 8 millimeter stent were as effective in controlling those symptoms. And now, um, there's some studies to show that you could do under dilation, so you, you insert, you kind of control the dilation of the tip, so you don't immediately dilate them to 10 millimeters to drop your pressure. So you can do it in a more controlled fashion, and you reduce the chance of HE and have that better survival benefit. Uh, selecting the right patient for tips is still still a challenge. Um, if you look, and if you're trying to gather that, that data from the RCT, it's very difficult because Patients are selected very carefully to go into a randomized control trial. And then if you're trying to extrapolate that data to your real world practice, um, it becomes quite tricky. I mean, case in point would be the age. A lot of the guidance says be caution if it's an elderly patient. But if you look at the RCT, your mean age of patients in the RCT is between 54 and 57 years old. So we don't have any experience of doing it in an elderly population. We know we are getting more elderly patients with you know, with natural cirrhosis, the trouble with the societies, you know, is it good in them? It is difficult to say. We don't have the data, but essentially we say caution in these topics. So the more severe your liver disease is, caution, you know, how, you know, high bilirubin, high mouth, um, age is really tricky, but actually rather than age, it might be the functional disability that's more relevant. So this, this paper suggested that independent of mouth, your functional disability predicted your post-tips mortality. So rather than 
stage per se, it might be the, the frailty of the patient that's more relevant than selecting the patient for things. I think other other criteria in there might, you know, might be self-evident. Your current encephalopathy, you'd be pushed hard to do a test on patients for SARSIS if they, you know, currently encephalopathic, if they've got active sepsis. Right, is tips cost effective? So this is, um, there was some mention about polys earlier. So I just explained this graph. So the x-axis is essentially cost effectiveness or of quality, basically, the, the quality of years, and the y-axis is cost. And the gradient is the amount of money that you're willing to spend per quality that you want to achieve. So typically, noise has a threshold between 20 to 30,000, so you're willing to spend, to put it simply, you're willing to spend 20,000 pounds to gain one extra quality. And then you form that gradient based on what your threshold is. And if you're below that threshold, your intervention or your treatment is cost effective. So um, if you're on that side, the treatment, you're, you're not gaining that it's safe. You're up there, it's expensive, but you're gaining quality. But if you look at the data for tips in societies, it's actually cost saving. So you're, you're, gaining, um, you're gaining quality of life and it is cheaper. The main cost that's been driven down in this study, and it's, I have to warn you that this is actually modeling, and it is based on the single randomized control trial. So this is not real-world data based on cost effectiveness. This is modeling data based on the one randomized control trial. Um, the main difference in terms of what's driving the cost down is patients attending the repeated paracentesis. So um, they have taken into consideration that some hospitals patients have to be admitted rather than coming to day case. That practice varies across hospitals. Some, some units have quite efficient day case units. So I would take that with a pinch of salt, but I think the signal is tips can be a cost-effective intervention for these patients. Right, albumin. <laughs> is albumin the answer? So the answer study. Um, the Italian hepatology group have been, have been a big proponent of albumin use. So this is not albumin as we use it in hospitals at the moment. So uh, for simplicity, I would say that short-term albumin. So we use albumin when we do large volume paracentesis and we give them albumin replacement. If patients develop SBT, we give them albumin. So those are short-term albumin. Um, if in the case of SBT, you get that in day one and day three. This is long-term albumin infusion. So patients get weekly albumin infusions. They either come in or they come to day case, they get weekly albumin infusions, and this is long-term albumin infusion. And this study um, basically said giving patients with ascites long-term albumin had survival benefit. So these patients, initially for the first two weeks, they had 40 grams twice a week. So in our case, that would be two bottles twice a week. And then they got two bottles once a week going forward. And this, this study went on for about 14 months. So this goes on for a year, so a long time. So these patients kept getting albumin. Um, there was a lot of um, problems with the study design of this study um, in interpreting the survival benefit. If the patients developed refractory ascites and needing more paracentesis, they were censored, as in they came out from the analysis, which meant the patients in the standard medical arm, a lot of them just came out of the study. So, yeah, so, I mean, that, that would be a long discussion in terms of the study design, but that drove the difference when, when the two curves split initially. It was an open-label study, so the patients and the doctors were not blinded to which treatment they had. And the patients that needed albumin came into hospital to get the albumin, but the patients who didn't, didn't come into hospital. So you could argue the patients who came into hospital saw the doctors or saw the nurses more frequently and that inherently created a bias in terms of the two arms. You know, the, the authors argued as challenge in doing a blinded study of this design, but, you know, we have to acknowledge the, the, the problems with the design of the study. Um, there's been a couple of others, other publications looking at the effect of long-term albumin. So the answer study is what we, we showed. That's what they got. They had 431 patients. Um, Duration treatment, 
I think it's 14, it's actually 17 months, um, and they showed that they reduced mortality. The NAC study had patients randomized to albumin plus midodrine, so they had midodrine as well. It was a much shorter duration of treatment, so only 60 days, and it did not have any effect of mortality and complications. These, these, the patients that were in the NAC trial were patients on, trans, on the transplant list, so once they had a transplant, they came out of the study, and therefore there was a shorter period of um, intervention. This was a non-randomized kind of open-label observational study, again from Italy. Um, they got kind of similar to, to the ANSCA protocol, so they got two 20 grams of bottle twice a week, um, again for fairly long time, and there was some signal to reduction in mortality and complication. Based on this study, at the moment, a long-term albumin infusion is standard of care in Italy. They've got an uh, interesting arrangement and the Italian health service, um, the insurance would refund all the albumin infusion. So that's, you know, they've got an economic benefit from that way and that has now become standard of treatment in Italy for patients with um, cirrhosis de la salvi. Um, so just to show the difference between the two, so in the answer study, because they kept on getting albumin every week, there was a clear difference between the serum albumin, whereas in the MAC, because the amount of albumin was low, there was no difference in the serum albumin that was um, after they had the intervention between the two groups. I think it's raised more question than any answers whether albumin is the way to go. Um, who do we target? How much albumin do we give? Um, you might be aware um, the ANSWER study, which was led by Alistair Brown from UCL, which gave albumin to sick patients in the hospital. There was a significant amount of adverse event, mainly lethal edema, in patients who got a lot of albumin. Um, so, you know, what's the dose and how frequently we need to give them? And when do we stop them? Um, you know, is there a point where albumin becomes more hazardous? And I think in our setting, especially in the current climate, cost effectiveness analysis is vital. And cost, you know, is actually an ethical issue. If, if you're going to say this is a standard, standard of care in our patients, we have to prove not just effectiveness, but cost, effective, cost effectiveness in the NHS, whether it's, it's, um, it's worth delivering for, for our patients. Um, a shameless plug, um, many of you might be aware that there are a few NHR, NHR labor partnerships that's recently been funded um, to get groups together to um, come up with important research questions for future funding. Um, we are leading one in Latvium um, called COACH, where looking for interventions for patients with cirrhosis closer to home. We are exploring whether we would be able to deliver albumin in the community for the patients. Because in the UK, if you are getting patients to come into hospital every week, in the current climate, you can imagine, it probably won't be practical. Can we deliver this in the community? How practical that is? It's something that we are exploring. So if you're interested, um, speak to me during the lunch break or drop me an email. Um, we might be planning a study in this area um, that so just look out for, um, for the information. It might be something that we run. And it might help us answer the question, is it worth doing? And if it's worth doing, is it cost effective? And briefly, a couple of slides on palliative care. Um, you might have seen the excitement of Alpha Pump. Essentially, it's a, um, a device that gets fitted in your abdominal cavity where your psyche gets directly drained into your bladder and essentially patients will be out as well. Um, the, the randomized control trial published in JHAP in 2017 showed that there was a reduction in the need of blood volume paracentesis, which was not surprising, but I think the major concern that a lot of us had was in terms of adverse event, um, and this meta-analysis looked, reported kind of pooled estimate of 30% of incidence of AKI in a year, 27% of infection, 20% of UTI. So, I, you know, we, it's not standard of care. Now, as I've said, use it with, you know, in individual cases with kind of appropriate governance in place, case-by-case -case setting. Um, I'm not sure whether it's being used in Cambridge or, or the centers around here. It would be, it'd be interesting to hear your experience if you have. Um, and then long-term abdominal drain, or, or we used to call it flu 
um, Sumiter's group in um, Brighton did the first review study which showed the feasibility of long-term abdominal drain. Um, it showed that it was feasible. There was some signal towards increased evidence of infection. Most of them were self-limiting, but they did give prophylactic antibiotics to all these patients, um, which wasn't our practice when we did long-term drain, so we didn't use to give long-term antibiotics. But in this study, all of them had prophylactic antibiotics. Um, they have gone on to um, get funding and reduce to is live at the moment. So they are aiming to recruit 310 patients um, nationally, um, and hopefully that will tell us whether long-term um, abdominal drains is effective as a palliative care intervention in this population. You know, it, it's got inherent difficulty. You know, palliative care intervention as a clinical trial is difficult to study. Uh, but one interesting thing you would think by keeping patients at home, not coming into hospital, we improve their quality of life. But if you look at the reduced paper, it did show, it did show that patients who had the long-term drain had trend towards worsening quality of life. And the main domain that was driving this was loneliness. So patients may actually prefer coming and seeing our paracetesis nurses in the latency I don't know, but it would be worth seeing, um, worth seeing. Because they, they are measuring quality of life in reduced too. And that's one of the main outcomes. So I think that, that that's an important measure, especially in this palliative care setting. So that was a quick kind of this is stop tour of controversies, I would say, in, in societies. I've not given you answers. I've presented you some data for you to think about. Um, you know, once our patients develop societies, it, it indicates a significant landmark in their disease trajectory. I would argue we don't have anything that changes the, the, just, the disease trajectory at the moment. At the moment, all our intervention essentially is looking after them, palliative care. Um, beta blocker, maybe to prevent albumin, maybe to change it, but the current data I don't think is enough for us to use it as standard of care at the moment. And I think we underestimate the, the role of palliative care in these patients. Um, they do have a large symptom burden, and I think a lot more work has to be done in terms of helping these patients. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to do questions at the end, if that's all right. I thought we might say to speak to them, if that's all right. So, so our next speaker, as you might have been right, is uh, Martin James from Ruskin. As you know, many of you are the leading expert in the UK on interventional endoscopy, particularly around the RCT in the US. He's the co-director of the Masterclass course at Nottingham and is the current HBB lead there for the national roles in the national development of training for training we are undertaking at USDM soon. It's a pleasure to invite him to give us a state-of-the-art talk on novel roles of the US. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, thanks to Bill for the invitation again, and thanks to now for letting me cover him. So we're bound together. The first day as a consultant back in September of 2008 was when Mao had his first day as an SHO, so he's made me feel really old now. Yeah. That's one, that's one, okay, that makes me feel older. Okay, so no, thanks uh, for letting me talk to you now. So um, I'm just going to try and put some different views out there about what the future might hold in terms of how we assess our patients with liver disease and how the interaction may come across those Venn diagrams of endoscopy and hepatology, which traditionally I think have been quite separate in the UK, apart from in one or two areas. So um, I work with um, Nav and many other people in the room. We've got some of our nurse specialists here, Maria, we've got Karen and we've got Mel, who, who support our service with Cambridge, which has been really productive over the last 10, 15 years in terms of getting patients through the transplant and into the HCC um, service. So for today, I'm going to cover what the US may offer in terms of assessing the liver in terms of biopsy, how it may benefit patients who present with gastrocytosis, it can be difficult to treat, uh, why bother measuring portal pressure? We've heard from that, but it's not widely used, and what is its utility in some of the topics that have already been discussed this morning? And how do we do, and is there any future in EUS guided portal pressure measurements, and what do the readings mean, and how do we apply, how do we apply those? There's a real sort of diverse approach. You could often think it's only two different directions in terms of assess assessment of patients with liver disease. They shift towards non invasive tests, either with blood biomarkers, or with fibro scan, or even MR and elastography, which Nav and Rob have done some work on in Nottingham. Um, and I think there's probably a different solution for different settings, whether you're doing your case finding, whether you're doing um, primary care, um, assessment of the prevalence of disease, or whether you're trying to make individual decisions about patients. 
in terms of their future risk of decompensation, whether they're going for surgery, what the risk of the decompensation will be after reception, for example. So we've got to pick the right tool for the right setting. Matt's already talked about this, so I'm not going to focus too much on the top end here, but just to say that the, the biggest group that's growing, and Matt's talked about this as well, was, in, was obese NASH, not the problem with non-obese NASH. And when we're assuming um, to compensate an advanced chronic liver disease with a fibrous one over 15, we know in the setting of NASH, the positive predicted value for that is between 60 and 65%. So between 35 and 40% of patients with NASH and a fibrous scan over 15 will be wrongly classified for having compensated advanced chronic liver disease. So these, this is an oversimplification in my view and can be useful in terms of case finding maybe population um, studies in, in primary care to try and find cases that are at risk of liver fibrosis. But there needs to be more work up before we commit patients to either surveillance programs or treatment. Um, so what is endohepatology? Well, I think this, this is a term that's come around in the last couple of years, really, the last five or six years, really thinking about the interaction between a hepatologist and what endoscopy may have to offer in this sphere. And it's broadly in two areas. One is around the ERCP and liver conditions, which you may really think about with PSC, was a case earlier described. Uh, where ERCP and spyglass was done to assess indeterminate biliary strictures, treat stones. But the focus of this talk is more around not the biliary components, but around the parenchymal or vascular components of liver disease in endohepatology. So what, what promise does it offer? What are the opportunities? Well, obviously, when we do EUS, we can look at the liver surface. We can take liver biopsies. We can think about uh, biopsy or glue treatment, particularly in gastric biopsies. We can look at the portal circulation. We can assess the portal vein. We can measure pressures. There's a potential to take samples either for circulating cancer um, targets, looking for bacterial antigens that may predict the risk of either cancer development or SVP. I mean, SVP, as now said, is a hallmark in deterioration in patients with liver disease. There's some work around shear wave elastography, which we're doing a small study in Nottingham to see how that relates to previous transient elastography and biopsy. And also the prospect, certainly in Yorkshire pigs at the moment, of intra, um, intra, uh, intra um, equivalent tips, so portal systemic anastomosis stents, and we wonder whether that may be on the horizon a long way down the line. I think interventional radiology is becoming a really challenging specialty. Um, we have seven, we've gone down to three, one's been to Cambridge, a little bit bitter about that, um, but we've got three or four um, locums at the moment, so supporting interventional radiology service, we're often vascular radiologists looking after trauma, postpartum hemorrhage, and all the biliary intervention. We've got to think about how we can take control of some of these issues into our own hands. So what is the traditional overlap between hepatology and endoscopy? Well, you'd be familiar with this. This is the way I think about liver disease. And this is probably the greatest unmet need. It's not about how we screen for cancer or how we treat ascites or how we do endoscopy. It's about how we can get the message across to help with public health measures, advertising, primary prevention that can prevent a lot of the things that we get to at a late stage. But you'll be aware of how you think about your liver patients working down here, assessing synthetic scores in etiology, how do we get drugs to them, how we think about cancer treatment, transplantation, and Max already mentioned palliative care or support, which is a really important component when there are curative options for our patients. In terms of endoscopy, it's pretty much virus and surveillance, and, and we know the Baveno rules have reduced the patients that we may need to screen with a combination of platelets and fiber scan, and then acute biosial treatment. What does endohepatology offer? Well, we can assess Patients have got abnormal liver tests to see if there's a biliary cause. Have they got stone obstruction? Have they got abnormal um, um, biliary anatomy? And if they haven't, we can think about taking liver biopsy to confirm their underlying cause. We can do elastography and pressures we talked about. Think about preventing future bifters. Lesions within the, within the reach of the EUS scope, there's no reason why they can't consider ablation or ablative therapies like there are some early trials in pancreatic cysts or pancreatic neuronal tumors. If you can access the hepatic artery or focal vein, why can't we think of that drug or stem cell delivery in the future? We know some patients need augmentation of their residual liver volume with preoperative portal vein embolization. If we can access the portal vein with the US, there's no reason why in the future we can't consider that this is a safe thing to consider. And obviously, list, uh, liver cyst therapy or abscess drainage for potentials. So we'll start with probably the first, um, I guess, uh, entry point into um, endohepatology, which is EUS liver biopsy. And it's just worth remembering what the society say about the adequacy of liver biopsy and how we need to compare that with what we get at the US. So Arzal talked about the different modalities, percutaneous ultrasound, transvenous or surgical. And it's worth noting that a significant proportion of the patients that you biopsy, wherever you biopsy them, um, in the country I mean, through the skin, 
patients are going to get pain um, in a fair proportion of patients. I've probably done several hundred liver biopsies. I would say 50 to 70 percent of patients get pain. Probably 30 percent get significant pain. You get the old patient who has bile leak and is neither hitting the ceiling. It's not a pleasant experience for the patient often. In terms of adequacy, they want more than 11 complete portal tracks and a size 20 to 25, and DSG is broadly similar. So just keep those numbers in your mind when we start looking at some of the biopsies. 11 complete portal tracks and over 20 millimeters. Um, so this is a case that referred through from, I think she might be Mike or Shree from Lincolnshire, referred a patient through abnormal chemistry pain and a previous cholecystectomy. MR was pretty unremarkable. Um, so there weren't clear signs of stone. They had a uh, nuclear medicine study that didn't show any um, biliary excretion dysfunction, so went on to have a linear EUS. And here you can see views of the portal vein and the portal confluence of the pancreatic just, just crossing. You get a brief view of the uh, bile duct on this uh, station, but here's the bile duct, the pancreatic duct, with the portal vein below, D1 view. And the, and the bile duct's normal caliber here. So the, the bile duct was tracked down from the hyaline to the ampulla down to the head of the pancreas, so there were no biliary changes. This is the bile duct seen from the D2 view of the uh, EUS, and again, right down to the papilla, no signs of stones. If there had been, we'd have proceeded to the RCT at this setting. Now you can see ligamentum teres is broad band up to the portal vein radicals, and we can just make a safe area where an FNA 19 gauge needle can enter the liver, and then we just take, uh, put some wet heparin wet suction on into segment two, just above the left hepatic vein and take two or three forward accentuations to get um, liver tissue to help with a one-stop diagnostic procedure for patients who presented with uncertain etiology of their chemistry tests. So here's the biopsy. Uh, here's the uh, histology samples, 48 millimeters, 32 complete portal tracks, uh, and the diagnosis was massive with stage two fibrosis rather than the biliary cause. So you get a flavor for the sorts of view. I don't know what it feels like it is a US practice, but the first 10 years of doing EUS even as a hepatologist, we were just flying past the liver and going to the pancreas and some of the um, HPV and skipping. It's only in recent years that we've had to sort of relearn the liver anatomy to understand what the hell we're looking at, um, even as hepatologists. Bill, would you concur? Yeah, okay. So this is some data that Adina and PT presented last week at Basel, comparing just six months data around 50 cases of EUS biopsy, 50 cases of percutaneous, and I think there was 15 or 20 uh, and transjugular um, liver biopsy. Did I tell you that one of ours is left to Cambridge? I think so. That's why there are fewer, that's why there are fewer transjugular. Not 13 ever talked with it, it's okay. So you, what you can see here is in terms of number of portal tracks, EUS was no worse and significantly higher than transjugular with around 22 complete portal tracks on average. The cumulative length was over 40 millimeters and the length of stay was less, less compared to day case. And, I, and the um, pain outcomes weren't reported in this paper. But anecdotally, I can tell you that probably less than 5% of patients who have the US liver biopsy get um, any pain and significant pain around 1%. So, liver biopsy, let's think about US for gastric biopsies. Um, it's a tricky group of patients. It accounts for around 15% of patients presenting with GI hemorrhage. And we know the survival after RCA bleed is between, uh, mortality probably between 15 to 20%. And often it can be very difficult. It's a thing that all the registrars and most of the consultants are worried about dealing with out of hours. And I know that there's, um, it's quite infrequent that you have to manage those patients out of hours with a nurse overnight, maybe on your own with a registrar. So having your treatment options and second um, treatment options are quite helpful. So this was a patient, uh, I think this is Dominic's in the audience, this is one of Dominic's patients who um, we'll just talk through and see what happened. So he had uh, gastric virus in bleed. So he presented with a segment 58 HCC. Um, had MR with tumor invasion just above a branch of the portal vein and was run through the MDT, but before treatment had an endoscopy to show some gave and a fungal bag. Now Dominic's pretty sporty, he wanted to just do the pillow sign, he wasn't trying to biopsy it, uh, just to check that this was a barrack uh, so we knew what was going on. He went on to have a taste to treat the HCC and you can see there was a branch portal vein um, occlusion on this patient. You can see you can see fungal varices and about six weeks later presented with Upper GI bleeding with poor endoscopic views for endoscopic therapy with a big clot on the top of the stomach that was just sat right over where the varices were. So you can see a cirrhotic edge of the liver. We trace the splenic artery back towards the splenic hilum where you can see uh, a really large group of um, splenic varices over a centimeter in size, right next to the spleen, and there's an adjacent blood clot. When you just look at the amount of buffer on these vessels, it will be difficult to get therapy. Here's a clot that's just you saw endoscopically. 
open and right next to splenic hilum. So still bleeding, same tracking is taken out, 19 gauge FNA needle, like you're doing an FNA sample of a lesion, but into the uh, barracks with some histoacryl glue. And there's emerging evidence that using micronester coils as a scaffold for the glue can help with preventing re bleed in these patients. So, and they low puncture of the vessel, injection of the glue to try and reduce the Doppler flow subsequently on this patient uh, who was treated on the ICU and was already intubated. And then when you look at the Doppler flow, it's much quieter than it was before. Um, bleeding spot, patient had follow up endoscopy and was stable during that admission. So, just another option for treatment for these patients that may be difficult either initially or subsequently. It'd be interesting to see with some more formal assessment and data whether the, whether the coils are safe for long term. When you can see your patients for gastric blue injection, the, the embolization rate is somewhere between 2 to 4 percent. I think that should be included under consent forms, even if you're doing it in standard endoscopy. Look out for hypoxia afterwards and just be aware that's something that can happen. And if you get CT, it can be seen on the, on the, in the pulmonary arteries. So what about coming to portal hypertension? How, how have we got here? It's worth just um, making a note of where, where we got to where we are with the tools that we use or don't use. And I think when you're doing an endoscopy talk, the rules really are you've got to show a couple of videos so we can take that off assignment. Okay. The next thing you've got to do is you've got to mention um, Sheila Sherlock in a liver talk. So it goes overlaps, we just have to cover that one as well. So Dame Sheila Sherlock, who you'll, you'll be aware, is the coroner of the British Hematology. I met James Dooley the other day at Basel with, with Bill, so I feel like I'm just walking amongst these giants. Uh, Bill, not so much, but James Dooley, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, but she said that splenic puncture was a really convenient way to measure portal hypertension. I don't know how sort of convenient the patients may have felt for that, but there's other, the other options were umbilical vein catheterization, and we know that the umbilical vein runs through the round ligament that becomes the ligamentum teres that hits the left portal vein, will then go along the ligamentum venosus to the IVC. So you can get in the umbilical vein if it's still open, and often re canalizing patients for portal hypertension. Uh, you can measure intraoperative portal pressures. You can think about transhepatic percutaneous portal vein pressure. And some of the IR work that we have to do sometimes goes transhepatic straight into the portal vein rather than giving uh, good IJ access from the IR team. And in terms of hepatic venous pressure gradient, first done in animals in the 70s, and then Sarin published his seminal work in, in humans in 1987. So this is now coming on 40 years ago since the technology for. Um, HVPP was tested and used in humans. But Grossman, who was involved in this uh, animal study, said, look, if you're going to measure the pressure, it's worth doing right. And I think it's worth just bearing that in mind when we talk about a new potential modality for measuring the portal pressure with EUS. So just to remind you, and I know this will be familiar to many of you, what are we actually looking at when we measure the HVPG? Uh, the hepatic venous pressure gradient, standard measurement through the internal jugular vein, down through the right atrium into the superior vena cava, into the hepatic veins, and then later you get a balloon catheter into a small branch of the middle or right hepatic vein. So you get a wedge pressure here, and I'll show you a diagram that makes it easy to understand what's actually being measured in a minute. And then you just have the catheter or balloon catheter floating free within the hepatic vein, which is close to the IVC and heart, so often reflects cardiac back pressure. And it's that gradient. And why is that important? Because there's various different thresholds we use clinically either to risk classify our patients or assess their response to treatment or risk during, during treatment. So five or less is normal, but can be present in patients with non-serotic portal hypertension, which we'll talk about a bit later. But portal hypertension is over five, but clinically significant portal hypertension that's predictive of decompensation is over ten. So you'll hear this term, and I've mentioned clinically significant portal hypertension. And then as your pressure increases further, it predicts your risk of either bleeding, re-bleeding, phase controlled bleeding or mortality. So the higher the pressure, it's a bad thing. So you would say if this is being looked at in studies and a fairly good gradient, why aren't we using it more? And it's because it's difficult to access, it's in specialized centers, and, and we want to think about how reliable the readings are. So when we come to actually what are we measuring, for me this was the most helpful reading I did in the last couple of years about this by Duffy and Sandy Bosch last year in 2022. So if we start at the heart in the right atrium, that's connected through the uh, IVC, the hepatic vein, and this here represents the liver bed with the sinusoids represented here, and the portal vein obviously feeds in. And just to make it really basic, blood is going to perfuse the liver, and this is the perfusion pressure, is the pressure here minus the pressure here, so that blood is traveling in this direction. Just thinking about cirrhosis to start with, when you've got cirrhosis, within the sinusoidal bed, these relief channels or exit gates for blood dissipation, because there's 
there's fibrosis, those are, are effectively closed off. So you, in, in theory, you've got this sort of manometer or single pipe channel from the hepatic vein through the portal vein. So if you wedge here, the wedge is a, is a, is a summation of this pressure plus some estimates of portal pressure. So making subtraction for hepatic um, venous pressure gradient to give you an estimate of portal pressure but isn't a direct uh, pressure of bleeding. And there's some problems with that is that if you're not cirrhotic, there's some escape valves. And if you've got um, a thrombosis, it can be difficult to get accurate readings. And you're not measuring a direct uh, measure of portal pressure. With EUS portal pressure, you can access both veins directly, both the hepatic branch of the hepatic vein and the branch of the portal vein. So you, you circumnavigate this, this issue about whether there's cirrhosis or not. And in cirrhosis, you can, sorry, in the absence of cirrhosis, you can see these sinusoidal channels are open. You can get relief of blood pressure here that can then underestimate your portal pressure measurements. The other things that can impact on this is, is NASH, you know, it's less reliable, I'll show you some data in a, mi in a minute. And also if you've got vascular malformations here where there's escape of blood that's measured through wedge alone. So what are the principles and drawbacks? Well, the principles is that the, in, in certain etiologies, alcohol and FC principally, the wedge hepatic venous pressure has got a very good correlate with portal venous pressure. Uh, but there's, there's poor correlation with non serotic clot hypertension, early PVC, in NASH uh, and in those venous malformations. And we know that in some studies of NASH, um, the HVPG was lower than each fibrosis stage. So there were, there were decompensation events in people with NASH as portal pressure was between five and 10 when that wouldn't be expected until it was over 10. So maybe the measurement of HVPG in NASH is an underestimate of true, true portal pressure. And HVPG is an attractive marker for a surrogate marker studies but Grossman, who I talked about earlier, said from their multi-center trials, 30% of the readings they received were inaccurate or, or um, uninterpretable. So just thinking about the, the different etiologies and how reliable wedge pressure is as a, as a measurement of direct portal pressure, this is the control group. Look at this first. Very good correlation, 0.92, between the wedge pressure and the portal pressure. But that is poor in those patients with NASH. And this variation can be appreciated more clearly in this Van Altman plot where the bigger the red arrows, the bigger the distribution and variance between those two measurements. So the reliability in NASH is nowhere near as good as in alcohol or hepatitis C um, etiologies. And it's, and it's actually mostly an underestimation in NASH patients. So when you're doing HVPG and relying on it, it's accurate in around 37%, and it's an underestimate in the majority of those patients and studies that have been doing. So just thinking about one other aspect of how we might apply measurement of portal pressure and how we use it, or how we may use it, um, I don't know many hepatologists who are taking pulses in the clinic to judge their blood level doses, um, if we're really honest. And Rav's talked about response to IV propanolol. And this is, this is, this is two, two, two data, really, looking at both propanolol and propanolol. We found propanolol to start with. So acute assessment overall was about 60% acute response and, and chronically around the same 16, it's slightly less for the propanol group, both acutely and chronically. So if you're going to be using beta blockers, if you're going to be deb debating about the mortality advantages, the, the risks, wouldn't it make sense to know if your patient's actually responding to those drugs in the first place? And this is one modality that could offer that promise or potential if it's um, well validated. Um, Matt's also talked about the number of patients that are accessing curative therapy, and I think Broadly, my feeling is that we under resect patients for HCC and often uh, are keen to go for either ablative or uh, systemic or TAFE therapies when we may be able to push further because the data around HDPG guidance in terms of surgical resection I don't think is perfect. And just to plug, I know Matt's plugged already, but Rob uh, Scott's in the audience is also got an NIHR um, uh, grant towards looking at determining surgical risk in cirrhotic patients, and this may be. Of, of promise in terms of assessing those patients. If you just look at this study for a minute, this compared patients who were undergoing segmental resection of HCC, POD stands for post-operative day. This group is those with through, through HVPG, not the USPPG, had a preoperative HVPG less than 10 or greater than 10. And you can see both groups have a kick up in their meld or synthetic dysfunction from post-operative day one through to day seven. But at three months, that returned to baseline and there's no mortality in either of these groups. So you could argue that actually in highly selected patients with an HVPG that is over 10, look at their other risk factors, functional uh, capabilities, comorbidities, size of the tumour, and have a think about how we might strive more for curative resection in these patients.
So I guess all of that, the imperfections of um, HVPG and where we sit with it, may, may make us think of the gold standard as well as silver. And this is obviously Spanish, because that's a big deal. My potential groups is Gomez, who only got silver in London 2012, 2020. This is Sugamato, who is a judo with some risk factors for Nash. So both of these groups may be unhappy uh, from the Spanish and from the Nash group. And it's just worth reflecting on why people are so unhappy with silver medals. Um, and when you look at this, there's some deep roots that's probably the takeaway message from today, which is that people with a bronze medal are happier than those with a silver medal because the counterfactual reality for bronze medal winners was that they weren't going to get on the podium and not win anything. Whereas if you get a silver medal, you're so disappointed that you missed out on the gold medal. Anyway, we digress. So how do we measure? How do we measure portal pressure? Um, and what is it all about? So um, this has been released from Cook Medical. This was initially a manometer that was used so you didn't inject stem cells under too high pressure during stem cell transplantation, but it's been used now as basically attached through non-compressible tubing to essentially sensitize the HFNA. And it's been around in animal studies and some human studies from a group in California with Ken Chang and Jason Samarasena who published some animal safety data and then some human data. But the main correlate is with clinical features of cirrhosis rather than true validation compared to the current gold standard, which is HVPG. So there's still some caveats around it and we need to see proper validation studies, I think, before we know exactly where we are with this and um, with these technologies. And I said to you before, you've got to just come back and learn your EUS assessment of the liver structure. This is the Quino classification that you'd be familiar with of your different liver segments divided by the hepatic vein and portal veins. And mostly segment 2, 3, 4, 4A and 4B are visible from the proximal stomach. And you can see some of 5 and 6 and down from the second half of duodenum. And it's just getting familiar with your EUS anatomy of the liver so that you make sure you're punching the right thing. Um, and this is just another picture where you can see the white edge of the portal vein branch, which is the umbilical portion coming from ligamentum teres, and the ligamentum venosus goes from the umbilical portion of the portal vein up to the I IVC ostium. This is the middle hepatic vein, which separates segment 2 from segment 8, segment 2 and 4A from 8, and this is above ligamentum venosus with the chordate lobe. So these are all, all visible. I think validation is a really important point because what we want to know is how does the EUS PPG pressure relate to our current familiar um, feeling of HVPG? How does the EUS relate to HVPG? And there's some work done in Leuven, Rotterdam, and this is Leuven Town Hall, where you go through training, Bill, if you're interested, it's very nice up in December. Um, you go through training at EUS PPG. So Leuven, Rotterdam, and Barcelona are doing a validation study where they're taking patients coming for tips. And they're doing HVPG before their tips. They're doing the EUS PPG at the same time, putting the tips in, and then doing a transjugular direct portal pressure measurement. And they've recruited, I think, 35 or 45 patients. So those data will be published soon, so we know the validation data better. In the meantime, how might it be useful? We've talked about the unreliability in NASH patients, and there are one or two other areas that we can consider. This was a patient who came through HIV, and the liver clinic that I've been um, involved in, and so is Rob. Uh, they were very worried that they had advanced fibrosis because of the fibrous scan, had a shear wave, uh, had a biopsy from segment two again. We've seen this already where tissue is taken to try and um, stratify their uh, risk of advanced fibrosis. Again, 55 millimeters, 28 portal packs. Uh, pathologist fairly happy with the sample. Um, no skeletal muscle, but you do get some gastric mucosa instead of skeletal muscle. And this patient had mild NAP or low risk fibrosis. He was actually a patient who was quite lean, was worried about having a mentectomy if he had advanced fibrosis. Couldn't access um, transjugular uh, biopsy at that time. So we're in the middle part of the vein. You can see the bubbles coming when you inject to confirm where you are. And then we go to the portal vein to get pressure readings. And this is entering the uh, portal vein branch with a 25 gauge needle and connected to the mon monometer. So the left uh, portal vein pressure is 6. And overall, when we calculated his portal systemic gradient with EUS, it was obviously normal. So low risk medical, it may inform some of the drug choices, lifestyle measures, and have the subsequent follow-up. So what about current trials? I've mentioned the encounter study, which is comparing those different devices of measuring pressure pre and post tips. Um, there's also some studies in Canada, uh, in California, about in the TOs group, big intervention group in, in Hong Kong, looking at EUS PPG patients with bio-hepatitis, looking at adverse outcomes and technical success. 
This is a sort of summary of the um, experience of the authors I mentioned earlier, six years of endohepatology. They took a group of patients who uh, were predominantly, again, viral hepatitis and MASH patients, 50% male, about 60 years old, and they, and they had suspected liver disease, had some exclusions. Uh, they managed to get EOSPPG readings in all of the protected patients. Uh, they tried to make correlates between the pressure that they found and clinical features, but not compared back to HPPG. That wasn't taken at the same time. And there's no data on the distribution of those measurements, taking three measurements of each vessel at each time, um, or um, compared to the HPPG which you mentioned. But when they looked at the patients with with or without cirrhosis, pharisees, or platelets, they could see that there was a significant difference in the, in the pressures in those with clinical or radiological features of cirrhosis compared to without, with or without pharisees, with or without a platelet count less than 150. So I guess a surrogate of a surrogate, we need some more data now to place back to, I guess, clinical outcomes and HPPG. In terms of histology, uh, probably similar to the work that Adina presented last week, uh, mostly left lobe biopsy. Uh, we use a 19 gauge FMD needle. Uh, we got 97 to 98, they got 98 adequate histological diagnosis. It is a smaller needle than you get for percutaneous, so it's good for biopsy. It may have some challenges when it comes to the full fibrosis staging. Uh, and no immediate or delay complications, although it's a short follow up in these patients. So I'm going to ask if Simon's still awake in the AV room. He's probably still up. Um, this was, so Ari, I think, is in the audience who's working with you now. And I'm just going to give a nice presentation on how to snap the history bit, which we'll go too quickly if Simon doesn't pause. So we'll play, and this is the patient, to try and establish whether the patient had uh, portal hypertension. So if you pause now, Simon, just for a second. This was a 55-year-old man. This was actually Ari's own work. She, she was, this was Thursday night, Friday morning, before the Friday morning journal at 2 a.m up writing this. Uh, presented in 2009, febrile illness, treated for E. coli sepsis, and then was found to have a low white count, a low platelet count, big spleen, but a normal looking liver, had marrow biopsies that were inconclusive with some reactive features, and thought to be an autoimmune neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, but no indication for urgent treatment at that time. And then had progressive splenic enlargement through 2021. Thanks, Simon. We play, play again now. And we'll just catch up. So this is a scan, extrahepatic portal vein, no thrombosis, liver smooth, big spleen, and these are his cell counts, hemoglobin, platelet count, white count, and neutrophil. Bilirubin is okay, albumin's starting to sag a little bit. Um, had a transjugular pressures where the right heart vein is 5 millimeters of mercury, you can see a contrast here, and the wedge pressure was 11, giving a, a corrected pressure of 6 in this patient, despite that big spleen and went on to have transjugular biopsy at the same sitting with a, a true cut biopsy. You see these scratchy little samples they give you. And biopsy shows uh, minimal portal inflammation, not a lot of changes, not a lot of fibrosis. Then it develops a cytings and up with a high SARS. So we're trying to work out, is there a cancer going on, negative PET scan? Could he have clinical significant portal hypertension? Would tips be beneficial? So again, through the same Set up, had it, it, EUS port pressures, had some platelet augmentation, I think, with TK agonist before, and here we're into a uh, middle hepatic vein again, injecting some uh, bubbles to confirm we're in the right place, and the hepatic vein pressure uh, was taken, we took the uh, portal vein pressure. Again, um, you'll see the sort of more fish mouth appearance of the portal vein that's the target for entry with this uh, procedure, and here's the 25 gauge going into the left or umbilical portion with a very high so we, we know that the trans drug underestimated, in this case, it was 27 using EUS PPG. It was a patient who then, we just, the numbers were so high, we just entered the portal vein at a slightly different place, close to the hilum, and got exactly the same pressure from the hilum portion of the portal vein. So he was diagnosed with CVID, with non serotic portal hypertension, and clinically significant portal hypertension. Went on, went, on, went on to have tips with good control of the ascites and an increase in the platelet count. So I'm nearly done. Um, just a couple of things to summarize. Um, what are the potential applications and what are the limitations? Um, I think the benefits, there's, there's obviously huge promise in this whole area of where endoscopy and hepatology may overlap both in the biliary component and in the parenchymal component. Um, it does give us a direct measure of the thing that we're interested in. We don't have to rely on wedges or surrogates. We can actually get into the portal vein. And as well as measuring that, we can sample blood, look for other biomarkers that may be important. This isn't in primary care. This is for selected patients that we need more granularity on their liver disease or responsive treatment. 
It could be within your team or your access, depending where you work and how you build your services, rather than relying on interventional radiology. You can see at the time of endoscopy, you can assess for varices, you can assess shear wave measurements for liver pressure, you can sample portal vein, you can take pressure measurements. So really, it's a multimodal liver assessment, and it may help you to risk stratify monitor your response to drugs and be a surrogate endpoint for trials. Uh, and it may be more reliable in certain etiologies, which I've touched on. What are the challenges? Well, obviously, the validation, I think, is the big question still at the moment, which we're waiting for some data for. Obviously, access to EUS, uh, what are the normal values and coefficient variation in different etiologies? It does challenge the familiar gold standard, but I would argue that's not really being used that widely at the moment because of access in different centers and the challenges on interventional radiology. Um, and then there's this, depends where you work and whether there's a divide between endoscopy and hepatology. And if you're not allied with people who are doing both, how keen your endoscopies are to chase this technology or, or service for you. Obviously, training and standardization are challenges, and, and there's a cost implication for the kit training and service. So my reflections um, overall are risk stratification of liver disease is multimodal. You need to try to choose the right tool for the right setting. Uh, the applications of EUS and liver disease, I think, are expanding and will continue to expand. And I think the current gold standard does have some limitations that we probably will accept. And EUS PPG is feasible and may offer some advantages. And just to finish, I know 13 is an unlucky number for some people, but it's not for us in Nottingham. This was Monday night, where many of the familiar faces of work we do in Cambridge were present, had a lovely meal. Steve has to sit down these days. Um, but we've got Guru, and we've got Amadeep Kanna, Pete Eddowes, Emily Wilkes, Hassan, Steve, Dominic, Neil Guhar, myself, with Nav, who's just talked to you, PT, who's doing a lot of the work on validation of um, endohepatology, Becky Harris, who's mainly interested in community, Diamark, as well as being an excellent hospital hepatologist, and Rob, we talked about it earlier. And together with that, we talked about our nurses who are with us today, but finally, I'd just like to thank Maggie and Nichols, who's online and retiring this September. First met her in 99 in a Lincoln Clinic, helped with a trend hep C cohort with Will Irving. It's a real legend, and I know many of the nurses have learned from her, and I will really miss her when she goes, so thank you. Oh! It was light, wasn't it? It was Dominic's phone, actually, so I had to get a new phone. Now, Martin, come up. What's your view about using plasma and SSPP prophylaxis? I hear your practice is not to do so routinely, and there's, but there's evidence that it does, it's a, it's a met, on a meta-analysis, it's statistically reduced the risk of SPP. Um, there's no evidence of mortality benefit with ipsitinib uh, in, in any prophylactic indication at the moment. Um, but certainly with people we have along the fact that I'm stopping the cyclopoxin you should use should be normally functional. Um, thanks, Mike. I think the text me, um, I was speaking to Alistair about this because obviously for aseptics we chose um, Bactrin rather than me. I think there were some practical difficulties because patients, a lot of these patients will be already on me for their HEE indication um, and then if you're then going to randomize what happens to that. Um, there, there is evidence, as you said, to suggest that it prevents um, occurrence of SVP, um, but not in kind of randomized controlled trials. But if I'll be interested to see whether Saptrin works, and then if, if, if so. Um, but it's difficult to say you know, why those patients are on the vaccine in the first place, HE versus SIV, and there's an overlap. 
Um, so yeah, so I, it's difficult to kind of tease out in the current data in my opinion. But uh, locally, we, we don't give, we don't use protections on the fact that we go from the population so also SDG. Thank you. Any role for the EOS in the rectal parisian bleed, especially the recurrent bleeding, like coiling, to apply a treatment for rectal paresis? Uh, rectal paresis. Rectal paresis. I mean, all, all of these areas are fairly niche in patients that are just being developed using coils that are sort of the micrometric coils that we typically use in interventional radiology. So a case series in all of these things, I think it's, there's a learning curve with, with loading and delivering coils, um, which can be challenging, and misdeployment can be challenging. So I think any of these technologies need to be introduced thoughtfully and carefully um, under, under appropriate supervision and appropriate experience. And in my practice, I've used EUS gluing um, we've got some training on the US micrometric coil. I haven't actually placed that yet, but I know in Birmingham we have the grin on from the radiologist. And I think the evidence on those case series suggests that you have less re-bleeding and better obliteration with fewer embolic events. But again, they're not randomized studies, and that's gastric. There's much fewer data and case series in rectal nephropathy, but, but it was a potential application. In relation to the alpha pump. It's now last. We did get a hold of a couple of devices. One didn't do very well because of the GA, and the other one had a few complications. It wasn't an overall success. You're underplaying that. Um, the, um, just a, probably a naive question, Martin. Is there any benefit in just taking important pressure measurements? We don't know. Because it's early experience, and it's just, you would say, if we're just involved, if we're just interested in portal pain, why not take it? The counter argument to get the classic pain is just to make sure you've excluded cardiac causes or contributions to any depression. So I guess that would be the argument for why you might take it. Yeah, got it. Thank can, you. Can I just add a little comment and a question to Martin? I think we got into that idea about a difference because of our familiarity with tissue TV, because we were looking at the subtraction. I think as the uh, EUS community in, in the UK, what we should aim for is if we could adopt it, we should be interested in clinical outcome, not HVPV, because HVPV is at best a surrogate for clinical outcome based on the NJM paper from those predicted decompensation predicted outcome. And I don't think we should develop a surrogate of a surrogate. So if we could adopt it, I think we should have a UK-wide collect data prospectively for all patients with their pressures. And it might be just the portal with, uh, portal with pressure might predict what, what you should. So, but that would require a large number. I, I, I agree with you that would take a lot of work. And the problem we've got is convincing a technology community to move away from a number and a measurement that they've been familiar with. So, you know, we just, we know what HVP means, HVP can mean, even with all its failures, people hang on to that. So I think we've got to challenge that. I mean, Making advances all about challenging the current paradigm, paradigm, but not just swallowing it, but testing it and studying it to see if the outcomes, either clinical or bleeding sites and decompensation and tie up the measurements we're taking. <laughs> Any last questions? Yeah. Uh, just a comment on long term abdominal parasynthesis. I know Bill commented and uh, Will uh, reported to it. Our experience uh, with two incidences, I'll just communicate for a broader understanding. One was on the background of HCC and uh, uh, large volume parasynthesis rectal underwent the rocket brain, possibly over here uh, in, in Cambridge. And then we were managing that jet, it blocked. And then when we tried to sort of uh, get into the process of unblocking it, taking it out, putting in another brain, we uh, sort of experienced obstruction from interventional radiology, surgeons. So the question was, do we get this patient back to Adam Brooks? There was significant amount of the life left in the patient, but he spent about a month in the hospital. And then in the end, we took a decision of not doing anything, just putting in a simple brain again, 
to bring uh, the patient recurrently as long as needed. The other incident was, this was an alcoholic cirrhosis we compensated with uh, cancer of the cervix with metastasis. And also had a brain, and then it got blocked. And uh, it was very difficult. Uh, this lady, she was in her 30s, her late 30s. She stayed in the hospital for a month. Again, we through, went through the same uh, sort of exercise. And in the end, the brain started to function very amazingly. Uh, and she was quite happy with the partial brain, and she was doing very well. So these are the practical difficulties that we have experienced with these drugs. Yeah, I think the oncologists um, use the long-term drugs more readily than us for abdominal cancer, normally with peritoneal mats. Um, they use that in the palliative care setting. Anecdotally, in Nottingham, about two years ago, we had a string of the four consecutive patients who had long-term drains came in with very unusual bacterial, I mean, vaginitis with unusual organisms. And then that made us question, was it the technique? And then we went down to radiology to say, you know, what, what was happening? So we then suspended our long-term drains. Now we've started again, and obviously now we are recruiting as part of the reviews too. So I think you're right. I think we, it's not something that we can take lightly. It might not be suitable for all our patients with repeated paracentesis. And we need to select our patients. And those who are of chaotic life, um, you know, nurses might not be able to go to their house to drain, um, you know, do the community drains for them, even if they have an indwelling drain. So I think we have to choose our patients very closely. I think we'll wrap up for today. I want to thank both our speakers for excellent talks. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. This is uh, lunch, is the buffet lunch, where the exhibitors are. So, thank you. Thank you.
Gen 2. One two, one two, oh hey, one two three, one two, one two, one two, oh hey, one two three, one two, one two, one two, oh hey, one two three, one two, one two.
Okay, welcome back everybody and anyone else who's joining online. So we'll get the afternoon session going. I'm pleased to welcome my colleague Mike Harrison who's going to introduce us. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, so this, this uh, first session this afternoon is going to be on uh, some of the issues with uh, Cardiff, Cardiff Cornwall problems related to cirrhosis and cord hypertension. Um, and first of all, we'll hear from Kate Bunkark. Kate Bunkark, who's a uh, consultant on Cornwall Vascular Diseases Unit at Hatworth, uh, training, respiratory training in the region, uh, fellowship at uh, the PDDR at Hatworth, and postgraduate uh, degree uh, there, and as I say, is now a consultant in that unit and delighted to have to talk on the respiratory issues related to uh, or seeing patients with cirrhosis. Thanks, Kate. The more esteemed consultants are either drilling in San Diego or cycling across the country at the moment. So I will hold my hand up. I've been a consultant at Patworth for a year. Um, I'll do my best this afternoon, but if there's any questions I can't answer, I can certainly get back to you. So this afternoon, we'll go through three of the most common respiratory complications of cirrhosis, that being hepatic hydrothorax, Cortopulmonary hypertension and hepatopulmonary syndrome. And I put this slide here, which I smugly got in Vietnam last week, just to remind everybody that smoking related lung diseases are the most common presentation that we'll see, regardless of whether you have cirrhosis or not. So, hepatic hydrothoraces are defined as the accumulation of transudate in the pleural cavity in patients with decompensated liver cirrhosis in the absence of cardiopulmonary and pleural disease. They're seen in between 5 to 15% of patients with cirrhotic portal hypertension, depending on case series, and have systematically been shown to be associated with worse survival. Unsurprisingly, symptoms at presentation are non-specific, and the effusion size normally correlates with ascites severity, but in roughly around 10% of patients, no ascites will be present. The vast majority of hepatic hydrophoraces are right sided, and that's for several reasons. Firstly, the right diaphragm is thinner, it's less muscular, and therefore there's a higher prevalence of defects on that side that allow direct translocation of acidic fluid through. The azacus vein also sits on the right hand side and azacus vein hypertension can occur due to portal systemic shunting. Hyperalbuminemia results in reduced plasma oncotic pressure, and there's also transdiaphragmatic migration of acidic fluid through the lymphatics. To define a hepatic hydrothorax, we obviously require a period fluid sample, and using light's criteria for transudates, we require one of three scenarios, so a protein pleural fluid to a serum ratio of less than 0.5, an LDH pleural fluid serum ratio of less than 0.6, or a pleural fluid LDH level of less than two-thirds of the limit of serum LDH. Light's criteria can often demonstrate an exudate in uh, cirrhosis, and this is due to the contraction of the extracellular fluid volume with diuretic therapy. So it's often helpful to do a serum albumin minus serum fluid albumin level. And if that's greater than 1.1 grams per deciliter, you can be pretty sure that it is a transudate. There are many other causes of fluid effusions other than hepatic hydrothorax. So this is just to highlight that when you have a needle in and you're taking a sample, to send for a pH, glucose, culture, cell count, and cytology. There are very rare instances where you can develop a chylothorax, so that would be a milky effusion, and that's due to leakage of fluid from the chyle duct for portal hypertension. And in that instance, we need to make sure that we send the fluid for a triglyceride level. Pleural effusions are poorly tolerated, unlike ascites. Significant breathlessness and hypoxia can occur with relatively modest fluid levels. 
the initial treatment of hepatic hydrophoruses is to focus on optimization of the underlying liver disease, which of course I, I won't focus on. But just to say that the fluid tends to reoccur rapidly despite treatment. There are no evidence-based guidelines for the treatment of hepatic hydrophoruses, and it's based on expert opinion. But the general consensus is that we should drain the fill with phase to dryness if the risk of re-expansion pulmonary edema in this cohort is low. Concurrent administration of HAS has neither been studied nor is routinely performed. So how can we drain effusion? So we can do a therapeutic thoracentesis, which is used uh, with a rocket aspiration kit under direct ultrasound guidance. The risk of complications with doing this is higher than with non-hepatic hydrothorax effusions, being 12% compared to less than 1% in other cohorts. And that risk increases with repeated intervention. The NARF score is an independent predictor of hemothorax risk, and prior complication carries with it a significant risk of further complications. Intercostal drainage and pleuridesis is routinely used for malignant pleural effusions, but there are poor outcomes associated with its use in hepatic hydrophoruses. Complication rates may be as high as 82%, and most commonly a renal failure due to electrolyte shifts, pneumothorax, pneumonia, and pleural infection. In one uh, retrospective case series, the 12-month mortality in refractory hepatic hydrothoraces uh, using chest drainage was 87% versus repeated thoracocentesis using a rocket kit as 18%. Unlike malignant pleural effusions, health pleuridesis often fails due to the rapid accumulation of fluid. Negative pressure suction has also been trialled to try and promote pleural acquisition, but again, has not been formally studied. Indwelling pleural catheters are a relatively new technique on the scene. I know that at Addenbrooke's they have a lot of experience with this technique, but it is not used routinely in other centres. A tunneled tubing is um, placed that allows you to use a, a suction kit to drain off fluid at intervals uh, as deemed by the patient in terms of symptoms. The mortality rate from this procedure is much lower than using a classic pleural drain, but infection rates can reach up to 35%. There's only been one randomized controlled trial that looked at um, IPCs versus serial thoracocentesis. They did fail to recruit enough targets, but there was no significant difference in breathlessness at 12 weeks. So patients in the IPC arm underwent pleural pleural procedures, they did re um, experience a higher rate of complications. So therefore, insertion of an IPC needs to be carefully balanced against risk probably localised to expert centres, but they do have a utility in treatment. Spontaneous bacterial empyema is a complication of hepatic hydrophoruses, and this is where we develop plus in the film of cavity. In a recent meta-analysis, the incidence is actually quite high um, and surprising to me, in up to 15% of patients uh, versus FPC of 22%. Risk factors for developing pleural infection are a hard HIV score, low serum albumin, low pleural fluid protein, low C3 levels, and concomitant spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. It carries with it a high mortality of 20 to 38%. And you can see there the CT findings. There's a nice rind around the effusion, and the effusion itself is much denser than you would typically see with a transudate. Spontaneous bacterial empyemas are diagnosed again by pleural fluid aspirate, needing neutrophil counterfold in 250 millimeters cubed with a positive fluid culture, or 500 if the fluid culture is negative. You can see that in comparison to empyemas associated with pneumonia, the typical findings of an exudate or a low pH are not C, and that the organisms represent anaerobic 
isolates as opposed to that typically seen with pneumonia. The recommendation is to treat spontaneous bacterial empyemas with third-generation ketosporins for a week to 10 days. PASS is recommended given a high mortality rate and proven variant in peritonitis, so not specifically studied in an SBE. Unlike empyemas associated with, chest, uh, with pneumonia, chest strains are not recommended, again, due to life-threatening fluid depletion, protein loss, and electrolyte imbalance. So more on to what we see at Papworth. So plus of pulmonary hypertension. So what is pulmonary hypertension? So this has recently been um, updated in the 2022 guidelines and the threshold for pulmonary hypertension to, has been reduced. So now the defining uh, measurements are a mean pulmonary artery pressure of more than 20 millimeters of mercury, importantly at rest and importantly at right heart catheterization. And that compares to a normal pressure of between 12 and 14. Non-invasive investigations cannot diagnose pulmonary hypertension. They can, however, indicate its presence. There are a number of measurements that we use. And although several studies have suggested thresholds on echocardiography that would be suggestive of pulmonary hypertension due to the high cardiac output state we often see in liver disease, Measurements such as PR velocity tend to overestimate pulmonary artery pressure and therefore are not particularly helpful as a guide. Unlike the LV, the RV is poorly adapted to increases in afterload. Pulmonary hypertension results in an RV afterload five to ten times up to normal. Now the RV can initially respond to this by hypertrophy to maintain cardiac output by increasing lymph KV, but rapidly dilates. When this occurs, the heart rate needs to increase to maintain cardiac output. There becomes dyssynchrony between the LV and the RV, and overall cardiac output is reduced. Continuing the theme, pulmonary hypertension results in non-specific symptoms. Most often, patients will present with exertional intolerance, fatigue, and as the disease progresses, may develop exertional presyncope or syncope. Pulmonary artery dilation can result in compression of the left anterior descending coronary artery, so they can have exertional chest pain. Hoarseness of voice can occur due to extrinsic compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And you can also get extrinsic compression of the bronchi. So patients will present with wheeze or recurrent chest infections that may be in keeping uh, with signs of asthma. Pulmonary hypertension is broadly classified into pre-papillary and post-papillary. So pre-papillary pulmonary hypertension are disease processes that affect the arteries and the arterial of a pulmonary circulation, whereas post-capillary is the veins and venules. And that's really important because our targeted therapies only work for those with pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension. In order to define which group our patients fall into, we not only need the mean pulmonary artery pressure, but we also need to define the pulmonary vascular resistance. So patients with a pulmonary vascular resistance of more than two wood units have pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, whereas if the PVR is low, then they have post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. Pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension has three groups. So group one is pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is the group that lots of pulmonary patients fall into. Group four is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, so are chronic clots that obstruct the vasculature. And group five represents the miscellaneous uh, group of patients. Post-capillary occurs due to back pressure from either lung disease or left heart disease, so that all relies on treatment of the underlying disorder and not our targeted therapies. So pulmonary arterial hypertension is a distinct pathological process. It incorporates endothelial dysfunction, smooth muscle hypothalamus, 
dysplasia and inflammation, all of which, as you can see from this quality slide below, result in narrowing of the pulmonary vasculature. Now, whilst portal hypertension in itself can result in this, there are other causes of liver cirrhosis that may be associated with PAH. So certain recreational drugs, connected tissue disease, HIV infection, and in the developing world, just a somiasis. Total pulmonary hypertension is typically thought to occur due to three processes. So first, the hyperdynamic circulation results in sheer stress, inflammation, and vascular remodeling. Cirrhosis also results in a reduced production of vasodilators such as nitric oxide and phosphocycline, and an increased production of vasoconstrictions such as endothelin 1, thromboxane 2, and serotonin. We've also seen that patients with cirrhosis have reduced levels of circulating BMP9. And BMP9 is a key ligand to the BMPR2 receptor, and we know that down regulation of that receptor is pathogenic with hereditary pulmonary arterial hypertension. Supplementing BMP9 in animal models has been shown to attenuate pulmonary hypertension, although this hasn't been proven in human. Portal pulmonary hypertension is associated with poor survival. It occurs in around 2 to 6 percent of patients with portal hypertension. And it represents between 5 and 15% in our PAH registries. Most cases are related to cirrhosis, but non cirrhotic causes of portal hypertension are also important. There's some nice data from the French registry depicted in that slide, and you can see that portal pulmonary hypertension out of all groups of pulmonary hypertension uh, that we see from pre papyri groups has a poor survival and only half of patients are alive at five years. Now, this data does have to be taken with a pinch of salt. It doesn't account for deaths that relate directly to liver disease. We know that worse outcomes in this group are associated with higher childhood scores. And the percentage of patients with portal pulmonary hypertension who are on targeted therapy is much lower than other pre-papillary pulmonary hypertension groups. We've also seen that there tends to be a longer diagnostic delay uh, in patients with portal hypertension associated pH uh, compared to idiopathic subgroups. Pulmonary arterial hypertension therapy focuses on three important pathways that promote vasodilation. So we have the endothelial end, uh, endothelium one pathway, the phosphocycline pathway, and the nitric oxide pathway. The nitric oxide pathway for portal pulmonary hypertension, we have sildenafil and tadalafil, which work in the same way. Sildenafil requires administration three times a day, whereas tadalafil is a once only preparation. Both of these are replacement, very cheap drugs, have been around for decades. The next uh, to emerge is the endothelial M1 pathways, and we have abrotantin and matatantan in use in the UK. Triple therapies with phosphocycline um, analogues such as oral selectifab or non nebulized and intravenous medications has not yet been licensed in portal pulmonary hypertension, um, but hopefully that will change in the near future. The optimal combination of therapy in portal pulmonary hypertension is not known. There's a real paucity of evidence for this group. Most major pulmonary hypertension trials have not included those with liver cirrhosis. There's a single randomized controlled trial, the Portico trial, which looked at uh, placebo versus metatantin back in 2019. It showed a 35% reduction in PVR, uh, which was the primary endpoint at 12 weeks, but there were no significant differences in functional capacity or nt pro BMP levels, which is a surrogate for RV strain. It did, however, enroll patients with also BPH, and severe liver disease was excluded to explain these findings. There have been a number of smaller studies which have all examined different pH medications, the vast majority have all shown that they do prove hemodynamics and functional outcomes.
So what do we do at Papworth? So we're very much guided by the Ambition trial, which is now quite a few years old. And it shows that combination therapy is far superior to my therapy or placebo in the management of patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, as well as improving survival. Dual therapy significantly improves functional capacity and end-to-end protein pool levels. So we would typically, at Papworth, start with Tadalafil, and then we would add in Ambisanta, and then monitor at three to six months post-treatment initiation with either non-invasive tests or a right heart habit study, depending on the patient. All of our therapies result in uh, system vasodilatation, and there are a number of side effects that come with that. The vast majority of patients will report headache, jaw pain, dyspepsia, diarrhea, and some will experience hypertension. The side effects normally ameliorate after about a week to two weeks of therapy, but in some, unfortunately, those symptoms are quite pervasive and may indeed initiate treatment discontinuation. Some pointers in terms of our therapies. So PDE5 inhibitors, such as Alaphil and Sildenafil, are contraindicated with concomitant nitrates, and that's due to the risk of sound hypotension. They also have reduced clearance and severe liver disease. They may be a dose adjustment of reduction, and that's easier with sildenafil than tadalafil because it comes in, um, the sildenafil comes in 25s, uh, 50s, and 75s, whereas tadalafil comes in 40. PDE5s can cause gastritis, and we should avoid them in patients who have uh, previous GI bleeding. There's also a very small risk of retinal vein occlusion, so we tend to avoid these agents in patients who are partially sighted. Endothelial receptor antagonists, so ambisantin and nasitantan, are generally much better tolerated. Ambisantin carries with it around a 4% risk of hepatotoxicity. It can also cause an edema and a dilutional anemia. Its clearance is reduced in severe liver disease, which may result in increased side effect profile. So in patients who have a child PC score, we tend to opt for mesotantan rather than ambisantan. Mesotantan is still on license, so whilst ambisantan costs us £600 a year, we're looking at thousands for mesotantan, which is why we always try and elect for the former. Both are teratogenic, and both require three monthly LFT uh, monitoring as part of NHS commissioning. In addition to managing the primary hypertension and vasodilatation, we also need to optimise right ventricular function. So diuretics, right atrial dilatation and volume overload increases your risk of atrial arrhythmias. So we always try to take diuretics to maintain a potassium for more than four to reduce that risk. We ideally like to avoid beta blockers. Now, this is more of a concern in patients who are at the end stages of disease, where the severity of RV dilatation has resulted in a compensatory tachycardia to maintain output. And obviously, beta blockers can blunt that, and that may lead to an increase in severity of symptoms, such as presyncope and syncope. We obviously fluid and salt restrict our patients. Hypoxia is a potent pulmonary vasoconstrictor, so all patients should have a PO2 of more than 8 kilopascals. Anemia is poorly tolerated also, so we correct that and optimise by hospital. And if patients are in an arrhythmia, then we would aim to obscure that. Because of the atrial dilatation, DC cardioversion tends to be less effective, so we generally opt to go straight for atrial ablation. So, portal pulmonary hypertension and liver transplants. So, conventionally, the mean pulmonary artery pressure has been used to determine risk stratification. Again, there is not much data around, but there's a historical case series from the Mayo Clinic which shows that patients with a mean pressure of more than 50 had 100% mortality, and even those with a pressure of 35 to 50 had a 50% mortality. 
The International Liver Transplant Society have proposed hemodynamic targets with an MPAT of less than 35 and a CVR of less than 5, which is, or an MPAT of less of basically equal to 35 and a CVR of less than 3 good units on pre-AH therapy. But these criteria have not been validated. So presently, an MPAT of more than 45 is regarded as an absolute contraindication to transplant. And our own anecdotal experience from Papworth is that we're less driven by absolute numbers, but more by the degree of RV dysfunction. If we can capture these patients early, before the RV hypertrophies and dilates, the outcomes tend to be much better and patients are able to cope with the hemodynamic shifts uh, post-transplant. Hemodynamics can be normalised after liver transplant in porticole hypertension. This is typically seen in around 35% of patients. So what would you do with our liver cirrhosis patients? Well, anyone who is being considered for liver transplantation should be screened with ECHO. As I said, ECHO tends to overcall pulmonary hypertension rather than undercall. We give medical therapy as a bridge. We'll then repeat the right heart catheter study to assess where we are in terms of invasive hemodynamics, but also repeat the echocardiogram to assess RV function. In patients undergoing liver transplantation, it's imperative that fluid balance is strictly monitored in the post-transplant period and that patients have an indwelling PA catheter. We would aim for a CV pressure of between 8 and 10 in these patients. We would continue PAH therapy post-transplant, reassess at three to six months again with a repeat right heart catheter study, and assess whether dropping their therapy down to mono would be acceptable. So lastly, hepatopulmonary syndrome. So whilst point of pulmonary hypertension is a disorder of aberrant vasoconstriction, hepatopulmonary syndrome is one of vasodilation. It requires the presence of three criteria, obviously liver cirrhosis, but also arterial deoxygenation and intrapulmonary vascular dilatation. Arterial deoxygenation requires a PA, an AA gradient of more than equal to two kilopascals. And intrapulmonary vasodilatation and shunting is defined by a positive echo study. And that's whereby we inject agitated saline and see the bubbles in the left side of the circulation at more than three cardiac cycles. Importantly, if you see early bubbles, so within one to three, that suggests an intracardiac rather than pulmonary shunt. And typically in our patients, that's because their volume overloaded, they've opened up a PFO, and they need aggressive diuresis. HPS is a relatively common phenomenon. It's seen in around 10 to 30 percent of patients being evaluated for liver transplant. Mortality, again, is higher in patients with HPS, even after adjustment for age, sex, race, and MELD score. Prospective multicenter studies show a median survival of two years and a five year survival rate in 23 percent in patients with HPS compared to those. We don't. So what causes HPS? Well, it's thought to relate to a translocation of gut bacteria and the endotoxemia of liver disease. This causes a massive accumulation of macrophages and monocytes in the pulmonary circulation. That accumulation and its release of cytokines uh, causes interstitial thickening, which impairs your gas exchange. But it also re results in release of uh, tissue necrosis factor alpha, and that has two consequences. First, it results in increased nitric oxide production, which as we've seen in previous slides is a potent vasodilator. But it also results in VEGF activation and angiogenesis, both of which result in AV shunt formation. This combined uh, causes BQ mismatch and the uh, hypoxemia that we see. HPS is frequently underreported. 
patients will typically report fatidemia, which is breathlessness when upright, and that's a highly sensitive and specific symptom. And that's because pulmonary vasodilatation tends to occur in the lower pulmonary vessels of the chest, which is where we see the highest uh, flow rates in normal populations. In terms of signs with that shunting, we're going to get autodeoxia, which is a drop in 5% of oxygen saturations when going from the supine to the upright position. They exhibit exertional desaturation. They're frequently clubbed and cyanotic. Pulmonary function testing will show a reduced transfer factor because of that interstitial thickening. Liver transplants to biovers have complete normalization of gas exchange over time. But in a proportion of patients, we see severe post-transplant hypoxemia, and this carries with it a very high mortality rate. The definition of severe post-transplant hypoxemia is an FIO2 of 100% to maintain saturation with a protein equal to 85% in the absence of significant respiratory disease, such as pneumonia or AIDS. And this typically occurs within 24 hours of transplant. It results from increased mediators of pulmonary vasoconstriction entering the lung from the passage effluent. And due to impaired vasoconstriction in dilated atrial vessels, normally normal pulmonary vessels vasoconstrict disproportionately, resulting in further shunting. Uh, the risk of severe post-transplant hypoxemia is seen in those who have a pre-transplant PO2 of less than 6.6 .6 on air and or a greater than 20% shunt ratio. In patients with severe post-transplant hypoxemia, there are no guidelines. There's a really nice proposed management algorithm um, in the American Journal, which I think was used previously at Addenbrooke's. Typically, these patients fail to respond to the usual vasodilator medications that we would use in pulmonary arterial hypertension and often need to go on ECMO. The use of TIPS has previously been suggested as a possible treatment, but results have been varied. Anti-angiogenic interventions such as endostatin and angiostatin can improve gas exchange and shunting in experimental animal models, but have not been widely validated in humans. There is some evidence for embolization, but this only relates to patients who have type 2, which is focal APS, APS. This is a very rare where patients have just an isolated one to five pulmonary ABMs. And these are more likely to persist after surgery, so there is evidence to embolize in these groups. So finally, can HPS and positive pulmonary hypertension coexist? The answer is yes. So pulmonary vascular dilatation is very common in patients with liver cirrhosis, and that doesn't mean that you meet the criteria for HPS. The coexistence of HPS and positive pulmonary hypertension is increasingly recognised. In most cases, the HPS will precede the positive pulmonary hypertension. HPS may resolve with development of positive pulmonary hypertension because that vasoconstriction results in a redistribution of blood flow away from the vascular dilatation. And conversely, treatment of positive pulmonary hypertension and the vasodilation that ensues can unmask HPS, which can make treatment for PH challenging. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. That cleared up what's really a quite mysterious topic for me, at least. Um, I was going to ask about um, hepatic hydrophoses. Um, 
And just the benefit to joining the associates. So first, before you try uh, joining the, the um, you have to have four X. Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Always treat the underlying liver disease and ascites first, and then the effu pleural effusions should improve. Any other questions? If not, well done. Thanks very much. It was all very clear. A question. I see loads and loads of cirrhosis patients in the pre-transplant clinic, post pulmonary syndrome, lots of them have symptoms that might suggest something coming. How best should we screen for them? HPS. HPS. Simple, get them to sit up, lie down, to measure their fats. So you do that for everyone, would you? It's a very quick thing to do in the clinic, always. While they're chatting to you. Can, can I very quickly ask that more challenging I found this giving all the variety of treatment um, is to know who's got that. Because I can say some facts which are so specific, on this, but not specific. So, how does one look for that? And it's uncommon. And specifically, is there a role for programming to you know, make it systematically in patients who don't otherwise have to be very or not? I think that's really challenging for a number of reasons. So non-invasive tests like anti-protein P are sensitive but not specific. We also know that patients with a high cardiac output will have an elevated BNP as do patients who are anemic. And I don't think it's particularly helpful in liver cirrhosis. Unfortunately, by the time that patients unveil signs of RV dysfunction, we're seeing them too late. The answer would be to screen everyone. That is not feasible in NHS, nor do we have the capacity to do that. And I don't know what the answer is, I'll be honest. I know the state they screen patients much more frequently than we do. Okay, so thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think we need to move on. Thanks again to Kate. <laughs>
the early post-transplant and late post-transplant can be affected by what we do in assessment and in theater. So we're looking for things, uh, common things like arrhythmia, heart failure, type 2 MI initially, and then and then uh, regular MI, uh, embolic MI after that. And then, of course, cardiac arrest, which is obviously something that we, we want to prevent at all costs, um, particularly in, in frail comorbid patients. So what can we do to assess patients to prevent these horrible complications? As practitioners, part of our job is to predict the future. And as an anesthetist, my job specifically is to predict their cardiopulmonary reserve future. And we take a patient with a certain cardiopulmonary baseline down here, and we think about the stress of surgery, we think about the infections they might get, the stuff they might go through in the ICU, and we think to ourselves, are they going to end up somewhere on this curve, or are they going to end up falling off the curve with intolerance like acidosis, um, you know, respiratory compromise, cardiac compromise. And my job as an anesthetist with the rest of the transplant MDT is to figure out whether the patient is too sick to be in this area. And we use certain things to do that. Uh, we use invasive tests, we use non-invasive tests, we use history, we use all sorts of things. And some of the things are listed here, and I'll go through a lot more than that, but some of the things are simple, like um, frailty indices, asking them history questions, taking them for a walk, looking at their gait, getting them up and out of a chair several times. Um, but we use all of these things to assess whether or not this is going to be successful or overly complicated. Um, a couple of things we consider are how we're going to get oxygen to the patient, whether they're going to use it appropriately in the global sense, what their cellular condition is like overall, and then what the environment is like in their body. Um, and these are really big concepts, and I'll go through the next couple of slides kind of drilling those down a bit into more detail. But I'll start off um, without any testing, something that we can do very simply, which is look at frailty. It's an important consideration in the, in the cardiopulmonary reserve picture. And it can sometimes say a lot more in the global picture than any test. It's a predictor, uh, independent predictor of outcomes, um, like decompensation, hospitalization, and mortality. And essentially, we look at things like the frailty index, the liver frailty index. Um, we walk them around the clinic. We don't do a formal six-minute walk on everybody, but we do walk them around the clinic a lot if they can't mobilize independently to do their shopping or do things like that. Um, we ask them about their ADLs, their activities of daily living, and we say, what can you do normally on a day? Um, do you have trouble doing anything specific that you know a normal person would be able to do on a regular day? And then we get them up out of the chair. Um, that is actually quite effective at assessing proximal muscle strength and, and whether they have any physiologic reserve, particularly if they're immobile for whatever reason, fluid overload, joint problems, things like that. Um, moving on to some of the the tests that we do to assess cardiovascular fitness. Uh, we get a resting, resting ECG on everyone. This is a really complicated table, basically to say that there are certain things that are common in cirrhosis. And those things are low voltage QRS, prolonged QT, and a shortened TP, which is the distance between the peak of the T wave and the end of the T wave. And that can be indicative of certain cardiovascular issues. So what we're asking as anesthetists is, are these changes on the ECG part of cirrhosis, or are they something else? So the ones I just listed are typical in cirrhotic patients, and not something we particularly get too excited about. However, things like high amplitude QRS, uh, T wave changes like flattening or inversion of the T waves, um, ST changes of really any kind, electrical axis changes are a harbinger for um, possibly non cirrhotic uh, cardiac involvement. And then rhythm disturbances, things like a sinus arrhythmia, AF, heart block, are all things that we look at to complete the cardiac picture on the resting ECG. And particularly important in smokers and people with metabolic associated liver disease, they're more likely to have these non cirrhotic um, issues on the resting ECG. This can all be picked up on a simple ECG, and it gives us clues that this person may be more complicated from a cardiovascular standpoint than, than we originally thought. Similarly, in the resting echo, what do we look for as anesthetists um, when we do our workup? We're looking for more than just an EF of greater than 55, which when you get an echo, it's some, for some indications, that's exactly what you're looking for. You're looking for 
is the LV compromised or is it not compromised? Well, we're looking for a bit more than that. However, if the LV is still really important, and actually it's really helpful to get a biplane calculation of the LV. There are really there are a couple of ways to calculate the LV, but the biplane calculation is, is considered the most accurate, especially for these patients. But aside from the LV, we're really, really interested more in the right ventricle. Um, as Kate so nicely elaborated, uh, the right ventricle is a cause of some major issues uh, in liver transplantation. And the things that we look for, first of all, are on the left side. We look for the LV diastolic function. We look at the RV size and function. Uh, we look for presence and quantification of TR to help uh, give us an indication of whether there's increased pulmonary pressures or not. Um, as Kate said, it does overcall it, but it's nice to know if it's even a consideration. We also look at the characteristics of the RA and IVC. Are they dilated? Do they collapse with respiratory variation? Um, things like that that can give us an indication that the pressures are elevated. And then we also um, ideally would like an estimate of the pure systolic pressure, although that's not necessarily required when you have the rest of this stuff. But it is just a nice um, uh, number to complete the evaluation. So to emphasize the importance of the right ventricle in liver transplantation, there was a nice um, study out of the Netherlands in 2019 that showed, basically followed liver transplant patients who had a normal, a high normal, and an elevated uh, RV afterload, which is basically pulmonary artery pressure. And they followed these patients over an eight-year cycle, and this is the survival curve. And they noticed that those with normal RV afterload survived at about a mid-80s percent rate, 90% uh, of the first year, and then mid-80s percent after. What's really interesting is that both groups with elevated RV pressure, not just high, not just elevated, but also high normal, had a much worse survival when compared with uh, matched controls. So it actually has a huge um, uh, influence on survival in liver transplant patients, which is why we're so attuned to it. And their conclusion, of course, is that preoperative high normal and elevated RV afterload were associated with uh, worse long-term survival and for anesthetists, uh, increased incidence of hemodynamic complications. And we definitely see this perioperatively with um, our patients that have high RV afterload. So one of the things we can see on echo is, um, is indications that they might have changes associated with cirrhosis or cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. So to define it really briefly, um, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy results from the hyperdynamic state that occurs in uh, cirrhosis patients. And it's essentially categorized uh, by several criteria. There's an LV criteria and an RV criteria. And the LV criteria tend, tend to be based on either EF or uh, global longitudinal strain, which are measurements of, of kind of the LV myocyte function. We don't see a lot of, to be honest, resting EF below 50%, because if we do, we're probably not seeing them as candidates for liver transplant. They're usually screened out by that point or at that point. Um, but we do see a lot of uh, GLS under 18. And then the diastolic dysfunction is actually quite prevalent. So you've got things like um, EE ratio, L LA volume, um, and TR velocity, even though um, putting all these things together then helps create a picture of whether their heart issues might be related to their cirrhosis or it might be related to something else, which is really what we're trying to figure out with all of these tests. So. Is it cirrhotic cardiomyopathy or is it something else? So when you see those changes, like in this chart, it could be related to cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. However, if you see things, there are other things that can cause these changes similarly, like fluid overload. Um, there can be valvular disease in the heart concomitant with this. You can have an ASD or VSD that could be um, you know, previously undiagnosed. Um, there can be pulmonary hypertension associated with the liver disease or independent of their liver disease if they're very unlucky. And that can also uh, cause changes in the resting echo. So these are all um, things that we look at in addition to secondary changes they may have from other comorbidities like hypertension and diabetes um, that can cause changes in the resting echo that will give us an indication that this patient is going to be a more complex assessment. Um, and then the final thing that we really want to evaluate that we don't really see on resting echo very much is that of ischemic heart disease and the patient's risk 
of having a significant ischemic burden for obstructive uh, coronary artery disease. So when we evaluate ischemic heart disease in liver transplant candidates, there are all kinds of tests and methodologies to use. And I'm going to go through a nice summary of some of the current evidence. Um, and I'll go through uh, what we use at CUH in our algorithm. And then I'll show you at the end of all this evidence summary the, a bit of a representative algorithm of how we assess liver transplant candidates for ischemic heart disease. And remember, this is in the context of assessing them for all the other things that can go wrong with their heart as well. This is just ischemic disease in particular. It's important because it's becoming increasingly common as we accept extended criteria recipients. We allow more um, people with comorbidities to, you know, come into the liver transplant clinic and be assessed and, and actually, you know, list a lot of them for liver transplant, more than some of my colleagues would like. Um, there's also a multifactorial loss of exercise tolerance, you know, due to ascites, uh, peripheral edema, you know, other uh, arthritis that's unrelated to liver disease that, you know, causes a loss of exercise tolerance, causes increased shortness of breath, and really confounds the typical picture of ischemic heart disease diagnosis. They don't have stable angina or unstable angina. It's not that simple. You know, they come in, they can't really move, so there's really no way to exercise them and stress them and figure out, you know, whether they've got ischemic heart disease or not. So this requires an increasingly nuanced approach, which I'm going to try to go through in the next couple of slides. So which test do we order, and how accurate is this test? And I'll kind of go through a couple of different categories to show you what we do and whether it's really evidence-based or not, and what that evidence looks like. So the first type of test you can do is really simple. It's the scoring systems. It's the frailty stuff. It's the traditional cardiac risk factors. And here are just three representative examples of scoring systems. At CUH, we tend to use the traditional cardiac, uh, coronary heart disease risk factors. Um, we say that if they have greater than three risk factors, we tend to take that as something that indicates that they might have a significant uh, ischemic disease burden. Um, you'll notice that the hazard ratio, the sensitivity, specificity are not incredibly great. However, they, it is a simple thing to do, and they have most of this information already. Um, we also look, interestingly, at calcification of any artery. Um, commonly, when we look at the abdominal CT, we'll, co we'll comment on the infrarenal aorta and whether it's calcified or not. And interestingly, there's no difference in intraoperative cardiovascular events, but there is a significant difference in post-liver transplant uh, cardiovascular events, 22% versus 10%. So actually, looking at calcification in any artery is something we do on a regular basis because of this number. Um, then there are the functional tests. Um, we're very familiar with Dervine and Stress Echo, particularly at Cambridge. Um, this is something we tend to use reasonably regularly with liver transplant patients. However, there's no association between um, DSC and its ability to predict uh, cardiovascular events. So why do we do it? Well. We don't necessarily do it to predict ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease. We actually do it because if you've got an immobile patient and you need to figure out if their myocardium can handle any sort of stress at all, this is a really useful test for that sort of thing. We're not particularly looking for wall motion abnormality. We're looking for um, a heart rate increase in someone who isn't normally able to increase their heart rate through exercise or mobility or things like that. So we actually do use the DSC quite a bit but not necessarily to risk stratify them for coronary artery disease. So um, similarly, we, we use a bit of uh, magnetic resonance imaging for the same reason, but again, no real association between that and its ability to predict our cardiovascular events. So if we're really interested in figuring out whether these people have coronary artery disease or not, what do we do? Well, the emerging evidence is actually to use a combination of coronary calcium and angiography to help us figure that out. So if you take a coronary calcium score, which is this thing, and you look at the number and it's over 400, that actually has, that actually has a very reasonable um, sensitivity for predicting um, significant coronary um, heart disease. And at 
our institution, we tend to use uh, CT coronary angiography um, as kind of a first line agent, uh, first line test, and that's uh, emerging in the literature as well and in other institutions. And then we'll proceed to the gold standard, which is invasive angiography, to um, to figure out if they're um, flow limited lesions or not. Um, the negative predictive value of the CTCA is incredibly high, so we actually use it really to rule out more than rule in. I feel like if we're looking to rule in, it's invasive coronary angiography because I want uh, I want guy squirted down the artery and I want to figure out if there's flow on, on the other side of whatever lesion there might be. So this is kind of a bit of the algorithm that we use. Um, as a general strategy, this is a somewhat complicated diagram to that shows you how we generally assess patients for ischemic heart disease at that CUH. Um, we start with whether whether they have known or unknown heart disease. We get a resting echocardiogram and ECG. If they have risk factors or a history, we'll get angiography of some kind. Um, if they're known, we might go right to invasive angiography. If they're unknown, we might go uh, to um, CTCA. And we also look at the functional status. And then if they have decreased functional status, at least moderate or significant, we'll also put them in for um, a further testing, usually starting with coronary uh, CTCA. Now, I also included this slide because I think it's really important, um, and Kate mentioned a few of these contraindications to liver transplant, but there are a few absolute contraindications to transplant. And we somewhat blur the lines on these occasionally, but rarely when it, when it comes to this level. So we're talking about LVEF, um, less than 50% were not keen, but less than 40% certainly a contraindication. Um, we're talking about severe valvular disease that's not amenable to um, an intervention. We're also talking about um, severe pulmonary hypertension, which um, is, you know, a, a bit more fluid than, than this little bullet point um, uh, suggests. And then we're talking about significant COD, so greater than 50% stenosis in one of the major vessels, um, or greater than 70% in a moderate-sized vessel, or multi-vessel disease. And then, of course, uh, symptomatic ventricular arrhythmias that can't be um, controlled because um, we won't want to deal with that intraoperatively or postoperatively, and it will it will uh, give them a much higher risk of of um, post-op cardiac arrest or intra. So I'll finish up with a bit on vascular access. Sorry for going through this so quickly, but I was trying to make a bit of time. Um, vascular access is something that we obviously um, are considering a lot in the liver transplant assessment. And we need, when we do these cases, we need large bore to prevent the diaphragmatic access um, for infusion, transfusion, and then vena venous bypass if we're going to use that in, in our um, procedure. We prefer the internal jugulars because they're, um, they're straight shots down into the, into the RA and there's less kinking or obstruction of the catheters than if you use the subclavian route. And then, of course, the femoral route is obstructed if the vena cava is clamped. So we prefer the internal jugulars, but we can use uh, the peripheral vessels for the subclavians if we need to. Um, we recommend scanning with ultrasonography or venography if patients have had past indwelling lines. Um, this excludes TJ biopsies, so if you do a TJ biopsy, we don't really consider that uh, a previous line um, because it's just a temporary uh, violation of the vein. Um, we also consider the central axis point of tunneled lines, so people might have tunneled um, lines for any reason, dialysis, um, infusions of medications. And they might look like they're going to the subclavian area, but they, they'll then go over the clavicle and into the IJ. So just be cognizant if you're referring patients where are the lines actually access in the central veins. It may not be in the place that it looks like on the skin. And then consider what was infused in the line. So we, we see patients all the time that are admitted for GI bleed, and they have a central line for you know blood administration and medications and that sort of thing. But Patients that have parental nutrition or chemo are much more concerning to us for uh, vascular stenosis than those who just have a line for uh, resuscitation and volume. So that's, those are the main considerations we have. There are other ways to get vascular access, but they aren't pretty. Um, we will consider doing them, though, and I'll end the talk with um, a case 
that was not done in our institution. It was actually done in Chicago. And uh, they used a right anterior thoracotomy to um, get past this complete SVC occlusion and access the right atrium. So in the liver transplant, they made a mini sternotomy or mini thoracotomy uh, between the second and third intercostal space. They put an atrial cannula in, and these are the tie downs, and then um, and they infused and transfused through that. So there are ways to do it, but they're not pretty. So uh, good screening beforehand is much appreciated. So we don't have to even consider something like this because um, it might make everyone really nervous. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'll take any questions now if you have them. I'm sorry for breathing through that so quickly. But <laughs> thank you. Are there any, any questions? I always think that in principle CPAP seems a really good thing to do, but I know the data don't really support it. I wonder if you could give us a comment on that, please. Well, I think, I mean, so you're absolutely right with that. So CPAP isn't really correlated with, you know, cardiovascular events and, and outcomes, but I think the reason we tend to stray away from doing CPAP on all these patients is that we, we already do a frailty assessment. We, we walk them, we get their exercise tolerance, and we find that getting their VO2 max, while it helps us understand their possible metabolic threshold, it doesn't really give us an indication of what we're looking for, which is whether they're going to have a big cardiac event, you know, or survive a long ICU stay or, or a major operation. So I think it... It has utility in that it gives us reassurance, but it doesn't necessarily give us evidence about, you know, survival and events. And I think that's that's why we tend not to do it, although I agree, in principle, it sounds like a great idea, and it actually is quite reassuring when you get someone with a, with a good CPAP. But anyway, sorry, there's, there's no <laughs> great answer for that. Uh, the strict cardiovascular assessment that we do for transplant patients, does it apply to any surgery in patients with cirrhosis, hepatic or non-hepatic surgery, or is it specifically for transplant assessment that we have to do that strict about the different pertinent vessel dysfunction? Well, I mean, yeah, so if you have to, so when we assess patients for liver transplant, the criteria are probably more strict than if we assess patients for, let's say, cancer surgery. Um, because we're utilizing a scarce resource in liver transplantation, as in any transplant, we have to be a bit more rigorous and strict with the criteria. So we exclude more patients than we would for, um, you know, cancer surgery, for example. Now, the caveat, the, I guess the converse of that is, you know, if you've got someone in child C cirrhosis and they may need a procedure for something, you're obviously going to put them into, into a bad state if you do any kind of moderate to major operation on them. So it really is a balance. But yes, in, in liver transplant assessment, we, we use kind of a firm set of criteria. Thank you for time for one more question. Probably two, I think, depending on well, when I walk out, I was going to make a comment about quality of echoes because um, sometimes echoes are done, but you don't get all the information. Yeah, so quality of echo. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try to. It's a lot of animation. <laughs> but this slide. Um, so this is basically what we're looking for on a good quality of echo. So if we get a referral from an outside institution. And it in, we can infer a lot of this, but if it doesn't include at least um, RV characteristics and characteristics about the RA, the IVC, and, a, and a, a comment on the tricuspid valve and whether it has any regurgitation or not, it's somewhat unusable for us, and we have to repeat it and get, get these things. So. That's what we're looking for in it after echo. So question relates to people with coronary artery stenosis who undergo revascularization or angioplasty. 
So what do you then view them in terms of risk for transplantation? Yeah, so if they have pre-treated um, cardiovascular disease, they have had a stem, for example, then we, we treat them, um, we look at the echo and make sure that the, you know, there's not a huge amount of ventricular dysfunction from the, the, the vascular, you know, the ischemic area, and otherwise we'll treat them as someone with known cardiac disease, but not, not prohibited. So yeah, we, we would essentially treat them then as, you know, their, the, the combination of their exercise tolerance and their ventricular function and that sort of thing. So it's not a contraindication by any means. And we do revascularize some people before a liver transplant. Obviously, we're not doing triple vessel disease or anything like that, but, but a single artery or one or two arteries is usually fine. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. So, thanks for a great session. Um, I think we do want to see that it's still at four o'clock. It's three o'clock even, so we have got one hour.
Hey, how you doing, man? What the thing I need to do? Who's that? Is that you, bro? Yeah, I'm with the IT man, Simon. Yeah, we can see you oh, on right. the screen. Okay, let me just turn up the volume. Just to add, I'm on call and someone called me. And, um, what have you got up there apart from, what can you see? Oh, can you see the stage? Can you oh, see the one? Hold on, I just need to turn off the other one. I will get back to this on YouTube. So, um, I can see a stage and it's dark at the moment and I've got yeah. myself and Stuart and I'm going to close all my, now that we're connected I'm going to close my email box so there's literally nothing here um, to go ping. Okay, so what, what, what do you want to, yeah. Yeah, I'll let Simon Hello, Hello, I'm Simon, I'm Simon. Hey, Can you just show us slides? Let me just check that works. Yeah, I can do just a second.
because I've just moved it onto from one monitor to the main monitor. So hopefully this will work. Oh, screen, screen, I am screen two, just a second. Share. What do you see? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah we can see. So we just put it into the design and then we can just check. Just a second. So I now have that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's all we can see. So we can see you on your slides. What do I do while um, um, sorry, I think uh, Grill's talking, isn't it? And then, yeah. then Simon. So do I stay on the Zoom, but you talk? Yeah, you can just mute your Zoom. You won't be on the screen or anything. And then as soon as you hear yourself being introduced, if you then just... Um, can I then just listen through this connection? I don't need to listen through the Zoom connection. Yeah, you can. By the way, you hear yourself being introduced. So send it either through YouTube or through Zoom. Once you do, then... No, but can I get Simon's presentation through Zoom? That's my problem. Yes, you'll be able um, to see it through, through um, YouTube. Okay, I've left YouTube on another computer. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. I thought it was a bit ridiculous. It was a bit confusing. Okay, but so you, and we'll, I'll mute myself for a second and, and can you leave my video turned off, is that right? Yeah, and then just make sure your video's on. So, when you're I share, so do I share the screen only when I'm ready, uh, when, we, when I'm in the yeah. Is that yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't have it ready, so I'll put you on the screen once you're once you introduced. Okay, so, so I'll put stop share. Yeah, you can keep it up. Yeah, you can keep it up if you want. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just, uh, okay. Um, hold on, I've got, but my video's off. But I'm oh, you put your, let me just hold my video. Uh, if you put your video back on, can you, can you go on? There you go. There you go. And you need to see it at the moment. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. Yeah, well, because you won't be on the screen, I'll put you on the screen and then can introduce. Yeah, we'll have we'll, we'll all set up and then I'll just transfer it over when you're ready. Okay, but I'll, I'll mute myself though. Yeah, you'll mute yourself just in case. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, but, but you want me to leave, I'm going to stay in the share mode. Yeah, yeah, just stay, then you're ready to go as soon as you're introduced. Okay. Yeah, good. And uh, what, yeah. What, what time are you starting, Bill? So, we're going to get, I'm going to get them through now. Oh, okay. Uh, Brian's going to come for a few 20 minutes, and then Simon will talk, and then you'll be on. So it may not be till, you know, 20 to 4 or something like that. But, um, yeah, that's right. How many hours ahead time, though? Is it five? All right, it's, it's um, 10 o'clock. Yeah, I've got something at 11.30, so it should be fine. Oh, yeah, we've got five hours. Okay, so you're looking at uh, your time being about 10 to 25 minutes over, I guess, from now. Yeah, okay, that's good. Okay, well, then in that case, I'll probably just listen because I don't want to touch anything on this computer. All right. Uh, we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.
Okay, thanks everybody. So um, it's great to see so many people for the final session. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague George Mouse who will introduce it there. Thank you. Can we just get George right? All right, welcome back everybody to this, the uh, final session of the 2023 Cambridge Liver Symposium. Of course, the previous sessions have been absolutely fabulous, but this is the one you have all been waiting for. Uh, and uh, kicking us off is Dr. Gwynne Webb, who will be telling, giving us an update on transplantation. Uh, Gwyn is uh, my very excellent colleague uh, from Cambridge uh, with an interest in liver transplantation and autoimmune liver disease, and so we look forward to what she has to tell us. Um, so I've, I've, I've done this before um, in the sense of an update on liver transplantation at this meeting and um, without wishing to channel another Welsh extraction newsreader, it's a sort of general update on a few uh, disparate topics. Um, I've got some about our local activity and outcomes, national waiting list trends, so the NHSBT national report has just been published, so mostly information from there. Um, and then a couple of other specific things. So a brief bit about universal HHVA donor testing, which is new. Multivisceral transplantation, just to mention, something that hasn't really been touched on in this meeting. One research study, and then a little bit more on these pilot programs, which are new reasons that we can list people for liver transplantation um, that are under evaluation, a couple of those. So um, before going further into uh, local activity and outcomes, I have this picture, which is where all of our liver transplant recipients are, as of a few months ago. And the reason I put it up is just to highlight that this is, of course, um, not just Cambridge. There's a lot of pre-care, appropriate referral, and post-transplant care that contributes to a lot of this. So thank you, and thank you to the many people here for contributing to that. Um, first thing is how many we've done. And... Um, I think there are two things broadly to notice here. So one is that there was a dip, and the dip is COVID, and that more or less mirrored what happened everywhere. So numbers rising up to 2018, numbers then falling, and numbers more or less up to the, uh, back where they were. Uh, this is Cambridge only. And then the second thing is that two shades of grey here, so this top shade of lighter grey is graphs from those who have donated after cardiac death, and the darker grey is those who have donated after brain death. Um, and the point here is that the proportion that we've done has expanded and expanded consistently, and we've just hit the point that we're now doing more cardiac death donors than we are um, those after brain death. So this is uh, the centre that does the most of those nationally, but part of this is a response to there being fewer brain dead, so traditional donor organs available. So transplant uh, rates in Cambridge sustained versus COVID after the dip. This is why, at least in the last year, and these are the NHSBT uh, categorizations that they give us, and I, I don't think that there are too much in the way of surprises here, but um, dominant etiologies or dominant primary etiologies, alcohol, HCC, which of course usually has an underlying um, uh, liver disease with it, um, metabolic um, liver disease and other, which will also probably incorporate some metabolic um, fatty liver disease, and then the others um, you can see alongside. And notice here a small proportion of ACLF, so that's new, um, and that will come on to in a moment with the pilot program. And then I have several of these funnel plots, um, and for those who aren't used to these, um, basically we've got proportion, number, so you'll see the bigger centres than us, so Kings and Birmingham on this plot further over to the right. Um, this is the average out of all of the seven UK centres, and the, the green lines are significantly better than might be expected by chance, and the red line is the opposite. And this, this first one is, so from the point of listing, this is the point of joining the liver transplant waiting list, that one year, um, survival, so this would include risks associated with transplantation and risks of waiting, and, and, and 
you know, things, things are okay. So Cambridge in the middle there in terms of the size of the unit and doing at least relatively well um, with a give or take 90% survival after listing. And then if we um, carry on um, further out, so this is now five years survival after transplantation. Um, this is NHSBT have also risk adjusted this. So this is um, both recipient and donor characteristics. And a, a similar pattern really. So Cambridge in the middle of that, I'm doing relatively well um, uh, in terms of five year survival. And of course, it being five year survival, these people have been grafted um, some time ago, so between 2014 and 2018. And then those. I should say, sorry, these are elective liver transplants, so not super urgent liver transplant. And the next slide is the same, uh, is, is the super urgent side of things. So those who are listed for paracetamol overdose or for um, viral induced acute liver failure or seronegative or failed transplants, failed first transplants are included here. And again, uh, this is only out to one year because we have certainly uh, lost some relatively soon after an operation after the first year. But, um, but positive, um, positive outcomes there. So positive outcomes at one year, 100% survival from 25 grafts over the last um, coming close to five years. The thing that has been a bit troubling and um, comes up, and there's ongoing work within the department to look at this, is what this um, plot is, and this is reversed now with the red lines at the top, is this is the proportion of uh, transplants which are accepted by any given unit. So these are the deceased brain donor transplants, and these are the ones that are offered out on a national basis. So um, uh, the organ might be donated anywhere in the UK and then offered across the UK to the person with the highest transplant benefit score. And um, we're, we're working through this in the background. Statistically, there's some likelihood that the larger units will have a lower decline rate just by virtue of their size, um, which I can chat about people. Uh, chat to people about otherwise if they're interested, but we are we are a bit of an outlier and it's something we're, we're picking away at and we've noticed, I haven't got a slide on it, our median age of donors that we accept is lower than anywhere else, suggesting we're being a little bit uh, conservative in that regard. Um, but that's that's a, a point of investigation. Um, national waiting list trends. Now, uh, this is a bit of a pun. But I, uh, you might notice some seamless photoshopping here. But this says no country for O women or men. And the point here is that the waiting list is expanding, as I'll say, and this is primarily having uh, causing pressure for those who are blood group O. Um, just go through this a little bit. So again, post COVID nineteen landscape, and this is elective listings, and this is national now, so the whole the whole country, but a similar shape to the graph that you might remember from time. Rise um, in, up into 2018, dip with COVID, some recovery, but through that time the number of new registrations has more or less been flat or slightly increasing. And of course the sum of those two things is that the waiting list from 2018 and now has basically doubled in size. So just over 400 people, just over 800 people actively waiting, so active on the liver transplant waiting list. Um, how have we done within that? So I, I plotted these out, but without labeling the different centers. And with a red line, so that's the one I've highlighted. Um, and ours is relatively flat, and I think this feeds back to our ability or um, really the major efforts of the surgical team primarily and the perfusionists to allow us to use more DCD livers, which have uh, been more available than the um, brain uh, donor livers. But um, certainly, especially in the two larger units, Kings and Birmingham, really quite significant rises in the waiting list. And all of that's really important because time on waiting list, so on average, liver transplantation prolongs survival, and people we're thinking about, and time on waiting list therefore equals danger. And this is the outcome in terms of the proportion of dying or being removed because they're too ill to proceed, which is coming together six months, 12 months, and 24 months, I'm afraid the legend's the wrong way around, after listing. And again, you'll see, this is where the national liver offering system, the national scoring system that allocated livers across the country came in and has been credited with this fall in on-list mortality by getting livers to people who need them most. 
and then you'll see that there's a reversal um, at the end here, and this is largely thought to um, be a manifestation of extending waiting lists and more time on waiting lists. And coming back to my point at the start in terms of Group O, um, this is from the NHSPT quarterly reports that are sent around, and these um, three three uh, bars here, there's Group O, as in blood group O recipient, blood group A recipient, and B and AB group together here. Um, and the point here is that this is really stretching out, this is the medium waiting time for transplant by blood group. Um, so if you're in Birmingham or Kings, the median waiting time is about a year, and that comes with an on-list mortality, at least on average, of a little bit over 10%, so that you can see where the mortality is building up there. Um, the other colours represent the other units, and and the eagle eye will uh, notice that Dublin's in there too, uh, with the X's in, in the corners. Um, so moving on, a uh, different topic, but something that might come across people's radar who are seeing the post-transplant patients is this universal donor HHBA testing, which is something that was brought in all of a sudden by the NHS blood and transplant a few months ago, and has had us scratching our heads a little bit as to quite what to do with the information that's coming. Um, another little bit of pop culture. So this is Philadelphia, uh, and those who've seen it will remember that they give away sign of HIV infection, Tom Hanks and uh, Denzel Washington, was Kaposi's sarcoma, and this is a function of HHV-8 infection in the immunosuppressed. And um, there is anxiety about the same virus in liver transplant, or transplant recipients more generally, but of course here we're thinking about liver transplant. So essentially, this is a virus that's like Epstein-Barr virus, closest to Epstein-Barr virus. It's um, HHV-8, so her human herpes virus 8, rather than human herpes virus 4, which is EBV. Represents the third known infectious cause of hematological malignancy alongside um, EBV, so with herpes lymphoma and PTLD and HTLV-1. Um, as with EBV, it's a gamma herpes virus um, with latency within the lymphocytes and within the endothelial cells, which uh, tend to give way to these uh, vascular endothelial cells, uh, sometimes actually donor-derived that cause post-transplant and kaposis. Uh, and the UK seroprevalence is, is pretty low, but it's about 1 to 2%. And it causes this spectrum of um, conditions, kaposis sarcoma, multifocal Carstenner's disease, primary fusion lymphoma, and hemophagocytic syndrome, which may, which may overlap. Um, and I've done this slightly the wrong way around, but the reason this has been um, rushed through is that relatively recently there was a case cluster um, of donors in Kings, primarily in Kings. This is one of them with a liver transplant wound and Kaposi sarcoma um, complicating the operation, uh, and this was lethal. Um, and within the known cohort in the UK, so those in whom NHSPT knew that they received an organ from an HHV8 positive donor and the recipient was HHV8 negative, they reported a 30% mortality. And then that, and I think coupled with the infected blood inquiry, has really stirred NHSPT into action. And what they've done is they've um, established universal testing. And the result for us is that we're getting these results back saying that there's HHV infection, but not really knowing what to do with it. Um, we've had three in Cambridge so far, and things to note about this are, one, that the rates reported by NHSBT is hugely in excess of the largest study which was done in France, um, a pan-national study there but over a couple of years, about 10, 12 years ago, where they showed a much lower rate, so the presumption is that the denominator is over-concentrated here, in the sense that lots of transplants that have caused mismatches have happened without people knowing. But we don't really know what to do with these people. So um, do we reduce their immunosuppression? Do we keep them on only antiviral prophylaxis? Uh, they're an unknown. But at the moment, the advice is to do lots of tests and ask them to check their skin, which seems you know, a, a little bit difficult, but it will um, create a huge amount of data. Another point of interest is that the treatment of choice for this now is a checkpoint inhibitor therapy. But that, of course, is ruled out after transplantation, so they're in a uh, difficult patch if they do develop proposes or one of the related syndromes. Um, jumping around, I, 
and there's no one really here apart from me who does some uh, sitting on the edges of the multivisceral team. Oh, there is, to the back, um, to represent. But I just thought um, that I, I was told this, um, which might be news to some in the crowd, which is that the Cambridge Multivisceral Programme is now bigger than Miami and is therefore the biggest in the world. So uh, it's, it's, it's been expanding, um, and I, I think that sometimes slips under the radar. So it's, in terms of liver transplants, it's actually representing about 10% of our liver transplant activity at the moment is liver with other organs. And I'm really primarily to highlight that fact and um, highlight that it's a significant contribution to what's happening within liver transplantation as well. Um, and just briefly mention because these are coming from uh, across the country and outside the country relatively regularly, um, the kinds of things that tend to lead to multivisceral transplantation. So intestinal failure associated liver disease, intra-abdominal arterial catastrophes, and other vascular catastrophes, so loss of the gut, often the delayed referral of having developed intestinal failure associated liver disease in response to losing the gut. Uh, other surgical complications, infiltrative tumors, the ones which I become we in hepatology seem to get most involved with are those who have automesentery venous thrombosis and refractory complications from those, be that ascites or bleeding. And there have been a couple here now of multivisceral transplants without liver disease uh, for that reason, and then major inflammatory bowel disease with liver disease. Um, these are some photos. Uh, I think there are only three steps to it, um, taking this from Aaron, one of the surgeons, but I, I always think this is quite impressive to see someone who is alive with uh, this kind of appearance. So evisceration and then clearly leading to reperfusion, but a, a really major undertaking. Um, and commensurate with it being a major undertaking, it's, it's also quite dangerous. Um, so the two survival plots here. Black line is bowel only transplants, and the dashed grey line is liver bowel transplants. You'll see five year survival there, up to 50, 60% or something on the liver containing graphs. Um, this is the one research study I wanted to um, mention briefly. So this is, this is called Liberate. This is a CAR T reg study. Um, and this is a, just a diagram about CAR T cells. So these people will have heard about in relation to treating primarily leukemias um, in children. So these are um, chimeric, as in put together, um, T cells with this chimeric antigen receptor. So this is specific to a target of interest. So something um, on the leukemia cells uh, in the context of treating leukemia, <laughs> and then which is developed so that it can activate the same mechanism um, that the T cell receptor activation activates in a T cell through a slightly different mechanism. Um, and then this is a cytotoxic T cell. But a CAR T reg, which is relevant to this, is the same, but with a regulatory T cell. So what one's trying to do is introduce tolerance to a specific antigen. So this is um, a first in human commercial study, um, UK and Belgium sites, so including Cambridge, which is why I'm mentioning it, autologous HNA A2 specific CAR T reg into patients who have received um, a graph that is positive for that HLA allele, but they themselves are negative, so there are a mismatch there, and then the hope is to introduce tolerance. So there are few patients who are having apheresis and then infusion and monitoring with biopsies with just a minimum, well, I say just with some minimization in immunosuppression, and then it's planned to do 15 with complete immunosuppression withdrawal. So the hope is to induce tolerance long-term in these patients. It's quite, quite involved. One person has been recruited in Cambridge in the last, thus far. Um, you can see the time drifting on there, uh, the red clock back. But um, pilot programs. So these are, as I was uh, noting earlier, new reasons why people could be listed for transplantation. Um, there is a colorectal carcinoma metastasis pilot program. No news uh, in the sense no one listed. Um, open to be listed, and no one listed as yet. There's a hepatopulmonary syndrome um, pilot program, and this is open and has had um, about 20 people uh, at 
activated on it, and these are the people with severe hepatofilmary syndrome, PAO2 of seven or less, and they're prioritised for getting graft within three months. Um, uh, and that's, that's ongoing, although the system has struggled to provide grafts that quickly. And then there's a neuroendocrine transplant programme, which is open, and several people have been listed, but no one transplanted yet. But then there were two I wanted to spend a little bit more time on. So first is the ACLF pilot. Um, I have a quote from Hemingway, but basically, um, how did they go bankrupt? Two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And I think this sort of sums up what's happening to these people. So ACLF being this transition, so rather than acute liver failure, which would be going from a normal liver to, well, I've chosen jaundice here, but really encephalopathy is the uh, critical um, feature of the syndrome, but, but liver failure in one fell swell instead, or the chronic failure, which makes up the majority of our liver transplants. It's this jump between them, and this would, um, by previous criteria, exclude them from a super urgent graph. And most classically, some established liver disease and then an extra hit, so a viral infection or a sepsis or an ischemic uh, injury to the liver or something along those lines. And then this pilot now has been open for the best part of a couple of years, and these are entry and exclusion criteria of which I've um, highlighted a couple. So cirrhotic patients has been native liver. There's been a query about that recently. A couple of patients with transplant people have asked about very poor predicted survival and alcohol hepatitis excluded as well as some other things. Um, and where we've got to 35 patients done nationally, um, there were concerns at the start of this that would be overwhelmed by alcohol patients. There's 10 of those out of 35. 27 have been transplanted. About two thirds of those who have been listed for a transplant on the ACLF program were already on the standard transplant list. Um, they were pretty sick, median bilirubin 400, majority ventilated, majority on renal replacement therapy. There's been an observation that several of the PSC patients who were transplanted had cholangiopalsnera in their explant, all of whom have died. Um, and then it's pretty um, resource intensive with a median of 16 days after liver transplant as you stay. Cambridge, local figures, nine listed, three of nine alcohol, eight transplanted, and actually all of those have done well at 15 months for the one still on this, so they're well, all out of hospital and all alive. So that's been positive. And in, in aggregate, this is um, this is run by Wilbur now um, down in uh, London, and this is uh, well, from his data. So this is survival, and I'm afraid the legend's fallen off here, but basically the, this is from the point of listing, the black line is those who are not transplanted, the dashed line is those who were transplanted. So really quite significant survival benefit, and this is probably the thing that's of most relevance to people here not working in a transplant centre, is trying to identify people who look like they're heading uh, uh, you know, for this kind of syndrome, and uh, we're pleased to talk about them. And then finally, um, cholangiocarcinoma. So um, I said cholangiocarcinoma pilot, there are actually sort of two interrelated pilots. Um, and they relate to, um, well, not the uh, ductal cholangiocarcinoma, which isn't the domain of transplant being outside the liver, but the perihilar cholangiocarcinoma, perihilar region, and the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, so um, within the um, body of the liver primarily. And um, this is half open and half closed, if I can put it that way. So the intrahepatic arm is open, and I'm going to talk about it a bit more. The hilar, um program is agreed, but currently held up by some funding discussions and has been held up for many months um, in relation to the proton beam therapy as part of it. This is James Redford, who had a transplant for PSC for Blanchard Carcinoma. Uh, Robert Redford's son. Um, and um, just going through this, this intrahepatic um, uh, side of this um, pilot is uh, remarkable in the sense that relatively few will fit into it all the lesions need to be, sorry, uh, yes, less than two centimetres with background chronic disease preventable resection. They have to be biopsy proven, which can be difficult for such small lesions. Um, and um, from the pilot side of things, um, they also have to have positive histology, and it can either be a dominant um, stricture, a malignant stricture, given that it has positive histology, or a mass at uh, the hilum. The um, situation is relatively simple for the intrahepatic ones in the sense that they are listed 
um, and they are meant to get a graph within three months. So what this means is they're loaded onto the variant waiting list, which runs by waiting time with enough days accrued, so they should get one within three months. This one's rather more complicated. There's um, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, proton beam radiotherapy, which is the commissioning holdup, um, and some extra stipulations in relation to um, having a staging laparoscopy in advance and the surgeon's permission. And the reason I bring this up um, partly is to segue into the next part of this, and also just to um, talk very briefly about this one case, um, whom some of you have been very involved with. So there's been one listed and one transplanted on the transient carcinoma pilot so far. So that was done here. Um, it's a man in his 30s with PSC and actually an incidental finding on a date MRCP. So an MRCP, as far as I'm aware, requested without symptoms, but hoping to update uh, his biliary imaging. Biopsy proven, so a challenging biopsy um, for this small lesion, 15 millimeters of diagnosis. Felt on suitable for resection on the basis of his um, angiopathy and background liver disease. Other imaging clear. And then we got into this situation where he was listed with this variant listing, as I was mentioning, but just didn't get any offers from the national program. So happily, we were able to offer him a, a, a blood group compatible but not identical, so O into a B, um, NRP, BCD, the day prior to his restaging scan. And the reason I emphasize day prior to his restaging scan is his explant showed a 45 millimeter mass, which would have precluded him from transplantation. So they had to stay under 20 millimeters, um, as I mentioned a moment, without the possibility for any kind of therapy to reduce its size and any local regional or um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And it had a standard implantation, but with a lymph node dissection commensurate to that which one would do for a phalangeal carcinoma resection. Uh, nodes are clear, but there is some lymphovascular invasion, including um, some tumor in vein with high grade dysplasia in the ducts in the area where the phalangeal carcinoma was and incomplete cirrhosis. He's, he's done well postoperatively. CA99 is a point or two above normal, and we wait to see what happens. Um, a couple of lessons here. The first is that is this issue with really having to get them done before their repeat scan. I had a look at this, and the doubling time of these tumors is said to be about 70 days. There isn't too much data on this, of course, because usually people are trying to deal with them. But it, 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 they really do have to be done, I think, because they're, ne they're never going to stay in size. Secondly, there's this point that this is explicit in the protocol that neoadjuvant downstaging or local regional therapy is excluded. Um, which is uh, under debate. And then third, and something that just today actually been having some to and fro with the oncologists about, is the decision as to whether to give adjuvant chemotherapy. And based on the, the uh, product towards it by the lymphovascular invasion, the previous suggestion was not to do that based on the compound difficulties in giving that to someone who had a transplant, but actually a, sh a shift of opinion to think that we should try some doxycycline, which of course would be standard of care in those surgical sections. Um, so that's me, slightly longer than I should have been. Um, thanks very much for listening. This is, uh, uh, this is on the National Memorial to um, Transplant Donors in Scotland. I think that ends in a gift, ends in nothing. Uh, here's where you're Okay, thanks very much. Well, that was, uh, that was excellent, uh, as, well, as always. Um, we are a little bit behind time, but I think it was such an excellent presentation that we must allow at least one question. Uh, oh, look, I can only see about this far, actually, so I'm going to let Will ask the question. I'm asking a question on behalf of Bridget Kuvastava from Cardiff and Hydazidman. Um, it's a bit further north, the Hydazidman. Yeah, no, yes, I stand corrected. His question is, um, why do the liver small bowel transplants do worse than the small bowel transplants alone? Uh, I think that that's probably a combination of both how unwell or relatively more unwell the people who are having liver um, containing grafts are going into surgery, so often they're cirrhotic. And then secondly, the, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bigger operation still than the um, bowel, and then thirdly, if something goes wrong with the organs, so major rejection, there's more to deal with in the sense that, you know, 
possible to explant the bowel, and that happens sometimes to deal with refractory rejection, but it's not really possible to explant them. But anyway, I think probably those three things. Excellent. I'm afraid we're going to have to move on, uh, but I'm sure there will be more questions for you after uh, this uh, uh, session has ended. Um, and now I am delighted to say that the annual debate is back on the Cambridge Liver Symposium agenda, and uh, we have two titans of hepatology battling over an extremely important motion. Now, we don't do this in the usual way, but I am so short sighted that you're going to have to help me with the count. Uh, I will introduce the motion. We'll do a pre count, uh, and Will is wearing glasses, so he's going to be able to see the, the numbers. Um, then the speakers will speak, they will get the opportunity for a riposte. Uh, and then we will do the post cut. So, the motion is surveillance for PSC is, uh, for car an angiocarcinoma in PSC is justified. Uh, those in favor, please raise your hands. It looks like lists, but I don't know. <laughs> Can I go on now? <laughs> right. And those against, please raise your hands. Oh, that's what you do, put it on the way around. Right. Very good. So, introducing, so, uh, you know, for the motion is, uh, is Simon Westbrook. Simon, I've been sent your bio, it's very long, but I'm going to read out most of it. Uh, you are our very own hepatologist from Norfolk and Norwich. Uh, you established the UK PSC in 2004, uh, which which has been instrumental in identifying genetic loci associated with disease, but also in developing a new uh, risk stratification tool. Uh, more recently, you have been awarded a CRPK grant looking at chemoprophylaxis uh, in PSC, uh, very important in relation to this topic. Uh, and even more recently than that, an NNIHR grant looking at the role of IL-17 blockade in PSC. So all very important work uh, over and above the very important uh, clinical work that you do um, here, I guess. Yes. Very good. So, Simon, you have a few minutes to tell us why uh, surveillance for glandular carcinoma in PSC is justified. Thank you, George. So, I didn't know how many hands were going to be up for the start of that, so at least I was going to try and convince you of perhaps this statement, or perhaps at least in some patients with PSC, we should survey for glandular carcinoma. And obviously, I was clear that I wasn't allowed to include broad bladder cancer, so I had to limit my arguments to just calandria carcinoma. And there was a big challenge ahead for me in this talk. You know, first of all, Gideon holds all the cards, because there is very little evidence for me to form. And in some ways, I knew from an odds registrar with him, he was always a much better registrar than me. So I really was in trouble. But the reason I was in trouble was the evidence. And I can already see his arguments now. There's no evidence to benefit. This is a massive resource, false positives, which scanning method? It's not even in your own UK guidelines, Simon. I can hear all these arguments already. But I would argue this is a common sense principle. You do not need a randomized control trial to tell you this is a daft idea. And I hope if over the next sort of 10 minutes I present to you some arguments, you can follow the breadcrumbs and hopefully agree with me that surveillance is the right idea. Now, we have to make sure we're clear from the outset. Surveillance is very different to screening. It's taking a high-risk population trying to find something with a lead time bias and having a treatment that we can apply to it and hopefully changing the outcomes of the disease. And that's what I need to convince you of. I'd argue you already do a lot of things that are not evidence-based. So why do I need to convince you of this? You're all in your offices every week probably book an MRCP for assist. No evidence for that. I would argue the incidence of cancer in side branch IPMs is in tiny. We book, and we've heard about cirrhosis today. There is a couple of trials. We await the bus trial to prove definitive evidence for Barrett's. We do colitis. But if you look at some of the incidences of cancer in these target sites that you all but test for every week in your offices, look at this. We've got nearly a 1.5% per year instance of cholangia carcinoma, which increases in terms of total prevalence over time with a relative risk of 400-fold, much higher than some of these cancer sites that you routinely book for surveillance tests for. You've already got consensus Delphi guidelines. It's not me just telling you to do this. It's experts in Delphi guidelines. Ours all, perhaps the latest guideline, tells us to do it every 12 months with an MRI and an MRCP. 
But the easel guidance, the AGA guidance, they all say something similar. Some form of abdominal imaging, plus or minus CA in at 20 and 19. I will admit the BSG guidance doesn't go that far, but it is perhaps an older guidance and it is being looked at and being rewritten, so it might change. Now, also, one of the major problems of having lack of robust guidance and doing all the same thing in the UK, it leads to heterogeneity. So this is a good argument for doing something and doing all the same thing for what we do. We know in the recent UK PSC audit, probably about a third of patients aren't having any form of surveillance. That's because people are confused. They don't know what tests to do and how often. We need to standardise our guidance so we look at what we do and learn from it. You've got to be realistic in PSC. This is a rare disease with a low incidence and prevalence. Okay? We're never going to have a trial. So you've got to take lots of lines of evidence and try and form and think about what you think is the right thing to do for your patients. There is no doubt, though, that cholangiocarcinoma is an important cause of death for these patients. We all know that cholangiocarcinoma through long-term inflammation introduces senescence with escape mutation to cancer. And if you look at good long-term epidemiological data, this is an old paper now from 2018, that showed a very clear elevated SMR from PSC, cholangiocarcinoma was responsible for a significant proportion of death. This is Palak Trevelli's paper, recently published in Gastroenterology, showing the hazard ratio of cholangiocarcinoma was massive in this population of over 2,000 patients over a 10-year period. And there is perhaps some lessons to be learned. Perhaps if we are going to spray, perhaps we could be a little bit more targeted. This was important work from the International PSC Study Group from 2017, showing you how the incidence rates for HPV increases over time, that males have a higher risk than females. If you have the ulcerative colitis as opposed to Crohn's disease, your risk is higher. And small duct is lower than large duct. So perhaps alluding to that there are, we could be a little bit more targeted. If you look at the incidence rates, they certainly go up with age and time, so perhaps age could be a factor as well. So perhaps I could budget a little bit. Perhaps we could be more redefined who we are. And this is a similar sort of study looking at the time and the incidence going up. If we're going to do it, do we have a treatment? There's no point doing something if you don't have a treatment. I'm sort of just repeating a little bit about what Will's just showing you. Things are changing in the UK. And as you know, we will be allowed, hopefully, in time to transplant perihyla. And we can already transplant small cholangiocarcinoma. The patient referred to is actually someone I was involved with. I would never have picked that up if I hadn't have done an MRI. You know the historic data for the transplant, and you know what it shows. Just to highlight to you, and I was just going to touch on this, but Paul's already said it does it will involve, if we can get it through the line, proton beam, a tumor boost to radiation with capcitabine and then regular cisplatin gemcitabine as detected by the ABCO2 trial. So if we're going to do surveillance, if we agree it's a high risk, there's something we can do about it if we find early cancer, well, you've got to say, what test am I going to do? Because that's another big part of the argument. And I think it's okay in gallbladder. I think a lot of us feel very comfortable if we're going to do an annual scan for the gallbladder. Well, gallbladder is probably a good test. You've got to make sure we find a mass. It's definitely a polyp and not stones. And even for HCC, I think we can all agree, ultrasound may have been, as we've already heard this morning. But cholangio is a slightly different beast. You know, we've got two principal ways we could go about this. We can either do contrast MRI, or we can maybe do ultrasound. And I think one of the best studies that perhaps tries to answer this in a retrospective way is this study from the uh, Mayo Group, uh, the John Eaton's the first author published in Hepatology recently. And they essentially took a large bunch of patients most of which were symptomatic versus asymptomatic, a lot of them which had cancer, and looked back who had an MRI in three months within the diagnosis. And they essentially divided their cohort into those, and they came up with some figures. And I think, you know, this is a complex table. I'm sorry I'm not going to talk about it today properly. But I think if you perhaps start to look at, and they defined imaging into definitive or possible, so you have to be careful how they looked at it. But perhaps this was the group down here I was interested in, those that would be eligible for a transplant protocol, that's where the UK goes. I think MRI is a winner compared to ultrasound. So if we're going to do it, I think we're going to just have to accept we're going to do contrast MRI and MRCP. 
The other important thing here is our patients. You know, I know this is a slightly different slide, but the point is, work from PSC support and also across the pond have suggested this matters to patients. This work worries them. So although you may not necessarily believe in it, despite what I'm trying to tell you, that's what our patients want. They want us to have some reassurance, even if it's not the perfect test in the world. Is there any evidence out there to suggest this surveillance works? Well, there is some. It's retrospective. To start with what I'm going to show you, this was a study from the Mayo that a lot of you will know, nearly 830 patients, perhaps suggesting that those patients were on some form of surveillance, those that were out, did better. But there is a caveat. Most of this betterness was essentially driven by gallbladder cancer and, and hepatocellular cancer rather than phalanges. So I've got my hands up. You need more point about that, no doubt. This is another study, a retrospective study, and in, once again driven from the International PSC Study Group for nearly 3,000 patients, showing that surveillance perhaps leads to better outcomes. There are some caveats, I hold my hand up. The group with no surveillance was quite tiny and driven by only a few centres, but it's perhaps, once again, a retrospective evidence. It's what's been in the Barrett's literature and colitis literature for a long time, it's all retrospective. Now, the problem I'm going to have, because he's going to bring it up, and I might as well just admit it to you now. There was a recent paper that came from Sweden, and it was from 11 centers. It had over 500 patients in it. And slightly annoying for me, she did an annual MRI with an MRCP and an annual CA 19.9. And they looked what happened over a five-year period. And the conclusions from that study were, sadly, that it didn't lead to a long-term survival benefit. Although, actually, for the clangios they did find, nearly 65% of them had a treatment option. So, maybe not so bad. But I think if we're going to be, if I'm going to be positive in this paper, and I'm sure Vivian will go over it in some detail, the interesting message that I took from this paper is that if you look at it here, they defined what they meant by severe and progressive changes on the MRI concurrently. And they showed very clearly that of those 24% of patients from the outset, those 500, had these severe changes, nearly 10% of them went on to get a cancer. So perhaps, even if you don't believe everyone should be surveyed, perhaps we could define what severe looks like and perhaps do more targeted testing on them. And the reason why I think that might become important over the next years is that I think the test to look for cancer, once you've spotted changes, whether a progressive dominant stenosis, post-stenotic dilatation, or a matter, getting better. So although people will say, well, look, Simon, Billy rushing is a lot of people call it. And even if we're going to do this, and expand it, a bit like tipping a coin. We're getting better at using, as Matt's alluded to, molecular biomarkers. And there's been some really lovely studies published recently on bile samples from high-risk lesions showing that if you look at methylation sequences in four high-risk genes, you can get a pretty good area under the curve for detecting cancer when you've picked changes up in PSE patients. And perhaps those brushings that we don't think are any really good in PSE perhaps are not bad if we apply next-generation sequence to it. P53 is such an important genetic change when you go from senescent to dysplastic to cancerous mutation and FP. And if we apply next generation sequencing to our brushings that we target, we may even get better pickup. So, where do the broadcoms lead us? I think we have to accept Langeo carries a massive risk in this. We know that patients worry about it. We know that in the UK, the ambiguity is not good for patients. There is a massive heterogeneity there. If we standardize what we did and surveyed everyone the correct way and then looked at our UK data, we know if we're doing some good or not. I would argue that there's good diagnostic tests coming around, and although I can't show you clear prospective epidemiological data to argue what I'm arguing, I'd argue that the Brecon say it makes sense to do so. And I'll stop my arguments there. Thank you, Simon. That was uh, both informative and convincing, and of course you'll have the opportunity for, uh, to say more on the topic. Um, after a few minutes. But next we have uh, Professor Gideon Hirschfield. We can also claim credit for Gideon. He was uh, based in Cambridge for a long period of time, and I'm sure he honed his skills here. He is now, however, based in Toronto, uh, where he is the inaugural uh, Lee and Terry Horner Chair in Autoimmune Liver Disease. Um, as a clinician scientist, uh, he manages a broad uh, platform of translational um, and 
and trials based clinical science with the goal of advancing therapies for patients with inflammatory liver disease uh, to prevent the need for liver transplantation. Um, uh, Gideon graduated from the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, was awarded a PhD from the University of London, then came back to Cambridge, Gideon, um, where you learned clinical medicine. Um, <laughs> And prior to holding his current position in Toronto, um, he was professor of autoimmune liver disease at Burnham. So all very impressive, Gideon, but I think I'm right in saying that in your downtime, your preference is to watch EastEnders. Uh, it used to be. It used to be. Now, I just, now, now that I'm an expat, you know, if you can hear me, now that I'm an expat in the Commonwealth, um, I, I, I actually prefer Britain's Got Talent. So um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, you know, I apologize, everyone, for not wearing a jacket and tie. Um, I wasn't sure that we were going to be either at the Cambridge Union or more for me, the, the Oxford Union. And I congratulate Simon because he, he's done a, he actually did a, a fantastic job um, of um, introducing the topic. And what I'm going to do is therefore <coughs> follow on because, of course, you know, this is a topic given to me and I'm, I'm very much an advocate for patients living with PSC. Um, uh, but I want to just sort of highlight the reasons why at the moment, you know, in truth, if we're honest to ourselves, surveillance for cancer carcinoma is actually not justified. And I'm going to do that by giving you the themes and the way I think about PSC and highlight the issues about etiology, epidemiology, um, imaging science, is to tell you why it's just not logical at the moment to, to survey for cancer carcinoma. Although I think um, Simon's, you know, alluded to the fact that really we're probably on the same page and it's actually about stratification. So, you know, for the trainees in the room, you know, what, what, what PSC is, is the six C's. Okay, it's this really difficult disease um, which can be covert and is you know, deeply distressing for patients and is defined by the cholangitis. Its outcome is transplant usually for cirrhosis. Um, it's got colitis as a comorbid already for the same disease. And the biggest fear, and I totally agree with Simon, is cancer. And what our patients want, and they chose the number 6C for this infogram that, that we did, is they want a cure. But we don't have that because we don't understand the disease. And it's actually quite unusual for autoimmune diseases to get cancer. And in clinic, it's very stressful looking after patients with PSC. It didn't take me very long to make this slide from, from I know you have guys have got Epic as well, from Epic, to, you know, from just a few patients, unfortunately many of them quite young patients, to show you the challenges when you are looking after patients with, with PSC. One of the things that I'm very lucky about is I have a reasonable cohort. So what that means is I always then put the guidelines into perspective. But if you just look at, you know, um, column number two, you have this challenge. I, I, the, the disadvantage for me, Simon's a scoper, I'm a non-scoper nowadays. You know, but you've got your spyglass looking at that sort of sinister looking sort of, you know, lesion. And then you've got, like Simon said, your routine MRI. I get about seven MRI reports a week from my patients, you know, and then every now and then, every couple of weeks, bingo, there's a five centimeter lesion that you didn't know about. Okay, so you've got to have a lot of karma on the right hand side to look after these patients. But if we're going to survey, we've got to be pretty honest with them. And the challenge I think Simon actually alluded to very nicely, which is why the vote yeah, can be equal at the end, is really we're not talking about one cancer anymore. We're talking about a whole series of cancers from the large up to the highland to the, the periphery. I'm lucky that I work with Gonzalo Tapashin here, so we have an incredibly aggressive cancer carcinoma surgical oncology program already, and we have live donor transplant rather than DCD. So our options are actually uh, pretty advanced. Um, but this is one of the issues, is what are you surveying for and which cancer are you surveying for? Then I always fall back, and you know, as George says, I learned my, my medicine from Graham Alexander and Alex Jimson. Okay, I always fall back on what I see in clinic. Okay, that's how I think, that's how I choose the projects that I am interested in, and, and that's how I think about, you know, you know, the, the projects that go to our fellows, you know, Will will know this, and, and Pallet will know this. Okay, you know, it's based on what I've seen in clinic. This is this week's problem for me. 50 year old man, the nicest patient in the world as ever. Mild IBD, really tiny, you can barely see it. PSC. April's ultrasound, not a problem. April's MRI, you know, pretty good 
radiologist. Stricture in the PSC, pretty similar. There's a little bit of worsening around segment seven, but you know, it doesn't fit clinically. Come September, my colleague says, patients in ER, jaundice, sick, get sent home on sick post last season the following week. Send in for an ERCP. ERCP, stricture, some dilatation, um, but, but no issues. Can you still see the slides? Um, and and they, we fix the, the, um, the, the, um, the, the stricture. Get the MRI scan, and what we see is now segment seven has got something very, very sinister. And rather than wait for the contrast ultrasound, I biopsied him by CT on Wednesday, and I rang him uh, yesterday evening to tell him the unfortunate news he's got adenocarcinoma. Okay, I don't believe that uh, surveillance would have made any difference to this patient. Whereas in contrast, I do believe surveillance would have got in the way of this patient being alive. She's 68 now. I've looked after her for a long time, and she used to fly to see me in the UK. In November 2018, I said to her, mm, you're getting close to transplant, a little bit early, don't know when to send you. But we got her listed in January 2019. She fractures her hip, survives that. June MRCP, before she's transplanted, you know, stricture is getting worse, but there really is nothing to say that there's anything to worry about. Has a transplant, explant comes back a month after transplant, adenocarcinoma growing through her bile duct. Has her Whipples, September 2019, post liver transplant. There's still residual cancer there, okay, and even some lymph nodes are positive. We send the tumor off the sequencing. She's HER2 positive. We give her a septum. Fast forward to July 2023, she's doing phenomenally well with her recurrence. If I had been surveying her, Simon, she wouldn't have got a transplant, and she wouldn't still be coming back to my clinic, okay? I wouldn't have helped her. So, you know, what we have is this group of autoimmune diseases where, you know, they behave differently. The PSE stands out because unlike all other autoimmune diseases, with these variety of things that Simon alluded to in terms of genome, epigenome, exposome, and microbiome, is cancer. And what's really interesting is that that really is distinct for um, our patients, um, you know, with, with, with other autoimmune diseases. The PSE is your middle row there. There's this fibrous of literate phalangeopathy, okay, and that cancer is colon, gallbladder, and bile duct. And that's where Simon alluded to why his case falls down, because when you get any benefit from surveillance, it's not about phalangeal carcinoma. It's about gallbladder cancer and incidental HCC. But of course, it's a harbinger of cancer. Look at this picture. Ulcerative cholangitis is really what PSE is. Spygos phalangeopathy. I agree with Simon. When that becomes widespread, things are going to change. So as we get better technology, but it's no surprise that that biliary epithelium is going to become cancer. Although that's a neutrophilic cholangitis when you biopsy it and sequence it. But it's clearly very unpleasant. And this, you know, the etiology of the disease doesn't help us at all and hasn't helped us yet, Simon, to choose the test. Understanding that link between the bowel and the liver and all the inflammation that's being targeted on the biliary tree and all the aberrant changes to the, to the cholangiocytes. But what's really interesting, Simon, I would say, and where you, I would agree, is science will evolve. So although cholangiocytes now is you know, the tree, just a waste of time, a bit like ursa deoxycholic acid, makes you feel good but doesn't change the outcome. Look at this paper on IBD uh, RBD cancer in PSE patients and the idea of antigen-driven chronic inflammation developing dysplasia in the DSC. So unique immunological signatures. And something similar is probably going on in the village tree. So as Simon alludes to, maybe if you invite me back in person, Bill, in five years' time, I can do pro and Simon can do it next. Okay? Then, of course, the other thing about our PSE patients is they shouldn't be the people getting cancer. This is data from across Ontario, looking at everyone who's got PSC based on coding data. And what do you see? Exactly what you know from your Cambridge practice and from your Norwich practice and from Ganga and across the world. Your PSC patients are the nicest because, you know, they just simply are. But actually, geoepidemiologically, our PSCRD patients in, in Ontario have higher income and have less material deprivation. Completely the wrong group of patients to get it. Then, if you believe that the genetics has helped us, Simon's, I think, um, an author on this paper. Um, cool bit of genetics, yeah, not about the new genes that they discovered, which were very uninteresting, but looking at correlations between some other traits that 
have genetic implications. Remember, our patients are non-smokers. They shouldn't be getting cancer. And there's even a genetic correlation between getting PSC and your smoking behavior. So really, it's, it's, um, it's fascinating. So it's a clear problem, which in essence answers why surveillance just cannot work at the moment. Most cancer-related deaths in PSC result from cholangia. I do not disagree. Overall annual incidence of cholangia carcinoma, 1.1. That's too low to be surveying all of your patients. We look after about 300, 350 patients with PSC. You know, it would just, the numbers just don't, don't add up, okay? And then if you get it, it's devastating outcomes. You haven't got time to change what's going to happen, okay? And so, you know, I just don't know how you overcome that epidemiology, Simon, to get to who you're going to survey and how you're going to then make, make the difference. But of course, the reality of most PSC guidelines are that they are heartfelt, not evidence heavy. So Simon showed us, and this is just another, another summary from Dermot Gleason, you know, in uh, frontline gastroenterology, the variety. And I can tell you, because I've been involved in some of these, you know, in essence, you know, the consensus is not evidence-based, but it's based upon what we feel might make us feel better and address some of the uncertainty. Of course, I think I understand where that comes from. But also remember, in this paper, you know, this was the ICSCG that Palak and I got involved with as well as bias. Okay, most often, bile cancers occur soon after PSC diagnosis. So there's a problem. The first third of the cholangiocarcinomas occur in the first year of diagnosis. So that whole group of patients are not going to benefit from surveillance, okay? So that makes the whole concept of surveillance, you know, challenging. What are the risk factors for developing cholangiocarcinoma? Were we to stratify? Well, it's not very clear, actually, but IBD duration is, is a risk factor, maybe duration of PSC. But equally, you know, um, it's not shown in this particular Mayo data, but in other data, you know, uh, the older you are. And again, Simon alluded to it. Are you going to give contrast to an 18-year-old every year for 30 years before they get to the transplant age 48, you know, and tell them genuinely that there's no side effects to the contrast and it will pick up cholangiocarcinoma, I'm not sure that the evidence stands up. We might do it, okay? Now, when we did this paper, this was a paper that took Palak about four to five years when we were in the UK, um, looking at NHS digital data and looking at, at PSC. It's true in our supplemental figure. And imaging surveillance is associated with improved post-cancer survivorship in the UK. We did that, and we got a few comments from the reviewers, but the truth was, it's not for cholangiocarcinoma, it's for the post-hammond. So, if we're thinking about the whole patient, yes, I can see that imaging is helping. You know, just like, you know, when you're imaging your cirrhotic patients, some of the time you're picking up HCC, and, you know, many of us would like to write the paper on the number of renal cell carcinomas we've diagnosed from our cirrhotic patients having um, ultrasound surveillance. You know, you're generally giving them a bit of a health check. Okay? And then, of course, the Scandinavian data, you know, tells us what we know. And again, we're going to look at our own data, which is not prospective, but uh, I think we'll show the same from our clinical experience. First thing, Simon, this is devastating, but it's probably a little less common than we thought, which doesn't stop it being a big problem, but does actually make it even a more of a challenge for surveillance. Terrible once diagnosed, terrible if it's the cholangio variant of the cancer that you get. Okay? CA99, useless. Even if we, um, uh, you know, take into account the fact that, you know, there's not everyone will get a high CA99 because of blood groups and how it works in your microbiome, it fluctuates, it doesn't help you, it's a risk factor when you put it together collectively, but it causes concern, not diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma. So that, that's no good. Okay? And then I think what, uh, where we're starting to, I, I agree with Simon, what was interesting is that the patients who've got the worst disease on imaging were a group of patients who maybe we should be refocusing our efforts on. Okay? And that is a group of patients where we're going to have to think very carefully collectively. So in the conclusion from that paper, which I think was quite reasonable, the bottom line was that low incidence of cancer carcinoma, limited ability to discriminate between stricturing and new cancer, really meant that apart from your gallbladders, you know, and even that's not that common, you're not making a difference. And this on the right was the, you know, the features which are associated with developing, you know, um, the, the hepatobiliary malignancy that people always lump them together. And you can see, you know, um, some of the things we talk about, but nothing there strong enough to say, hey, it happens. So in essence, until surveillance is stratified, we should have, we, 
we didn't even email Simon, I've just been too busy to reach out to you, we're actually ending up at the same point. It's not going to work. Epidemiologically and clinically, it's just not going to work. So the absolute relative risk relevant in a disease with a 20-year natural history failure that the answer, that unstratified surveillance, did you write this slide, Simon? It simply cannot work. Okay? And in whatever you want to call symptomatic DSE, the diagnosis is challenging. You can't get your radiologist to read. Cytology, I'll just show you some of our data. Well, you know, we don't have fish, um, really, not routinely. Um, and we certainly don't yet. Um, we're going to start um, in the next year or two to start sequencing this cytology. You know, but conventional approaches are no good. And we are incredibly aggressive. And we can use live donor transplants for, you know, some of our highlands and some of our peripherals. But generally speaking, the treatments are just not there. This was another project probably Crystal will, will kill me for that I ever gave it to her because I made her go through all of my colleagues' um, ERCPs at St. Mike's, which is an enormously high volume ERC program, to pick out over 10 years out of you know, thousands of ERCPs, you know, the 167 patients who've had 464 ERCPs over about 10 years. And it picked up those patients, not all of anything. But you know, to Simon's point, cytology, probably you should ask your, your in, in, endoscopist not to do it and to resist the temptation, because even when you get satisfactory cytology, inflammation, atypia, you know, suspicious, it really doesn't help you. If anything, it makes it worse. Some of the cholangioscopy work is interesting, Simon, but it's not there really, is it, when you do your little bites, okay? Um, you know, and when it's obvious, I think it's probably too late and it's obvious. So what are people doing in Europe? This was a survey um, which got into JHEP reports. You can see that I'm pleased to say that everyone that I work with, both in Europe and North America, have big hearts when you look after patients with DSC. And many of us are doing things, okay, using the modalities that we talk about, but not in a consistent way, not in a way that's evidence-based, and certainly not in a way that's probably changing the outcomes. So much as I would like to support um, surveillance, you know, um, I'm not sure I can. And so my five take-homes for you, Okay, when I think about my PSE practice, you know, because I don't know how to look after these patients, you diagnose PSE with compassion and carefully, okay? You're never too late or too early for transplantation. And you can see, if I'd been surveying uh, patient number two, she wouldn't have got a transplant, Simon, and that wouldn't have been a very good outcome. So you've got to be close your eyes once you miss the patient, is one of my mottos, okay? And then number four, the nail at home, wide surveillance, you might do it, but you don't need to, and you don't need to lose sleep over it, is survey for cancer smartly, but just be honest. And that's why there's a question mark around cancer carcinoma. You could nearly put a question mark around all bladder cancer, actually. Um, probably no question about um, colon cancer. So um, with that, I'll say thank you, and um, hopefully we're actually all on the same page. Um, but, you know, I've done my bit to convince you today. That was uh, phenomenal as we expected it would be. Um, Simon, if you can reply in one sentence. I'm going home. Um, right, no. Well, I wish I put up some slides just to tug at the heartstrings of my patients, but I didn't. But anyway, the, I think I, we become come from the same place. I think what we need to do as a community is there is a group which I think we can do better for. And I think that's the group we need to focus on and work out how to do it. I do think, though, with the tools that are coming, we can do it. And I think we have lots of epidemiological studies to data to tell us who we should be looking at a little bit harder. So I agree. I have to, I have to move my argument a little bit more to the center ground. But I think, you know, I think there is some hope if we could do it. And I, would be, I think we need to be careful because, I mean, ultimately, I think the goal for PSC, if we're honest, in every cancer that we survey, Barrett's, colitis, we want to pick up dysplasia, and that's what we need to get to. When we can pick up dysplasia in the bile duct and do something about it, because I think if, even if you look at some of the data that's out there for T1 cancers that pick up incidentally, that's without any adjuvant therapy, it's not good. And I know, although I appreciate your patient, I'd argue that was lucky rather than anything else. So I think that's where we need to get to, and I think we, if we can identify high-risk disease, Using some of the molecular and possibly cholangioscopy tools, we might get there. Vivian, final word from you. Cholangioscopy for every patient with PSC. Well, I mean, we're on the same page. 
And, you know, I'm going to be very nice to Simon because my nephew's just started at UEA and I do medicine. And, you know, I need Simon to get me through um, to, to the very end. Um, but, you know, the issue is transportation. And that, that's where we have a challenge. So, I mean, you know, at the moment what we landed at is we'll do an MRI once a year because I like my patients a lot. Um, and no one says no to me. Um, in terms of that they, the radiologist can accept it. But I tell them, you know, it, it, it's not gonna, it, it's not a, a be all and end all. And you know, I think, you know, I totally agree. You know, there will be a day when we can stratify risk based on probably some kind of, you know, serum marker first to suggest that they're, you know, they're, they're, they're in cancer format, okay? Um, and then, you know, you can't do a planagioscopy on everyone, uh, George. That's too dangerous. There's going to be complications. Even if Simon does all of them, there's still going to be pancreatitis and, and cholangitis. So we, we're not going to go down that path. Okay. But we're going to select the patients very carefully. Um, and so, you know, for today, I just don't believe surveillance, you know, is, is, is truly justifiable if I want it to be, you know, you know to be evidence-based and, you know, but for the future, you know, Simon and I are, are totally on the same page. There will be a role, and we've just got to find who and how. Okay, well, that was fantastic. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, we must, however, work out which of you has actually won. So we need to recount again, please, Phil. Um, <coughs> now, people in the audience, please put your emotions aside. Those of you in favor of the motion, surveillance of angiocarcinoma appears to be justified, please raise your hand. Okay. And those of you against the motion, Oops. surveillance of angiocarcinoma appears to be justified, please raise your hands. Well, in total numbers, uh, Simon, you've won, but actually the swing vote goes to Gideon. Thank you, Gideon. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great to see you all. Simon? Okay. Well, thanks very much for joining us. Please well. But, um, <laughs> It's great to see you. Um, we do hope that you'll come in person. Let us know when you're coming over here. Okay. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks to everyone who attended. Thanks to the speakers and chairs. Thanks to Simon and the Robinson crew. Thanks to the sponsors. And it's been a great day. Hope to see you all again next year. Thank you very much.